um, welcome. Hello, um, hello, Joshua. We still mm -hmm. will we wait for a few minutes to for people to join. Dobrze.
Hello, uh, hello Anna, hello Marcin, hello Joshua. Yes, finally, this is the this is the right room. We will wait five minutes more for the others, and we will start with the conference. Hello, Wojciech. Glad you are here. Um, sorry yeah. for sorry for miscommunication. It was not easy to get in here, but it worked out. Grant. Hello, Sylvia. There were the same links to room number to, to one. Both rooms. Two. Mm -hmm. Hello, Joshua. Um, I can see that you, your Hello. your background is is blurred. If you have some uh, connections problem or your internet is low, you may um, you may delete this this blurred effect, uh, so this will be better. Yes, hello, Sylvia. We can see you. Uh, everyone, three minutes three minutes more, and we will start ten past nine with uh, Anna Zhirkova talk. Hello, Martin. Um, I'll just make sure whether are we visible, hearable, audible on YouTube, Facebook. Okay. Uh, can you hear us now here? No. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, Welcome to the second day of the Christian Philosophy, its past, present, and future conference held by Jesuit University Ignatianum in Krakow, remotely in Galaxy Hotel in Krakow. Um, welcome all participants on WebEx. Uh, welcome people watching us on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, two small requests to the participants on WebEx. You, uh, please don't be shy and uh, you can show your face. Uh, we will start with the with the first lecture by Anna Zerkova from Jesuit University Ignatianum in Krakow, and Anna will give a talk. Can we predicate of and speak about God, and what are the rules of, for doing so on the epistemological and logical premises of conciliarian trinitarianism? So um, we will start with displaying Anna's talk, and then we will. And then we will have some time for discussions. We have 10 minutes delay, so we will we'll finish 10 minutes later. Um, just please remember to unmute yourself when not asking the questions and everything should work out. Hello, my name is Anna Zhirkova. I work at Gnitrianum and now I'm, now I'm going to present you to all of you my paper on the subject. Can you predicate of and speak about God and what are the rules for doing so? On the epistemological and logical premises of conciliar trinitarism. Some time ago I was asked to participate in the project on analytical and philosophical approach to the issue of Trinitarism from a patristic and con conciliar perspective. This particular paper presents some thoughts and some results of my work on this project, uh, 
which in full are going to be presented and published into papers and in one monographical study. So working on this project, I found to my surprise that in many analytical and logical approaches to the Trinitarian question, to the question of one, uh, to you got in a three hypotheses, there are some very important, I would even say key epistemological and logical premises that they're laid down by conciliar doctrine, and by conciliar doctrine, I mean uh, doctrine which was developed during uh, first uh, councils, and especially in Nicaea, for instance, uh, largely omitted in present studies with analytical and philosophical approach to the subject. So, this paper in this paper, I'm going to outline, I'll outline the ground rules concerning the very possibility of and what can be stipulated with respect to speaking about such a subject as God, i.e. about one who, at least according to the Christian faith, lies beyond any of intellectual capacities of created beings. Such ground rules were laid down by Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nyssa, two Cappadocian defenders of orthodoxy, who in fact had proved most influential at the First Council of Constantinople and, and are important until now the most important authorities on the subject. The present study aims to cast light on such matters by outlining the epistemological and logical premises developed during Trinitarian debates by the Cappadocian scholars, ones which for the most part function to define what counts as applicable to theological discourse when speaking about God, as well as in what precise sense and why and how this is so. These principles show very clearly the problems associated with addressing God in terms of substance and essence, issues that in fact underlie most of the difficulties and incoherences presented by Trinitarian discourse as such. So, first point, epistemological presuppositions concerning knowledge of God. The primary epistemological epistemological presupposition of any kind of, of talk about God is obvious, but should still be spelled out as it seems to quite often be overlooked in the context of many particular lines of Trinitarian argumentation. It is that the human intellect has no knowledge of God except for his existence, and even this knowledge is conditional, to say the least. Basil the Great very generously embraced the view, known for its Epicurean and Stoic roots, according to which the human intellect is endowed with a shared conception of God's existence, one which affirms merely that God exists, while knowledge of God's existence, though needing to be revealed, is at least obtainable for human beings. Knowledge and understanding of the divine essence is absolutely impossible for any created being, angels included. Following the Cappadocians, it was unanimously accepted that there is no common or natural knowledge or understanding of the essence of God. What God reveals to us about himself, then, is not his essence and substance, which no created intellect can grasp, be it that of a human being or that possessed by any other kind of being capable of, of engaging in intellectual activity and receiving knowledge. What is revealed is knowledge not of God's essence, but of the divine attributes, which should not be conceived of in terms of properties or accidents such as might variously be predicated of a substance. The attributes of the divine essence refer instead to the actions and powers of God manifested, uh, manifested through the creation and ultimately revealed to us in the form of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. In this way, our conception of God is made up of a multiplicity of attributes manifested and revealed to us, 
while any understanding of his essence as such nevertheless remains unattainable. It is important to realize that none of the features deductible, uh, deducible through analysis of God's powers and actions directed at the created realm, on the basis of which one forms one idea and conception of God, suffice to disclose the divine essence. Those powers and actions, both of divine origin, are situated within the created realm and thus differ ontologically from their source. Characteristics ascribed to God on the basis of his actions either signify what he, in essence, is not, as uncreated, without beginning, incorporeal, etc., or something related to his essence or operation, as being good, creative, etc. In the end, it turns out that humans can attain some kind of knowledge of God's attributes only from what God has revealed to them granting them a revelation that conforms to their capacities and needs. Hence, it is impossible to know or, or understand anything about God qua God and his essence, ever, even within the limits of what created beings are capable of, beyond what has been revealed by, him, by himself. The question that rightfully arises, namely, what in that case can be probably said about God? Thus, the premises and presuppositions of any talk about God do need to be clearly explicated as well. Now we are coming to the second point of my paper, which is the logical premises of attribution, predication is speaking about God. The fact that God is beyond our knowledge doesn't rule out all possibilities of attributing appellations to him. For what is attributed doesn't refer directly to God or to the divine essence, what God reveals to humans are features of his own actions and powers, which as revealed are perceived by the human intellect. Afterwards, what is revealed is subject to a process of analysis and comprehension. Intellect reflecting of what it has received through revelation and or learned from observation constructs a conception of God that comprises his characteristics as this turn through and in our thoughts. While such predicative appellations, which are assigned to was characteristic and used in refer reference to God, actually refer to our own thoughts and reflections pertaining to God's action and powers, and not to any subject such as would transcend absolutely the, intellect uh, the intellectual capacities of all created beings. It is a, a consequence of intellectual reflection upon the actions and powers of God that one comes to understand both what cannot be ascribed to him and what can be attributed to him properly in, in, and with due reverence. However, it is necessary to remember that to be spoken of is different from to be, especially in a case such as this. Their essential predication is ruled out as completely impossible. With essential predication, in which something is predicated about a subject, but not about that subject as of something else, i.e. as belonging in turn to something outside itself, the very essence of a subject is revealed. This is because features predicated essentially of a certain subject are present in its logical parts, it is in this way, for instance, that humanity is predicated of a particular human being, such as Socrates, thus affirming the humanity of or in Socrates. In the case of God, though, there is no essential predication, as he is addressed only using the names we give to the divine activities revealed and manifested to human beings, not, and not by means of names given to the very subject of those activities. On the one hand, as was pointed by Gregory of Nyssa, every appellation or name, i.g., just, imperishable, etc., said of, divine, of the divine nature must be understood as if it were accompanied by the verb is. Thus, God is just, 
or the divine nature is imperishable, and so on. Otherwise, a name applied in some way to him would be referring to nothing at all. Gregory's claim entails that each name pertaining to God amounts syntactically to a categorical proposition of classical logic in which God, divine essence, serves as a subject accompanied by the copula is. The letter connects the subject with a predicate such as just, imperishable, etc. On the other hand, categorical propositions can be used in any kind of predication, including of the essential sort that, as we have seen, are simply impossible in cases of speaking about God. Gregory, Gregory therefore, suggests that propositions of the form A is X do not ascribe some feature X directly to A, but are rather verbal reports drawing their meaning from what is perceived about A. The copula is doesn't serve here to make a predicate a part of the very account of being. Accordingly, what is said of God is no more than extrinsic attribute the only apprehend and ascribe the only apprehend and ascribe attributes to his essence, which are now not equivalent to his essence as such. Indeed, one could say that from the point of view of semantic, this is not a case of predication at all. And in fact, Practically, all major authors of the Greek and Latin tradition shy away from describing this attribution in terms of predication, uh, categorein or predicare, preferring terms following the model furnishing by expressions such as spiritual legate or distor the devil, to speak about God. Conclusions. Examining the way in which Cappadocians try to express the mystery of the Trinity and considering also the form of conciliar Trinitarian statements in which the Trinity seems to be characterized positively in terms of one substance and three hypostases, one may receive the impression that in the context of Trinitarian concerns, none of the above mentioned epistemological and logical premises are in fact relevant. For it seems, indeed, that the very essence of God is expressed, after all, through those notions of substance, nature, and hypostasis person, which appear to be used as predications. And to this, we might add that the very inner life of the one divinity, i.e. being Father, Son, and Son, and Holy Spirit, is itself a subject of revelation. As something revealed, this truth will in itself a mystery that cannot be comprehended and explained by any any created intellect becomes a subject of reflection, due to the very fact that its revelation has been necessarily transmitted and and through human language. In this reflection on the Trinity, however, what is, for some reason or other, so easily forgotten is that this is not in actually different from divinity, but rather identical with the latter, in spite of any differences with respect to the name for these or the meanings we convey. Thus, if it, if it has been accepted when, that one may speak about the divine as something above and beyond any created essence and substance, then the, uh, the same custom ought certainly to be adhered to there the Trinity is concerned as well. Then engaging in Trinitarian discourse, one should keep in mind that the Holy Trinity is itself something above and beyond substance. The main problem then is this. The real truth about the triune God gives us a truly mysterious insight into the very reality of the divine essence, though the latter, as was stated above, lies absolutely beyond all human capacity of understanding. What is more? The issue of his essence is not one that can be addressed using appellations, given that this can only be correctly applied to God when employed to refer to his actions and powers and not who he is in regard to his essence. But when anyone says that the divinity God is one substance in three hypotheses, this will be precisely a case of so-called predication in essence. 
To forget about Gregory of Nyssa's claims that anything said about God is no more than a verbal report of what has been unveiled to us and doesn't reveal the very account of his being is to commit a mistake not at all unlike the Eunomian heresy condemned at First Council of, Cal of Chalcedon. For someone holding that notions construed by the human mind, i.g. substance, nature, hypothesis, or person, can be applied simply and directly to a trinity, and this can be subsequently be employed in logical arguments that themselves rely on rules of predications reflecting our common sense, view of how things and their properties relate to uh, one another, certainly adheres to the Eunomian heterodoxy. Such a person is accepting that there are things which can be known, understood, and attributed to God in regard to his essence. In other words, we do not see the true God as different from creation. In that way, unthinkingly applying to God meanings and rules that have been derived from language employed for the purposes of describing the created realm. It is undoubtedly the case that the Trinitarian proclamation of the ecumenical councils rejected the orthodox doctrine and established a set of criteria for expressing the theological truth of the mystery of the Trinity. Moreover, as was stated at the very outset, Trinitarian theology should certainly involve within the boundaries set by those criteria, adhering all the while to the direction laid out in considerable, in considerable theological discussions. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, for your attention. Uh, sorry. Okay, that was Anna from Jesuit University Ignatianum in Krakow. Um, are there any questions here on site? Anyone? Um, if not, we can move to the questions from the participants on WebEx. I can see also we have some questions on YouTube stream. So, but we will start with the questions on the from the WebEx participants. So please, if anyone, just please unmute yourself, ask the question. Okay, if there are no questions here, I will ask the, the one that I received uh, on the YouTube stream, and maybe if there will be any questions more, we'll get back to them. So the, the, the comment we received is, is following. Hello, Anna. You said, if I understood correctly, that created being cannot have knowledge about God, his essence. We can know about his divine attributes only. The end of quotation. Can, have, can we have knowledge of any other being's essence? Usually we can't have knowledge of any essences. Therefore, it is nothing new to say that we have no knowledge of God's essence. Similarly, as we have no knowledge of the essence of sunflowers, rabbits, and octopus. What we know are their attributes. I hope it is understandable. Uh, yeah, yes, I understand your question, but please understand something. There is slight, very slight difference between God's essence and rabbit's essence. You see the attributes which you can perceive about rabbits or flowers or butterflies are directly accessible to you through your, uh, through your epistemology, uh, through your capacities of sight, hearing, touching and other senses. Those essences are sensible and are uh, accessible to you through aesthetics, through, uh, through uh, um, as a sensible object. God is not a sensible object of any sort. You have no direct access to his attributes. You cannot touch it, you cannot see it, you cannot hear it. You cannot smell it, you cannot taste it. She's absolutely beyond our aesthetical, I would say so in Greek, senses, okay? So the basic difference is here. 
was an attributes which you can uh, predicate about rabbits. You see yourself. You do not need any revela revelation, the process of revelation. You do not need Bible. You do not need the, the, any mystical experience to say that rabbit, the rabbits are generally great. You cannot say anything like that about any attributes of God. I hope it is clear. Thank you. Yes, I see. Who? Cool. Uh, yeah, I, I can start. I like it very much. Thank you very much for it. thank you for your presentation. I was wondering about this apophatic uh, theology. And uh, the one thing is to refer it to a rabbit or the kind of objects that uh, you uh, explained, and I think it's fine. The other thing is to refer to uh, ourselves, to human essence, like the soul. And I think that this is interesting in the theology or the thought of Gregor of Nyssa, that uh, he indicates that the soul is also unknowable. That we cannot, uh, that we cannot uh, know the essence of our soul. So uh, when he says that we are created in the image of God, it doesn't mean that we can uh, know something about the essence of God through our soul. It means that as God is unknowable. It is also ourselves, the soul is also impossible to be known. It's some kind of mystery. So we can, so we can see, uh, we can understand only energia of our soul, but not really the essence of our soul. It's a kind of mystery that is also within us. Would you agree with that? Yet again, there is yet again uh, one nuance, okay? In any case, God is a created being. What is absolutely uh, clear in Gregory of Nyssa is that you were speaking about uh, Gregory of Nyssa, I understood. Yeah. So, uh, what is absolutely clear in him is that he accepted, he believes in absolute difference, in metaphysical and ontological gap between the creator and the entire world of creation. So the only way with the, how you can um, make, you know, there is right way to uh, to use analogy, it's fr uh, from creator to creation. So if creator is unknown and we are on the image of him, our souls are on the image of him, so this is the right direction of making analogy. But, uh, and well, with this part of claim, I would agree. Uh, the pro no, absolutely, there is nothing to disagree about. My problem is that too many times on the basis of uh, Gregory's claims, for instance, on, uh, on account of human souls, the people make uh, argumentations backwards. On the basis of the nature of his uh, or of his uh, accounts of something what is created, like human souls, I made arguments towards God. So if they are so and so, so God is so and so. This is no, 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 no big no in Gregory. You cannot go backwards. You cannot make something on the image of an image, because, you know, God is a source. We are uh, only an, an image of God. You cannot speak about the source using as your ex uh, explanatory example an image. So, uh, only, uh, only this, I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, uh, if I may, one more comment, and I'll, I'll shut up later after, after that. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I agree, and I, I think it's, I think this apophatic thinking of Gregory of Nyssa is really beautiful. However, for an apophatic thinker, he really speaks a lot about God, and uh, uh, and uh, I, yeah, and uh, I, and uh, then there is my my question. Okay, you know how 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 does he refer to dogmas? Or how does he see Christ? Is Christ the energia of God? 
or the uh, or uh, or uh, or somehow he reveals something of the essence of God. And even if he reveal, reveals something about the essence of God, can this essence be can can it be known to us somehow? Yeah, it okay, seems so to me. It, mm-hmm. it, it seems, uh, sorry, it seems to me that uh, that, uh, that also this uh, this orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy, didn't make it easy for Gregor of Nyssa. There was some kind of uh, well, some some kind of boundaries that he had to keep within. It was much easier for Origen one hundred years earlier when he had he was kind of freer to create um, well ideas or theories that later on could be understood as heresies, whereas, well, he was not aware of it, as he says in his uh, Theology of Seeking or something like that. Okay, so here, uh, actually, there are a lot of things which I quite disagree. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't call Gregory of Nyssa uh, uh, as uh, uh, an adherent of uh, apophatic uh, theology. Apophatic theology was uh, made by Dionysius or Pagita on the basis, pseudo Dionysius, of Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory of Nyssa himself is not apophatic. Uh, I cut my paper almost in half. In the second half of the paper, I would have uh, presented actually on what philosophical premises Gregory and his the, and his brother Basil built their ideas and was their stoic ideas first and foremost. And there is not that much apophatic in that because there is a support and uh, there is just justification of your knowledge of God by your experience. It is not what we cannot say anything about God. We can say because, precisely because we have access to him through revelation. And now we are coming to Jesus Christ. Is he only an energy? First of all, he is one of, of a hypothesis of a triune God. He is not just an only energia of God. He is a God. He is the God. But Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, chose so the entire God to reveal himself, his nature to us. This is done from his uh, actions, and this is done in his right, uh, straightforward words. The difference is, you know, when you try to explain to a child of two or three old, yeah, child, that is a very small child, rules of Einstein theory, you can tell him everything, everything in all details. My question is, would a child understand Einstein's theory? Probably not. So no matter whether we are given the full uh, knowledge of God's essence, it, and we there are given the full knowledge of you know, the essence, which is actually the true and God, his inner relation with uh, the Trinity, etc., etc., even having this knowledge, it is impossible to say that we do understand it because it is beyond our understanding. So Christ, as you said, he, he is an activity, because, an action of God because he is the reviews those matters and he is those matters itself. Uh, other thing which you touch is the, the conception of dogma. First of all, there is no conception, conception of dogma in Orthodox Church. There are no dogmas in, in uh, Orthodox Church. There is a tradition, and this tradition is living tradition, which um, develops and changes every single time, remaining identity of its sources. So in that sense, uh, Orthodox theology is, is much more free than what, uh, what, what we used to think about uh, Catholic theology. And Gregory, to, uh, to say the, the truth, uh, I don't think what we, he had um, 
problems with, uh, or with orthodoxy. Actually, he came too many times so close to being an orthodox, but no, he crossed a few times, split uh, the borders of orthodoxy. And it's quite strange what uh, he will, uh, he just was giving it, you know, nobody, they tried not to, uh, to notice, you know. So, no, he was free, uh, free-minded and free uh, thinkers, uh, thinker, and uh, besides, he used origin, who you just mentioned, so many times and so extensively. Okay. So I don't see the problem. So thank you. Sorry, I think we, we, we should stop here. Joshua, uh, could you please uh, chat, uh, put your qu questions on, on the chat and I will pass one more question from the YouTube stream also on the chat to you, Anna. And uh, okay, thank you, for the, thank you for the talk. Thank you for the questions and answers. We will move to the next talk, which will be given from the from Philippines by Joshua Cedric Gundayao from University of the Philippines, Diliman. Sorry for spelling. Uh, by the way, what's the what's the time in Philippines? Is it three o'clock, four o'clock? Almost four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, so as you may see, the Christian philosophy is all over the world constantly. Uh, I will display the Joshua lecture now, uh, which is titled The Triplitia Via, Re Revisiting St. Bonaventure's Re Rectification of the Will in the Modern World. So um, after having Joshua's lecture displayed, we will have uh, time for the questions and discussion. Uh, keep the questions in your minds, please. Good day, everyone. Allow me to present to you my paper, The Triplicia Via, Revisiting St. Bonaventure's Rectification of the Will in the Modern World. Who is the human person? Is he solely a human being who possesses cogito as what some philo modern philosophers would postulate? Is he an imago dei, a being who possesses both body and soul that exhibit its creator? Is he a unicity of experiences that continuously unfold itself over time to his fellow being? World wars, political uprising, various types of pandemic and natural calamities are some of the things that shape and continuously affects the world. These agents of change not only alter the world per se, but also affects all that reside in it, especially the human person. With all these catalysts that result to alteration and continuously shapes the world, can we say that man, unlike the world, is unchanging? On the top of all these conditions, in the era of modernity, is the human person still the same man as we conceive him to be? In, is Christian philosophy, particularly Christian anthropology, still relevant in our pursuit of understanding the human person? This paper aims to argue that Christian anthropology is still relevant in contemporary era. The medieval notion of anthropology, especially among Christian thinkers, is always twofold. Man in the state of grace and man after the fall. This paper springs from the reality that despite man's fallen nature, he has still inherent desire to perfect himself through the attainment of the summum bonum. The understanding of the human nature of the human person is rooted to the very identity of man, his intrinsic nature, the imago et similitudo dei. This understanding in anthropology is continuously affirmed and remain unchanged in the history of Christian philosophy from medieval era down to contemporary Christian thinkers. This truth cannot simply be dismissed since this is what set the human person apart from the rest of creation. As an imago et similitude to Dei, the human person is a creature who bestowed by God's grace can easily pursue God as the telos of all its action. In the prelapsarian condition, God made man a rational creature with body and soul, the body being the corporeal substance while the soul constitutes the spiritual substance. As a creature that possesses body and soul, the human person is the highest of all corporeal beings, but lowest among the spiritual beings, due to the limitation of man as created by matter. Despite of the place of man among spiritual beings, he is so close to God since he is an image of him. It is due to the fact that the soul itself is an image of God and a similitude so present to itself and having God so present to it that it actually grasps God and potentially has the capacity for God and the ability to participate in God. Moreover, in the state of grace, man is made upright by God. The physical uprightness of the body, courage, was to bespeak the rectitude of mind. The body is united with the soul as its perfective principle so that it might move forward toward and attain the blessedness for which it was made. 
In the state of grace, man has control over his appetite. The lower faculty of the soul is subjugated by the higher faculties, particularly by reason. The human person as rational, cre rational creature was imperfect despite of being an imago similitude to Dei, since he is created out of nothing. As creatio ex nihilo, man can fail to act out this intrinsic relationship with God. It instead can act for itself rather than for God. Man can choose to do whatever he what ever he wants, contrary to what the reason suggests. Despite of possessing the voluntas, this capacity of man is still fallible, that is capable of falling to adhere to the sumum bonum. In fact, in the biblical narratives of the fall, the first human fell into sin by the wrong use of voluntas. Man failed to act for God and ended up acting for itself by choosing to eat the forbidden fruit. As an effect of the fall, the human person is faced with another identity, his fallen nature. The illustrious Tragilite philosopher postulated in the ancient times that all men by nature desires to know. This desire for knowledge is not a sheer craving in learning new things, but is yearning to be perfect, to be perfected. The human person desires knowledge because something is lacking within him and needs to be filled in order to be first being to be fully actualized and perfected. Since the human person is capable of actualizing and perfecting itself, this assertion now begs to address the question. Can the human person always perfect by what he desires? If not, what can perfect the human person in the first place? And what is the appetite? And is the appetite related to one's pursuit of perfection? The human person is moved by the appetite towards the thing that it perceives to be something which can perfect it. All goods are desirable. That is why it is called appetitus, since it is, since it is desirable to the senses and to the will. In Bonaventure's work, Itinerary Mentis in Deum, he depicts man as a journeyer who is in quest for, of perfecting himself, himself. He illustrates on that work that it is God who is the end of the journey. It is because for him, God is the source and the summit of all beings. Hence, perfection is perfectly attributable to him, since he is perfection himself. The name good is proper and the principal name of God, for it connotes the perfection of God. This assertion could be understood profoundly on the discussion of God as the primum principium. Nonetheless, since there is nothing existing which is not God, who is the first cause, therefore goodness could validly predicated to him. In line with this, since everything can exist as God, as its primum principium, the existence of goodness could generally attributable to him. Hence, if God is the source of all things, it is proper, it properly follows that he too is the origin of all goodness. Perfection is goodness. The reason why we desire to be perfected is because it is good. If good is desired because it needs perfection and ultimate happiness, and if God is the most perfect and source of perfection of all beings, it is accurate to say that God is the sumum bonum. Faced with this fallen nature, the human person has now the difficulty of exercising faculties which he formerly exercised to the full. Turning away from the true light to the changeable good, the first human was bent over through a personal fault, and the entire human race became bent over by original sin, which infected human person in two ways. It infects, bind with ignorance, and the flesh with concupiscence. As a result of Pecatum, man's original stature of being upright became, became bent over because it is infected by the corruptive influence of Malum. In addition, the Malum is the withdrawal from the first principle. It is withdrawal to the source of perfection that man desires, which in return causes the corruption and disorder within the human person. As an illustration, if man chooses the mutable good apart and above the sumum bonum, he is withdrawing himself from God since he since the sumum bonum is no other than God. The corruption of the order of things leads to the choice of the mutable good independent of the sumum bonum. On, the, on one hand, due to ignorantia, the human person can no longer directly contemplate God and see the highest good in contrast to the lower good. On the other hand, caused by concupiscence, the lower powers can no longer completely govern by the higher powers. Today, all all things are fashioned in a way that the senses could easily attracted to it. In the world of shimmer and pleasure, it is very difficult to decipher which good is higher than the other. In addition to the fact that discerning the highest good is naturally arduous as a consequence of the fallen nature. Confronted with the various types of good, the human person all the more suffers the difficulty of seeing the sumum bonum that is sometimes outshined by the lower goods due to their appeal to instant happiness and pleasure. For example, it is easy for contemporary man to support abortion and fornication. 
It is because committing abortion and getting away with the responsibilities of being a parent is more appealing and seem comfortable than pursuing being a mother when your, where, where your current situation seems to suggest that performing such responsibility would be difficult. Moreover, many people of today commit fornication because of their desire to quench the sexual urge this, that is present within themselves. Fornication today becomes an avenue for of one's exercise of sexuality that brings fulfillment and satisfaction to the doer of the act. Situations involving abortion, fornication, and the likes are common today because the desire to be happy and pleasured subjugates the desire to be perfected. It is as if perfection is different from happiness and pleasure. However, in reality, happiness and pleasure were only proper effects of perfection. In such case, the effect should not be pursued from perfection per se, because this might lead to pseudo-happiness and pleasure. In cases where the lower goods are pursued and not the sumum bonum, it is only the temporary cravings that is being satisfied and not the very being of the human person. For instance, when the human person desires for food, it is only the sense of taste and appetite which is being satiated not his substance, which is the rational soul. Unlike with the case of the sumum bonum, whenever the human person desires the highest among all things, the effect is not only permanent, but also affects the core of the very core of its being. When the sumum bonum is pursued, it is not only the accidental desires of man that are being fulfilled, but the human person per se, since it, is, since it renders intensification of his being. That is why in contemporary world, there is a great need to rectify the will towards the sumum bonum so that the human person's desire, particularly his nature, would once again be intensified and go back to its original goal, which is perfection. Since voluntas is corrupted, it is in need of rectification. The voluntas which is corrupted focuses its attention towards the lesser good. Nonetheless, it must not be misconstrued that voluntas chooses malum for, for all desires are only about good. Volunt voluntas does not desire malum for its sakes, rather the sumum bonum in attainment of the lower good. In rectification of the will, the will is once again put in conformity with the sumum bonum. If voluntas is once again in conformity with the sumum bonum, then voluntas is again made upright and recovered from the bent over due to the fall. For St. Bonaventure, a person can only achieve the blessed state through reforming power of gratia, done over the process of purgation, illumination, and perfection or union. The soul is purified, illumined, and perfected through the reformation of image by means of the theological virtues, the enjoyment of spiritual senses, and the ecstasy of rapture. It is through this that the soul through the aid of grace is reformed. The hierarchizing activity of the triplicia via is an ongoing process through which the soul of the faithful person becomes as like possible to God, is led back to God and comes to great, experience a greater measure of union with God. The goal of this hierarchical acts is to intensify the image of God in man by regaining man into the hierarchical order from which he departed due to the fall. The purgation consists in the expulsion of one's sins, illumination deals with the imitation of Christ, and perfection ascribed to the union with the heavenly spouse. Gratia, as a gift from God, is a voluntary gift from God out of, out of his supreme goodness in wanting to redeem the entire mankind. Through grace, man is able to develop virtues and do meritous acts since through his sole efforts, he cannot advance in virtues and do good things by the reason of fallenness. The purgative way focuses on purgation of the soul from the evil deeds in order to direct his affection to the higher being. The illuminative way concentrates the imitation of Christ that takes away man, that places man directly to the affection of the spouse, which is Christ. The perfective way highlights the experience of the soul being enjoyed with the spouse. Through the said union with the spouse, with the soul, the soul is being perfected in relation to God. These hierarchical acts intend to perfect the soul by means of its reformation through the aid of grace, and these hierarchical acts aid man in fighting the effects of malum on the powers of the soul, more particularly ignorantia and concupiscence. As an effect of continuously changing world, the different types of good also changes right in front of man's appetite. For instance, in the past, man's desire, man's desire the fastest and strongest horse, that is available to aid him in traveling. But nowadays, because people would choose a BMW rather than a horse for more comfortable travel because people, before, people are already satisfied with beepers that would allow them to connect with their friends and relatives. But today, most people wanted cellular phones by majority. 
that has the latest application, clear cameras, and good features. Same types of effect, but presented as a different form of good. This does not mean to say that we should reject the things that is that this world offers as a result of innovation and advances in technology. The main point is that, yes, the human person could enjoy these things, but he should not allow him, himself be overwhelmed by those to the extent of making it as, as the central of his life. After all, none of this can perfect man. Deep within his being, there is still the unquenchable thirst to be perfected by a good, which is the very source of perfection and goodness. Surrounded by un uncountable different goods that are all appealing to the senses, the human person needs to rectify his will to the good that is constant and unchanging. The authentic perfection lies on the pursuit of the sumum bonum, which when obtained will never cease to will never cease, in contrast to the lower good that the words offer, which were fleeting happiness and pleasure. The perfection that the sumum bonum yields affect the entirety of man's being, not only some of its physical parts. There is a need for the authentic perfection which can only be attained through rectification of the will so that man, the human person, will be intensified with its being. This intensification brought about by perfection allows the human to be more acquainted with himself which would result to the realization of who he is, what he do, and how, which, and how should he act and why he is. Yeah. Thank you, Joshua. That was, um, that was Joshua Cedric Gundayao from University of the Philippines, Dilman. Uh, so, do we, do we have any questions to Joshua uh, to the concept of St. Bonaventure rectification? Anyone uh, from the audience on site? Um, if there are no questions here, we can move to the questions from the participants on WebEx. Are there any? YouTube? Does anyone have any questions to Joshua on St. Bonaventure? I guess we have some speakers from St. Bonaventure University on, on the parallel session, but they can't ask any questions. Uh, if there are no questions, I can see that Anna is with us. Uh, Anna, would you like to say something? Just please unmute yourself and... Okay, uh, so Joshua, uh, we, your paper was very clear. Thank you for a very inter interesting presentation. Uh, but because it was that clear, I have no questions. Well, you did uh, ask me a question before, and I wanted to give you an answer. You um, asked me, uh, I will read, because we can say anything about God, at, le at least substantially, can we say that in a certain sense, insofar as language is concerned, God is a, a nonsense, because he is beyond the limitation of language. Uh, just as I give you an example, because uh, a child cannot understand Einstein theory, it doesn't mean that uh, the theory itself is a nonsense. Uh, God revealed, he is not a, de a deceiver. He re uh, reveals us his true attrib attributions and uh, 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 his true characteristics. They can speak in terms of those characteristics about uh, about him. It's not what they cannot uh, speak about him at all. Yes, they do speak about him in limitation of our language. Uh, and uh, but it doesn't. Yes, we do not know him in substance. But it doesn't mean that he is a nonsense, or what was revealed to us is a nonsense as well. But there was yet another question, I think very close to that. A question come from somebody, I think from YouTube, I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, was, does God have a gender? Is sex his attribute? If not, why call him or not her, or assuming that God is Father, Son, and the Spirit there? Actually, those two questions are very close. We speak about God within limits of our language. Our language is accustomed to our nature. Gender is our characteristic. It's a characteristic of our created world. 
And to have a gender is to an extent be limited to something. You can discuss to what exactly we are limited, yes? But in any case, it is to build within some limits. God is beyond any limits. God is beyond gender. I would dare to say that God is, please take a pause, now it's coming, God is transgender. He transcends, transcends, uh, transgresses all our conceptions of gender. He is beyond it. But we still need to speak about him in some way. And this, in a way, is limited by our customs, by our customs of our language. And therefore, they need to apply to him some some attributions, some names. So uh, those names, uh, unfortunately, are limited uh, by our uh, culture. And our culture, we all know what it is, uh, usually attributes to a, a person of power, such thing as being him, for instance, okay? But properly speaking, we shouldn't speak about him neither as uh, about uh, she or him, uh, about her or him. Because, as I said, he's beyond all our conceptions of gender and he's beyond of gender itself. So thank you very much and thank you yet again for uh, Joshua. Uh, I see that Joshua asked another question on the chat. Uh, Anna, would you like to, to read it on loud and respond? Uh, okay. What I mean by nonsense, there is totally outside the understanding of men, at least epistemologically. Can we uh, approach God epistemologically or not? You see, if, you're, uh, if you are a Cartesian kind of thinker, you may uh, think that probably God could deceive us and give us false information. But as a Christian, or not only Christian, you can be Jew, you believe that God as a creator, he is a source of truth because he is truth himself. So then God reveals to you from his own words, in his own son, by his own activities, such as creation, for instance. His characteristic, when he reveals who his powers and actions, who he is, the information which they are given and is true, and through this information, he is accessible. But it's, you know, it's, uh, again, you see human action as performing something good. Because of that, you said that man is good. But is good and who man is, is two different things. That doesn't mean what we have no, uh, no whatsoever epistemological access to God. I hope it suffice. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering and thank you for this discussion. Joshua also thanks you. Um, okay, uh, Martin, would you like to, to would you like to ask something? Uh, maybe I would like to add just one or two words on this subject because it's about science. It's about language. We believe that we see things through language, but any time you come to a place described to you, for instance, in a guide, you see things differently than you actually imagine them. Every sign can be looked at as a kind of arrow pointing to a direction, and we build an image based on what we see, but actually when we arrive, we, we meet something else. With God, it's just much stronger much stronger. We are building a sign whose meaning is based on our direct experiences. And it is not a false sign because it's pointing into correct direction. But what we see will exceed enormously what we find here. And uh, I would like to excuse myself for a kind of over-rhetorical speaking in uh, what you are going to display. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for this discussion about two different talks, but, but thank you. Um, we should move to, to the next talk by Martin Podlielski from Jesuit University Ignatianum. Thank you very much for, for all the answers and um, questions. And now Martin will give a talk on trusting the words, trusting the truth, how theology created the first Christian philosophy. So um, now we will have Martin's lecture displayed and after it we'll have a discussion. So please keep all your questions. We ask people watching us on YouTube and Facebook to write a comment and we will ask these questions for you to Martin. Good morning. Good morning. The title of my presentation is Trusting the Words, Trusting the Truth. How theology created first Christian philosophy. The question of how early Christians became interested in independent practice of philosophy is not easy to answer. The difficulty pertains not so much to facts, for we know quite well who among patristic authors relied in their statements on, on philosophies of various kinds, or who proposed original ideas of philosophical importance. The difficulty in answering this question consists rather in deciding what kinds of discussion of terms and ideas amount to a philosophical endeavor, and what turns those discussions into a truly Christian approach to philosophy. I cannot pretend that any definitive answer to this question is to be offered in my presentation. Rather, I want to turn your attention to a neglected author in whom, in my opinion, all constituents of Christian of philosophy emerged together already in 6th century AD, and furthermore, in whom all those constituents can be considered as establishing together a paradigmatic whole. The author in question is Leontius of Jerusalem, a man writing polemical treatises against miaphysitism and emerging monothelitism, most probably after the Second Council of Chalcedon. I have encountered his works thanks to participation in a project devo devoted to retracing the origins of the metaphysical notion of individual and Christological debates of early Byzantine period. It is in the book titled Discovery of Individual, which, as we hope, should be published quite soon, that detailed analysis both of his heritage and historical, historical involvements will be presented to a larger public. The book is co-authored by the PI of the project Early Byzantine Metaphysics and my wife, Anna Zhirkova, and by me. Here, I would like only to pinpoint to some lessons that can be drawn from Leontius' approach to philosophy. It must be admitted that Leontius was a theologian and a polemist. His work, attacking most probably the disciples of Philoponus under the guise of Nestorians, were of great importance for settling clearly the issue of what hypostasis of Christ is. The formulations he elaborates in Contra Nestorianos and in Aporia can be found, however deprived of Reontius Rationale, in John of Damascus' Dialectics and in various passages of Maximus the Confessor. As a polemist, nevertheless, Leontius himself was forgotten, while his work is preserved in just one manuscript, a 19th century edition thereof. Its reader will encounter, especially in Contra Nestorianus, very long series of arguments deployed against the views of heretics, in which is put forward a rational defense of the truth of faith that two natures, human and divine, were united cat hypostasin with respect or according to the hypostasis of the Christ. It is in those arguments that we can find a radically novel philosophy, dispersed in hundreds of separate remarks, yet argued for in each of those remarks, and constructed through vehement opposition not only to heretic theological claims, but also to their underlying philosophical views about created reality. While one might be tempted to grant the name of philosophy only to a systematic body of doctrines and arguments, this is not what turns a doctrinal worldview into a philosophy. Rather, 
A philosophy emerges when theoretical wisdom about our world is sought as such, and when this wisdom is considered as obtained by the means of human cognitive powers. We can probably say that such an effort constitutes a Christian philosophy when the following criteria are met by a body of doctrines and arguments. It is philosophy, first, developed by Christians, b, for Christian purposes, c, when a specifically Christian agenda is followed, d, when, those, when a philosophy whose proponents recur to a methodology both rational and e, expressing Christian, Christian attitude about the world. And F, a philosophy that proposes solution which could not originate outside Christian contexts. In my opinion, all this does take place in the work of Leontius of Jerusalem, and furthermore, can be observed there in a paradigmatic form, in spite of the fact that the actual body of his teaching has to be disentangled from his theological arguments and recovered in a complex reconstructive effort. In the limited time we have here, I can only attempt to substantiate those claims by turning attention to just one among Leontius' arguments in Contra Nestorianus. The argument in question can be found in CN 2.47, where Leontius opposes the idea that the Christ is an individual, such as defined in Porphyry's Isagoge, whose logical discussions are taken by heretics as if they presented a metaphysical truth. For Leontius, I name opponents. Each individual belongs to a species, Eidos, and thereby, as established by this species of form, must be deemed uniform or monoides. Thus, there can be no individual endowed like Christ with multiplicity of forms. Leontius' answer to this charge is, is interesting in many respects. First and foremost, he assumes that he shares with the heretics the most fundamental faith about the Christ, that in him, as in the Mediator, are united the natures of God and human. What he reproaches to his adversaries is rather narrow-mindedness, consisting on the one hand in their incapacity to treat the case of the Christ as supernatural, but on the other in not being able to grasp the logos of things dissimilar. In other terms, his opponents are not capable of accounting for the similarity and uniqueness of things. He shows them an example of such logos, of doubtlessly non-theological nature. However, out of exuberance, one can show you individuals which neither are simply uniform nor fall under one species, but which fall under different species. For in the case of Bert Fasians, and such other similar realities. One cannot say that the singular individual is either something uniform or falls under one species, since it has not been arranged anywhere either among pure or among uncleansed species. Each species has taken subsistence in itself and not in other species. Thus, if the species of the Phasian bird is taken away from that species, also its constitution is taken away from it with respect of hypostasis. It can be therefore clearly concluded that there will be most noble individuals. They will be both one and many more similar ones, because a most noble natural species does not subsist in them. The argument is dense and difficult to decipher. It relies on the example of pheasants, called in antiquity Phasian birds, that is, birds originating from the banks of River Physis, nowadays Rioni in Georgia. What it appears to say is, however, quite simple, even confirming those intuitions takes many pages of analysis in our book. Pheasants, as known to contemporary ornithologists, and apparently also to Leontius, constitute one species capable of breeding in spite of many external differences of what one can consider to be its form. Divergence within a form does not mean, however, that the form is absent here. This is because if the form were taken away, the hypostasis of a given individual would become formless. It would lose its systasis. 
Cis, that's its, its constitution, that in such individuals would become most novel because all what such individual would be would come from absence of determination. Determination must exist individually through each hypostasis, which is not a hypostasis, a subsistence of nothing whatsoever. This must be the case in spite of the fact that an eidos, a species form, can be deemed to subsist in itself. Such subsistence, as other passages in Leontius suggest, consists in that a nature by itself, by itself is a logically consistent set of determinations, even if nature does not subsist on its own. This short argument completes and alludes to many statements and arguments of metaphysical character that can be found in Contra Nestorianus. Most important among them is recognizing that hypostasis of a particular reality is its moment of apostasis, separation sacrament of this particular from other particulars by the mere fact of existence, hyparxis. Hypostasis is never identified by Leontius with particular or individual being. Rather, it is shown as a kind of created inner principle of existence and separation. As such, it requires for its constitution that there be a nature in each hypostatical being. Still, nature, in order to exist, requires a hypostasis. In nature, needs to be unhypostasized, given existence in a hypostasis. Leontius makes it quite clear that without such concrete existence, there simply would be no nature and that there can be no pure natures. Still, nature is the source of order and conformity in the world, and there is a common nature to a species of individuals subsistent in itself, even if we cannot show that there is complete identity of form in a number of individuals of this species. All these conclusions are reached on the margins of theological discussions. Leontius does his best to present to his prospective readers that he does not engage in philosophical inquiry carried out for its own purposes. The philosophy he does not want to be confused with is the purely rational enterprise, commenting on the imminent causes of the world, which he knows it not from Philoponus himself, then at least from his less educated followers in the monasteries of Palestine. And yet, Leontius does make claims about created world and does argue for his claims. He brings about the evidence of nature, known to him via examples drawn from human science and medicine. It appears, based on those examples, that he was acquainted with pieces of scientific factual knowledge that were lost later on, one can find in his, uh, in his arguments detailed medical references to how drugs are prepared, such drugs as eye drops that could actually work, according to our contemporary historians of medicine. From a philosophical point of view, his arguments rely on rationally organized sensual experience. The other source of his evidence is our language. Leontius clarifies such terms as nature, hypostasis, species, form, by pointing to everyday reference of those terms, such as the form of an actual species of animal, and more importantly, to the intuitions of the verb huein and hephistanai. He does not speak of nature in abstraction of the fact that things are born to be something, and of hypostasis in abstraction of the fact expressed by hephistami, the fact that something has received being and subsistence. This kind of evidence is put forward against speculation focused on abstract terms, with which philosophy in his era could have been too easily associated. This kind of stance, apparently built through an attitude which opposes common sense to speculation, ends up with a set of very subtle metaphysical proposals. Hypostasis and nature emerge in a closer analysis as two inner irreducible principles of created beings. Each of them is irreducible to the other and does not cause the other. God, as Leontius says, is the only cause of hypostasis and nature. 
In this way, in spite of absence of a term such as individual being, a peculiarly Christian dialectic of the generic and the concrete of nature and hypostasis emerges in Leontius. It's a peculiarly Christian dialectic because it is postulated first and foremost by the problems that arise in accounting for the Christ. In the physically concrete and existentially unique Christ, two natures are truly realized, that of a human, and of the divine, as the Christ can be considered an instance of humanity, but is also one of the Trinity, which is one and only God. We can now return to the set of criteria put forward at the beginning of this presentation, through which a philosophical account of reality can be characterized as Christian philosophy. A. What Lantris proposes is a set of philosophical insights developed by Christians that is, by people who share the faith in Jesus the Christ, truly God and truly human. His arguments assume that those to whom he wants to speak have this faith. His insights are proposed for Christian purposes. It's point B. He does not seek for wisdom for its own sake, but in order to resolve the doctrinal contentions dividing the Christians of his era. C. He follows a specifically Christian agenda, consisting in offering a clear account of the truths of faith, such an account that does not spur further debates and that does not contradict the meanings of our language. For Christian faith is expressed in ordinary language, and while it requires accepting facts that transcend nature, the words in which those facts are conveyed have their meanings rooted in our experience of nature. This kind of agenda is specific for Christian faith, in which the transcendent reality cannot be just expressed through Neoplatonic silence. In the Incarnation, the transcendent reality has taken flesh in the Christ, who lived with us and spoke to us in our language. D. Leontius' philosophical insights are built accordingly from a methodology that relies on trust in the language, and in the contents of sensual cognition, but consists in an analytical approach toward intuitions of language and contents of sensual experience, say us. A humility of human reason that does not dare to look for other ultimate causes and God himself, and does not offer an explanatory metaphysical system, so characteristic of his methodological stance, should not be confused with skepticism. Leontius does believe in the capacity of our reason to understand the created universe. He simply does not aspire at understanding that which transcends nature, even if he believes that correct theological account of transcendent truths based on revelation can be achieved. F. The philosophical solution that he proposes is ironically Christian. For the dialectics of hypostasis and nature as to created principles of, a con of concrete reality is possible to be conceived of only when the ultimate arche is not contained within the world. Leontius is a philosopher of a world which is not self-explanatory, but can be truly spoken of even if systematic exposition of the causes of the universe may evade us. As such, in his focus on facts of experience and truth as vehicles in language, he is a paradigmatic Christian philosopher. He offers us the paradigm of Christian philosophical practice, even by his avoidance to be taken for a philosopher. A philosophy. Philosophy in this approach is a practice among many, one in which a Christian intellectual needs Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for this talk. That was Martin Podbielski from Jesuit University Ignatianum. And now we can kick off with the questions. Uh, first, I will start with the questions on site. There are not many people here, but maybe. If there are any questions from the audience on site. Uh, and if there are no questions on site, we can move to the questions from the participants on WebEx. Just please unmute yourself and ask the questions to Martin. Wojciech, please. Try to unmute myself. A uh, very simple question, and uh, well, perhaps. Can we, 
title of your presentation, uh, how philosophy created the first Christian theology. I am not a theologian. I can't. Res I can't say that I do understand how philosophy created theology, but I'm very much under the influence when defining theology. I'm very much under the influence of the introduction of John of Damascus dialectics, which Anna translated some time ago into Polish, and I helped her with first sentence. It's a very beautiful sentence, actually one page long. And there, a theologian is not defined as a researcher or a scientist inquiring into the meanings. First and foremost, a theologian is someone who legatatheia, legatatheia, if we pronounce, or legatatheia, someone who says divine things, through whom the words of revelation take once more their shape. Because of that, a theologian can use philosophy if such words are necessary, but can use no words of philosophy. And first theologian in this sense, someone who allows his mind to be informed by God and speak divine matters, first theologian is John uh, is John uh, the Evangelist, uh, who does not need to know any kind of philosophy. Actually, if you read his uh, gospel in Greek, it's very clear he had no formal instruction. He basically doesn't use any difficult grammar. His grammar is basically the grammar of modern Greek rather than ancient Greek. In spite of that, he is a theologian. So I don't think you need philosophy in order to create theology. You may need some philosophical words informing, some philosophical definitions informing your language. And ultimately it emerged that in definitions of, of faith, actually, in not dogmatic statement, but in statements of the councils through which certain the formulations of faith were forbidden, actually, in order to produce these statements, especially negative statements about faith, and to propose a formula that does not, con does not lead to any kind of wrong conclusion, you need philosophical precision. And you need to engage into, in philosophy, either by using philosophies that already exist, or by proposing a new set of terms based on a new set of insights. And the latter is first clearly and consciously done by three authors to whom uh, the, who are the main heroes of our book, and most consciously probably by Leontius of Jerusalem, who did create a new set of philosophical insights and reformulated uh, existing philosophical terminology. This is how you use theology unless you are someone like a natural theologian who moves to a revealed philosophy. But it's a little bit different. This is the case of Justin B. Martin. This is the case of Augustine, someone who was trained in philosophy, who could express his quest for wisdom in philosophical terms, but then found himself, himself a higher wisdom. Still, even then, philosophy needs to be conceived of as a kind of practice. So you have a practice of theology, like in John the Evangelist. You have practice of philosophy, like in Socrates, continued, uh, for instance, by St. Augustine, who was looking for wisdom for philosophy, you find yourself in the Socratic moment of being lost, not so much of ignorance, but being lost because of ignorance, being at a loss about yourself. And only then you grasp a different kind of, a kind of wisdom. You grasp it through your faith. So, and then only theology starts, but it's like a 
path you follow in which you reach a point via philosophy and go further on through theology. Philosophical words stay with you, but they gain new meanings thanks to new experiences of faith. Now, it's not, I don't think that philosophy can build uh, theology. I think it can be used in various manners, but it's not necessary for theology at all, at least so long, as long there are no so many doctrinal cont uh, controversies as they arose in early Christianity. All right. Thank you very much for this question. I can see one more question from Anna, and we received one more question from the YouTube stream, so please, Anna, first. Uh, it's not a question, it's rather a remark to what Martin said. I think that philosophy is a necessary tool, not unnecessary. We can uh, do philo the theology uh, without philosophy for very sim uh, simple reason. We need to speak with each other, we need to define terms, we, we need to understand each other. It's not possible that we'll uh, speak about, for instance, God's substance and everyone and each of us would understand by substance something different. So it's a question of common language. But, as I said, it's a necessary tool, but it's a tool only. If theology is an outcome of doing philosophy, something is wrong with this theology. It cannot be that a tail of dog starts to rule the dog. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, we received one question, and I will, I will read it uh, to you, Marcin. The question is, I am puzzled with your characteristics of the Christian philosophy. That is, point C, what is a Christian agenda specifically? And point F, what could be a sample solution proposed to make a world a better place, which could not have originated outside the Christian context? So I guess the question is about the point C and point F. Okay. I must admit that what you see is a first sketch of the final chapter of our book. And that at, I devised all those criteria on the run when sketching, sketching the book. What I gave the name to of Christian agenda is a set of issues we need to resolve within Christianity. So, and not, if you're a philosopher, you're worried, you're concerned about how the world exists, what things are, what substances are, whether there are substances, uh, how we cognize the world. And these are not by their very essence Christian concerns. When you become a Christian, there emerge there, there emerges a number, there emerge a number of specifically Christian intellectual concerns which need being answered. Those concerns are associated with what we believe in, which is very difficult to express, uh, or especially with the Trinity, first. Second, it's extremely difficult to express uh, who is Christ, not to grasp it, not to feel it, to express it. Third, matters such as relationship of human soul to God and his presence in us are extremely difficult to express. So naturally, when we are looking for language to express that, we focus ourselves on the part of reality that can give answer to those questions. On the one hand, it is a philosophical endeavor because we are looking at this world and create senses of our language based on analysis of this world. On the other hand, we do have a very specific Christian agenda. If you go to Augustine, he's just a philosopher. He does quite a lot of purely philosophical speculation, amazing speculation. He does quite a lot of semantics. But you don't see direct link between his metaphysical or semantic concerns and specifically Christian intellectual problems. You see them in a larger context, but not directly. In launches of Bazan of Jerusalem, those link between Christian intellectual concern and what he focuses on is very visible. 
And historically, in Middle Ages, uh, Christian philosophers will be following that path, very narrow understanding of Christian philosophy. Then, and uh, obviously, later on, Christians will become more general philosophers. It's like a kind of, uh, so the conception I brought here is more descriptive than prescriptive. I don't say Christians must do this kind of philosophy like Leon should did. I'm saying that it's specifically Christian philosophy such as can be described. I'm acting here as a historian of philosophy. Now for F. Uh, point F was, I need to read it. Sorry for, uh, for that. Uh, I must remind myself. Yeah. Specifically Christian attitude. And uh, or no, answers which can or, uh, answers in Christian context. So another time it is a descriptive point. I'm addressing here the classical Gilson's concept of Christian philosophy. He said that any Christian philosophy is philosophy that recognizes a uh, importance of faith and importance of revelation, the contents of revelation in proposing solutions, in inspiring solutions. If you adopt a specifically Christian attitude about the world, like believing possibility of speaking truly, it's a belief, because we believe that Christ is not lying to us, like believing that we do live in this world uh, physically and not skeptical, but also being humble about because God is much greater than us and we can't understand everything. If we accept this stance, if we accept this stance that everything was created, then some philosophical solutions are precluded while others show themselves up. So in metaphysical speculation, you are forbidden to look for the ultimate principle of things in this world. It's a part of Christian stance. But because of that, you can refine your thinking about created principles. And you can propose quite a different metaphysics. Another time, it is a descriptive term. Now going to your part about prescriptive proposals. How can we make the world a better place? I've lived some time in this world, and I can answer you as a philosopher. We can't do much about it. Sorry about that. You know... 50 years ago, people have lived through a horrible experience, experience of Second World War. Then the elites and many people and many educated people got deeply afraid of who they are. But because of that, also a desire for good emerged, showed up in human souls. And you could listen yesterday to people who believe that who wrote theology in this time or relied on the theology of 60s and 70s. People believed then that everyone has God in himself, that we can find God in ourselves, and because of that we can become better. Actually, we're back to normal. Some people find God in themselves. Some people reject this divine uh, spark, whatever it is, and are very happy about being back and uh, can say that uh, no matter, I can be re-elected uh, to some, many hundred thousands of people can die, and uh, it's not a problem. So, in improving this world, philosophers, be sure of that, are helpless. Many of them did try it. And many of them are trying it again. If you open Zizek, he's very happy to be radical. But in a certain moment, he says, no, radicalism must go to the very end. So if you need to kill, don't be afraid of killing. Be proud of that. In this moment, you see that philosophical radicalism can lead you another time to bloodbath. So I don't believe in philosophy making the world better. Okay. Can Christianity make the world better? It's a different question. Okay, thank you, Martin, for this. We are running short of time, but the very last question I will ask you to, to give a short answer, uh, because I like this question we received. What would be Christian philosophy and Catholic philosophy? And we could also ask, would it be an evangelical philosophy or any other? 
would be Christian philosophy, Catholic philosophy. I think Christian philosophy, you know, there is kind of common dogmatic ground between Catholics and the, the Catholics and the Orthodox. And there is somewhat different ground between the evangelicals and Catholics. You can see it. I did work for some time in an evangelical institution. I could see that it was different. The view of who we are, the experiences of spiritual life are different. If your philosophy, like philosophy of Augustine, is based on phenomenology of your spiritual life, and in this way is fused with theology, then this will be different. And uh, solutions about human nature may be different. If you are going back to this common world, a very confusing world of, of, of Catholics and Eastern Orthodoxy, I think this would be one philosophy in spite of different theologies. But if you're discuss discussing things outside human nature, outside the issue of grace and living your spiritual life, outside of the issue of guilt, I think this would be one and the same philosophy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, we need to move on to the next to the next talk. Thank you for thank you for the talk, Martin. Thank you for the questions from the YouTube and from the questions from the participants. Now we will move to um, to our next speaker, Silvia Parigi from Instituto Italiano per gli Studi Filosofici. Sorry if I spell something wrong. Uh, Silvia will give a talk about Jesuits. Jesuits and action at a distance, Athanasius Kircher's universal magnetism. I think all Jesuits who watch us in this moment are getting excited to hear something about the very important historian Jesuit uh, from 16th or 17th century, I guess. So uh, I will display the lecture of Sylvia now and we'll have a discussion after it. It is a well-founded opinion that the Society of Jesus gives a remarkable support to the study of physics in the 17th century. The Jesuit works lay the foundations of optics, mechanics, magnetism, and electricity. Nevertheless, it is very difficult to define the nature and extent of a Jesuit science, about which, indeed, there are few specific studies. The Jesuits remained within an eclectic Aristotelianism, constantly searching for mediations and compromises. Athanasius Kircher defined as Germanus Incredibilis, or the last man who knew everything, is an exemplary witness of such e eclecticism. He is an extraordinary figure in the 17th century Christian philosophy, both for his encyclopedic contribution to many different fields of research, for his constant apologetic and missionary effort, and for his organizational skills as a teacher, as a scholar, as a creator of wonderful machines and of the very well-known museum in Collegio Romano. The Jesuit polymath mastered 24 languages. In the 46 years he spent in Rome, he saw six popes. He left more than 40 printed works and 2,000 letters and manuscripts. My speech will face Kircher's contribution to curious physics, that is to say, his universal magnetism, as it is exposed in the third book of Magnus Sive de Arte Magnetica, published in 1641. That book, titled Mundus Sive Catena Magnetica, contains the widest discussions on magnetism in the modern age. Kierkegaard's universal magnetism stands on few principles. One, everything acts by means of effluvia, that is to say, in Aristotelian terms, through the diffusion of its quality. Two, an effluxus can be conceived only by means of certain short lines spreading in a circle. Three, magnet acts this way. Therefore, the logical conclusion is that the forces 
and qualities of each thing which acts on every other thing by means of reciprocal radiations may be called magnetic. The core concept is sfera activitatis, sive orbis virtutis, defined as that region of space within, within which the active qualities of bodies spread through material effluvia. This concept is a typical Jesuit compromise. Though refusing actions at a distance with rare unanimity, the Jesuits largely use the concept of the sphere of activity of a body. Therefore, the magnetic powers exist, but only within certain limits set by God. He did not create nature idle and without any fruits, otiosa et sine fructu, but at the same time, he circumscribes the activity of the spheres of effluvia, thus preventing nature from dissolving in a progressum in infinitum, which is repugnant to reason, no less than to nature itself. Therefore, actions at a distance are not rejected to cool, but only if unlimited, sine termino. Leonardo Garzoni, Niccolò Cabeo, Jean Roberti, Athanasius Kircher, Caspar Schott, Francesco Lana Terzi agree about this. Moreover, the, the sphere of activity has a greater or lesser extension according to the more or less cautious temperament of the authors themselves. Some of them use that concept only to explain the properties and behavior of the magnetic needle, whereas Kierkegaard thinks that everything has a sphere of activity and dilates that principle up to heaven in order to explain the astrological influences within the framework of a very suggestive but theoretically demanding universal magnetism. As listed in the subtitle of his work, Kierkegaard deals with the nature of magnet, its marvelous effects upon the elements, stones, plants, and animals, its uses in all the arts and sciences with a new method and many still unknown secrets of nature by means of every kind of physical, medical, chemical, and mathematical experiments. An horror vacui transpires from such a project which highlights the argumentative bulimia of Kierkegaard's work, full of actions, definitions, propositions, and theorems in spite of its definitely not deductive structure. Nevertheless, Kierkegaard preliminarily declares and often repeats throughout his work that he wants to discriminate fabulous stories in his inquiry about the prodigious virtues of the magnet. It is necessary to find the right means between, between the credulity of those men who consider such virtues as downright marvelous and the opposed credulity of those who a priori refuse to admit such powers. In both cases, no analysis can be made. Magnus begins with the analogy between micro and macrocosm. As the bones of the human body, so the stone parts constituting the body of the earth have a certain magnetic structures from pole to pole, like a spine of the world. Among the examples of magnetic attraction, there are the bones of the sparrow hawk capable of attracting gold and the horn of rhinoceros, which attracts iron, whereas the weapon sold is a mere magnetic superstition. Kircher does not believe that the earth is a big magnet and explicitly attacks William Gilbert's theory. The magnetic power spreads in a sphere of activity, which is interpreted in Aristotelian terms as an intrinsic quality emanating from the whole form of the magnet. Such virtue acts upon those friendly, proportioned, and similar body, bodies, amica proportionata et consimilia, placed within that space. Kirk 
Eckhart's work culminates in the third and last book, Mundus Sive Catena Magnetica. In the frontispiece, the sense and extent of universal magnetism are wonderfully illustrated. A scroll with the motto, I'm quoting, all the things are connected by secret ties. Omnia nodis arcanis connexa quiescunt. Joins the links of a great chain connecting the archetypal world dominated by God's eye, the sidereal world, the sublunary world, and the human microcosm, as well as all the sciences from theology placed in the highest position to philosophy and physics, from rhetoric to music, from perspective to mechanics, from geography to astronomy and arithmetic, from poetry to medicine, from natural magic to cosmography. The key of nature, clavis nature, is the agreement and disagreement of things, that is to say, sympathy and antipathy, exemplified by the usual list of friendships and enmities in the three reigns of nature. The theoretical cornerstones of universal magnetism, magnetism are exposed in just two pages through four quick passages. As everything acts by means of a fluxi, that is to say, through the diffusion of its quality. But an effluxus, I'm quoting, cannot be conceived except by means of certain very short lines circularly spread. And given that the magnet acts this way, it follows that, and I'm quoting again, the forces and qualities of all those things acting the ones upon the others by means of a mutual radiation may be called magnetic. As to the way in which that force acts, Kircher conjectures clouds of effluvia, little atmospheres, or spheres of activities surrounding magnetic, electric, or elementary bodies. Kircher's theory is very simple, almost poor, and quickly exposed, but the number of examples and magnetic stories is impressive. Because of the aforesaid inclination, a magnet disposes itself in the direction of the terrestrial poles according to its nature, and avoids any other position. The magnetic force explains the unbearable tickle of the visual muscles produced by bright red color as well. The paralysis induced by the touch of the torpedo fish, which is one of the numerous magnetic animals, the sudden stupor provoked by the bite of the tarantula, the form of the rabid dog impressed in its urine, the hate of the ants towards the organo and the heart of the hupo, hupo, the property owned by the liver of chame chameleon to dissolve love potions. Kircher expresses the demanding intention to reduce miracles in his explanation of natural effects. Nos ne nimium miracula multiplicare videamur, but as it often happens with 16th and 17th century authors. The explanations he gives are often more fabulous than those he rejects. Kierkegaard's credulity does not include the remora fish, a real sea magnet, which according to Pliny, caused Antony's defeat at Azio, stopping his ship, which it had stuck to. This, this little fish is mere fabulous because there is no proportion between the immense mass of a sheep, mass of a sheep and the exiguity of that fish. Nothing analogous has ever happened in the Mediterranean or other seas. Therefore, the sudden stop of a sheep has not to be attributed to the remora fish as some inexpert and too credulous philosophers do or to occult qualities and obscure celestial influxes, but simply to sea currents. Nevertheless, 
Kierke believes in the magnetism of the torpedo fish, which circularly emits an insensible narcotic quality opposed to the nerves and muscles, thus freezing the blood and spirit in the veins. He also accepts the marvelous phenomenon of the anthropomorphous fish, mermaid or seaman, found in the Indian Oriental Seas. His bones attract the blood in that they have anti-hemorrhagic properties, while his meat, a substance like mummy, is supposed to have a paralyzing effect because of the attraction of all, all the human spirits. Like a book of secrets, Magnus contains some recipes drawn from the Arabic books of potable gold, elixir vitae, fifth essence of the Thiriac, universal antidote, heaven, living water, or vegetable mercury. Consider it as a panacea. As in a magical treatise, Kircher writes of the double magnetism of man who attracts his necessary daily nourishment from the elementary bodies with his elementary body by means of the inclinations of hunger and thirst. Whereas we see with his ethereal spirit, he attracts the arts, the sciences, and all the faculties of the human knowledge through the race, the race of superior virtues. The magnetic power ends up to coinciding with platonic love, which joins the superior forms and effects to the inferior ones in a great manner. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia. That was Silvia Paraghi from Instituto Italiano per Studi Filosofici. I can see that Silvia is with us, so we can uh, we can move to the questions. Um, do we have any questions from the participants on site or the participants on WebEx? I re I see we have one qu or two two questions on the stream. Maybe I will read them and then we can move to the other questions. Um, so the first question is not really a question, it's like a, a comment. Anyway, I will read it. I thought it was Leibniz who knew everything. It's prob it probably refers to what you said that Kircher was the last man who, who knew everything. And the other question is more interesting. What are philosophical implications of Kircher's magnetism and how does it contribute to the Christian philosophy? This might be interesting. Yes, um, the, philosoph the philosophical implications of Kircher magnetism. But yes, uh, Kircher's magnetism is a, philo a philosophical theory. <laughs> it's, so, uh, its implications are in the direction of natural magic and natural philosophy that are deeply inter intertwined, interconnected in this century, in the uh, 17th century. So magnetism is universal magnetism is an aspect, an important theory within the, the framework of uh, natural magic and natural philosophy. Um, the, the core uh, concept is the idea of a unique magnetic chain uh, which um, links together uh, everything in nature from uh, the magnet uh, so, uh, to, uh, up to God, God is the um, is defined as the link. I'm, I'm quoting from Kierkegaard, the living and eternal magnet. So this great magnetic chain starts from God and links every um, every phenomenon, uh, every science, every kind of um, of learning. And anyway, uh, everything in in nature. Um, it's a kind of Renaissance theory. It's deeply linked to uh, Renaissance magic. I, I'm, I'm not sure to have, um, I, I, I don't know if this is a complete answer or if there are some other uh, doubts and questions uh, I have to answer too. We have received just one uh, right now. 
How the concept of magnetism refers to the concept of God? Does it explain the way in which God remains everything in existence and how he acts in the world? Um, I think not. Uh, I think not. Um, God is only the, uh, the final link of this uh, universal chain. And um, there is a kind of um, platonic love, of mutual love, uh, which links each, um, which links each, uh, each link of this chain. So um, God uh, is loved by everything, and uh, everything uh, ends up in God. But um, I think this is a, a, a new platonic theory. Uh, and a platonic, a new, a new platonic theory, and is a, a Renaissance theory uh, as well. But I, I, I don't think this is a, a, a theological theory. Um, I see no questions more on YouTube. Do we have any questions from the participants online on WebEx? Okay, if there are no questions, the, the last call, and if there are no questions, we can move uh, further. Thank you very much, Sylvia, for the talk. Thank you, Thank you for Thank answering. You. Thank you. Watching us. And now we can move to Wojciech Szczerba from Evangelical School of Theology in Wrocław and from Van Hugel Institute or at St. Edmunds College, University of Cambridge. And I can see Wojciech is with us. Wojciech will give a talk on the concept of universal salvation in the thought of Friedrich Schleiermacher. Uh, okay, I will display the Wojciech's uh, talk right now, and we will we could have a discussion on Schleiermacher and the universal salvation after it. The concept of eternal salvation in the thought of Friedrich Schleiermacher. The philosophical concept of universal salvation, apocatastasis, shaped in the Greek and Christian thought, basically means the restoration of the primal state of existence of creation, which has been lost due to the original sin or the law of necessity. In the early philosophical traditions, the restoration is understood most of all in the macro scale and refers to the entire reality. In the later post-Platonic philosophical systems, where the human being becomes the center of interest, apocatastasis is rendered particularly with a reference to the human soul or the divine element embodied in the rational uh, creation. Restoration of the primal state means here the abolition of everything, including the suffering and death, and the renewal of, of the perfect original relationship between the creator and creation, or actualization of the intended plan of the creator creator for the creation. In the Christian thought, the concept of the universal scope of salvation takes various forms and various levels on, of certainty. Sometimes apocatastasis is understood in terms of amnesty, especially in the thought systems, which particularly stress the sovereignty and the power of God, like Gregor of Nyssa. Yet sometimes apocatastasis takes the form of the general repentance, where the emphasis is put on the freedom of creation, the pedagogical dimension of the relation of the creator to the creation, like origin. In most cases, the Christian version of the universal salvation assumes the eschatological preservation of the identity and consciousness of the creation. Yet some Christian thinkers, especially those affiliated with the Neoplatonic tradition point to the possible eschatological dissolving of the creation in God, culminating in the return of the rational being to the idea in the mind of God, like a Ryugana, in such a way that finally God will be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15. The concept of apocatastasis was condemned during the Second Council of Constantinople in 553 and the subsequent councils. Nevertheless, it has not disappeared from the Christian thought in its various proveniences, both in the medieval and modern ages. At the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, Friedrich Schleiermacher, an outstanding philosopher and theologian of the Reformed tradition, gets close in his thought system to the concept of universal salvation. How Schleiermacher 
are growing out of conservative, pietistic, reformed, Protestant circles reaches the hope of salvation of all the people. In my analysis of Schleiermacher's understanding religion and his soteriology, I'm limiting, limiting most of all to his early treatise, speeches to its cultural despisers, especially its first unrevised edition is important from the philosophical perspective. Equally important for the analysis of the concept of religion, the thought of Schleiermacher, is his later book, Christian Faith. It is a much more mature and dogmatically correct writing than the early speeches. It indicates the evolution of the thought of a German thinker. Additionally, Schleiermacher's essay on the doctrine of election with special references to aphorisms of Dr. Brett Schneider may be seen as some kind of introduction to the treatise Christian faith. In the essay, the theologian refers to the doctrine of predestination but portrays it in a radical way as predestination of all the people to salvation by God. So how Schleiermacher understands religion? Most of all, he opposes treating religion as a category of outer ecclesiastical systems. Religion understood in such a way is nothing more than the product of calculation of human mind. It shrinks the transcendental matters to the language and images of people. Religion should not be restricted to morality either. The piety is not the condition sine qua non of moral life. As Spinoza proved, it is possible to live morally while not believing in God. And finally, religion should not be equated with metaphysics, since metaphysics, according to Kant's epistemology, is inaccessible to human being. Getting tangled up with metaphysical attempts to describe religion leads at best to new mythology, and false image of religion. In the speeches, Schleiermacher defends the esoteric, apophatic nature of religion and points to the mystery which is inevitably included in it. In every religion, he says, what is holy remains a mystery and is hidden from the profanes. The true religion, according to Schleiermacher, is based on a special kind of experience, gefühl and intuition, anschau, the theologian speaks about it, an overwhelming but transient moment, augenblick, when a person experiences the totality of the world, merges with it, and becomes one with the universe. It is a total experience which precedes any kind of reflection, any consideration of the experience. In this moment, that which is infinite and limitless takes over what is finite and limited. It is also a passing experience. It disappears as quickly as the person realizes its existence. The feeling, the consciousness acquired in the moment of merging with the universe becomes the essence of religion, the principle of piety of the person. Thus, religion is not the very perception of the experience. It is not the object which is perceived. It is the primal, undefined experience of merging with the universe and the feeling which the experience leaves. In the first edition of the speech, Shalya Maha writes about the intuition of the world stressing the direct precognitive relation to the universe. In the later editions, and the treatise, The Christian Faith, he defines religion as a feeling of total dependence on the universe. And in the letter to his friend Luca, he points to the religious direct existence dependency. In the same time, Schleiermacher maintains that religion is the sense and taste for the infinite, God consciousness, which every person has, and is nothing else than the feeling of total dependence. The religious predisposition, according to Schleiermacher, is universal in its character. It can be developed, actualized in every person, strengthening God consciousness in them. After all, all people are equal, which is expressed by the biblical theological concept of Imago Dei. Every person is an image of infinity in the finite world. What is the place of Christianity, then, in the thought of Schleiermacher? Religion per se, as it is understood by Schleiermacher, is universal in its character. Intuition and feeling cannot be limited to one theologian ecclesiastical system. Religion in general is infinite in its character, just as the universe is infinite, which it reveals. Nevertheless, even though the religious intuition is limitless in its nature, still by necessity it is exemplified first 
in the personal piety religion, a second in historical, historically shaped religious systems. In this sense, Schleiermacher cannot equate Christianity and the general religion. He can at most maintain that Christianity is one of the forms, expressions of religion, which can be captured, described by various traditions and practices. Nevertheless, Schleiermacher grants Christianity the highest position among historical religions arguing that it most often and preferably watches the universe in religion and its history, and as such it is kind of religion of religions. Likewise, Christ, in his understanding, is the highest mediator between the human being and God. Christ was human with perfect God consciousness, which actually embodied in him the divine and through him developed in other people, religious presupposition, God consciousness. Christianity, from this perspective, exemplifies the higher religious potency. It observes the religion and finds in its frame of reference. Therefore, Schleiermacher maintains that the original intuition of Christianity is always valid, and all religions, in a sense, refer to the core of Christianity as God consciousness. So they become somehow the palingenesis of Christianity. Yet Christianity as such has its limits and will reach them when humanity will finally mature spiritually and will understand that the essence of religion is the universal feeling of dependence. And all kinds of mediators between humanity and the universe are unnecessary. Christianity he says, Exalt, exalted above them all religions, more historical and more humble in its glory, has expressly acknowledged this transitoriness of its temporal existence. A time will come when there shall be no more any mediator, but the Father shall be all in all. Schleiermacher's understanding of religion in terms of intuition and feeling leads him close to a pan-entheistic uptake of reality, according to which the divinity contains in itself the universe, but the universe does not limit the divinity. According to his position, historic religions, including Christianity, merely exemplify the primal experience of the universe, an experience which is available to every person. Such an understanding of the essence of religion leads the theologian to universalistic soteriological belief. How does he get close to the concept of universal salvation? Schleiermacher, coming from the pietistic reformed conservative tradition, which defines the Calvinistic teaching of predestination. Following Augustine and Calvin, he upholds the radical version of the doctrine, pointing that it has strong basis in the scripture and tradition. However, while the Calvinistic concept of predestination contains double aspect of predestination to salvation and condemnation based on twofold will of God for two elected group of people, Schleiermacher claims that first, the doctrine should be rendered with reference to the whole humanity, not individual people, and second, it should be understood in terms of one God's decree predestinating the whole human race to salvation. Schleiermacher does not explicitly advocate the concept of the renewal of all things, apocatastasis, but gets very close to it in his essay, on the doctrine of election, he opposes the teaching of the eternal condemnation and is aware that such a position brings him closer to the teaching of the final restoration, just like the church fathers. It is difficult for him to accept the teaching of the limited scope of salvation if God, the final owner, the final director of reality, wants all people to be saved. Still, is it possible that part of humanity will not enter, the inner community will be eternally condemned. Schleiermacher does not answer all the possible questions concerning the scope of salvation. After all, eschatology exceeds the cognitive possibilities of human beings and gets close to metaphysical considerations. Yet, a number of arguments opposes the concept of limited scope of salvation. First, the final condemnation contradicts the 
concept of sovereignty of God with the Reformed tradition and Slayer Mahermind Tanks. God fully and undeniably rules over the created reality, and his his decrees are absolute in their character. Even faith of a person is finally worked out by God, even though it appears as a free act from the level of human uh, existence. And second, the eternal condemnation contradicts the endless love of the sovereign God, who creates human being according to his image, bestows his spirit upon him, and predestines people to salvation. Is it possible that anybody can effectively oppose the plan of the Creator, especially that according to Christian orthodoxy, human beings are related to God, and evil, understood as the absence of God, does not have ontological status? And third, the concept of the eternal condemnation seems to undermine the effectiveness of the redeeming word of Christ. If Christ is, in the biblical language, the archpriest who serves everybody, intercedes for everybody, and finally dies for everybody, then how to combine it with the fact that some people are eternally rejected by God based in his sovereign will? Does it not discredit the work of Christ? And finally, It is difficult to accept, according to Schleiermacher, the possibility of final condemnation of part of humanity from a simply psychological perspective. If the redeeming means the conversion of consciousness of a person, according to which the sense of self is absorbed by the God consciousness, then the original egocentrism must be replaced by God's love care for the whole human race. Such was the attitude of Christ, characterized by sympathia for the whole humanity and for every person. Such is also the attitude of the true church, body of Christ, which absorbs the Christ consciousness, taking into consideration the necessary Christian attitude of care for another person. It is difficult to accept the concept of damnation and eternal separation from God of part of humanity, with simultaneous belief in an unending happiness, salvation of another part. The eschatological future exceeds the cognitive horizons of humanity, and it's not easy to speculate about its nature. Schleiermacher is aware of it and indicates directly that it is difficult to relate the present reality to the future surpassing the course of human history. Individual consciousness post-mortem, possibility of conversion after death, symbolism of the final judgment, resurrection of all, return of Christ. These are the matters which are symbolically taught by the scripture, but which interpretation is not clear. Yet, they should affect the understanding of the present existence of human beings, strengthen their God consciousness now, and shape their attitude of care for others now. They should also point to the fundamental matters in God's plan of redemption, Heilsgeschichte, such as God's desire to save all the people, future cleansing of people from the elements of sinfulness which still cling to them, or the hope for perfect community which God, with God in the future. By sketching such a perspective, Schleiermacher expresses his deep hope for the future universal and final restoration of all souls. However, he does not formulate, express his verbis, the concept of... Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Wojciech. Uh, That was Wojciech Szczerba from Evangelical School of Theology in Wrocław and Van Hugel Institute at St. Edmund's College at University of Cambridge. Uh, now we will start with the questions, the questions on site from people who are here with us. No questions? Okay, um, I can see, yes, we have a questions from Anna and we also have some questions on the stream. We will start with, uh, with Anna. Oh, okay, Wojciech, thank, uh, thank you very much for an interesting paper. I have some comments uh, on its um, patristic part. So, uh, Ap- Apokastaza was condemned as, by, by the Second Council of Constantinople as a part of Second or- or- Origianism, which was basically uh, not a uh, 
an, uh, not something uh, invented by Origen himself, but rather uh, by Evagrius Ponticus. Uh, and uh, Evagrius was, uh, let's put it like this, self-proclaimed friend and uh, student of Gregory of Nyssa, Bezer the Great, and Gregory of Nazianzus. So the great Cappadocians. Whether he will indeed was the student or not, it's another question. Uh, there is however a fact that, some facts at least, it's exactly what they are speaking in the review about Gregory of Nyssa. All of Evagrius' quite problematical claims about um, apocastasis of uh, absolute salvation with a loss of self-identity of human in God can be basically found in Gregory of Nyssa. Not in the form of direct statements, but as necessary logical conclusions. So, uh, yeah, it's exactly an example of how close to a uh, heresy Gregory comes, uh, came. So, uh, basically, this is only, uh, the only comment that I had. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, uh, well, yeah, I agree. It's it's a very interesting uh, concept. I think it's very, it's very important, apocatastasis. Uh, I, I agree with, uh, with the uh, connection with the concept uh, with Evagrius Ponticus and uh, Didymus the Blind, uh, and then the later thinkers. And it is, it's been very interesting for me that, well, regardless how many times it has been uh, condemned generally and in various traditions, various churches, it's still the the concept exists and uh, f and I think it is uh, doing quite well in various traditions, uh, both in the, in the Orthodox tradition, in the Catholic tradition, or in Protestant tradition, even in the, in the some kind of conservative radical uh, aspects of uh, uh, yeah, of uh, the branches of uh, even of, of Protestant churches. Uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> typically uh, the, the classical apocatastasis, as I understand it, usually assumes that there is a preservation of uh, uh, identity uh, of a person somehow. But uh, yeah, there, there as, in the, uh, as you say, as logical conclusions in, uh, in Gregor of Nyssa, but also in later thinkers like Eryugena, this notion uh, of uh, return to the perfect context of being, to something what we call the beginning. But what is the beginning or what is the perfect, uh, the, the perfect existence of, uh, of, uh, of rational beings? Is it, uh, let's say, the first stage of creatio? Or rather, is it going back? Is it going to the mind of God somehow, to the idea of God? And some of the, of the thinkers would would say that well, that really apocatastasis means really somehow shrinking or dissolving. It's not the best word. Sorry for that. In 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 the mind of God, going back to the idea of the mind of God. And I think this notion is very interesting and this is very attractive. For the later thinkers, uh, like uh, like Schleiermacher, uh, who in the, in the context of of German Romanticism, and influenced by uh, Spinoza and Herder, somehow have this idea of of uh, of of not really of not really uh, referring to preservation of the uh, self identity or memory or anything like that. Thank you. I think that uh, dissolving is pretty good word because it was used, uh, at least in examples, by Gregory and Evagrius Ponticus when they are speaking about human being dissolved as a uh, as um, cropla of yeah, water, a small part of a drop of water in the sea. See, in, the, you know, in this case, it's uh, clearly God. So, yes, it is dissolving in God, and in this on that matter, but it is dissolving. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we, we have some questions more. Um, Daniel Spencer, one of our participants, sent me two questions. Uh, basically, actually, one question in two parts. So, I will read it 
to you now, uh, Wojciech. In your view, is there adequate biblical warrant for the idea of restoration of the original unity, perfection of creation? Uh, and the other part is, is there not a case to be made that the biblical view points instead to, to a new creation that far surpasses the original integrity of Eden? Schleiermacher's view here is very near to Taoism. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the question. Let me refer to this uh, first part of the question. The, the biblical uh, evidence or warrant for the, rest of, for the restoration. Uh, well, it's a, uh, the answer might be complicated. Uh, well, the, well, let's say the philosophical answer, it depends. Depends how you uh, how you interpret uh, the Bible, and uh, the Bible is quite a complicated uh, collection of uh, of of scriptures that has been uh, put into a canon in uh, somewhere uh, finally uh, between uh, fourth and the fifth century, uh, with some reduction. Uh, uh, earlier on, which we can see as when we read the Old Testament or the New Testament, uh, you know, the, uh, let's say the example, the letters to Corinthians. When we read the second Corinthian, it's quite obvious that there was something in between and read, and the second might be some kind of collection of, uh, of two letters, like, or the Gospel of John, the beginning and the end of Gospel of John, it seems like the reduction uh, or the editors, uh, some kind of addition. So it, it depends how you understand and how you interpret uh, the Bible. And I think the basic hermeneutical rule is that the difficult uh, aspects of the teaching of the Bible should be understood in the light of the easy uh, or the uh, obvious uh, teaching or chapters or uh, aspects of the Bible. Well, the question is which are difficult and which are the easy, the easy ones. Uh, and, and there are various traditions, and uh, when one tradition would, uh, when, it, when it comes to eschatology or soteriology, one would uh, claim or defend the limited scope of salvation. And this tradition would say the easier or the basic formulas and the biblical formulas are the ones that say that that claim that there that there is going to be a, con a condemnation. So these are the chapters that are talking about Gehenna and hell and the second death and uh, all this uh, apocalyptical language that is understood, let's say, more or less literally. And from this perspective. Uh, the aspects of the Bible which say or which teach the universal salvation or possibility of universal salvation may be understood as some kind of general will of God or potential will of God, whereas the, uh, the, the actual will of God is somehow uh, is, coincides with the fact that some people reject God. So this would be one perspective. The other perspective would uh, would claim or would say that the easy, the basic, the, fun, the foundational uh, teaching of the Bible is the one that uh, speaks about the possibility of universal salvation. So from this perspective, the chapters that are, or the aspects that, that, that seem to be teaching the limited scope of salvation can be seen as some kind of warning, as some kind of pedagogical type of uh, teaching or pre-Pascal, uh, uh, pre-Passion uh, yeah, type of uh, uh, teachings, but they do not, finally, they will, they will not uh, be fulfilled in a literal, in a literal way. They should be rather understood as some kind of hyperbole. And yes, there are some aspects and some teachings of, in the Bible that, uh, that uh, um, well, su suggest the unlimited or universal scope of salvation. First of all, I would say that the whole idea of return is not new to the Bible. 
So, for instance, the, uh, John the Baptist is seen as the Elijah coming back figuratively, or Christ might be seen the new Moses or the second Adam. Or uh, when we read the language of the Apocalypse describing the new earth and new heaven, we see that there is reference to the metaphors or the language of the first chapters of the Bible. So there is some kind of refer- reference uh, at the end of the Bible to the beginning of the, to the, uh, to the Bible. Okay, so the, the whole idea of return, which is somehow uh, innate in the whole concept of apocatast- apocatastasis, is there. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, there are some particular teachings that may refer to this idea of, uh, of uh, universal salvation. For instance, uh, the simple teaching, yeah, the, 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 the chapter that I referred already in the second uh, letter to Corinthians 15, which says that everything will be subject, subjugated to God, and finally death will be subjugated to God together with Christ, and at the end, God will be all in all, meaning that everything will be somehow culminated in God. So this would be one thing. The other, uh, this chapter is referring to the will of God, like in uh, the first uh, Timothy, second chapter, saying that God wants to save all the people. Similar, uh, similar uh, teaching we can find in the first letter to Peter. And also in Peter, in the third chapter, I think we can find this uh, reference of Christ going to Sheol and uh, proclaiming the gospel uh, to the spirits there. And the early uh, church tradition, like the gospel of Nicodemus, uh, well, well, points that uh, Christ effectively uh, proclaims the gospel so the show or the hell really become, is empty. Or there is reference to, the, to Christ uh, as the second Adam. So like with the first Adam, uh, the whole uh, the condemnation came to the whole uh, humanity or human race. With the second Adam, mean, meaning Christ, with his work of salvation, similarly, the salvation is somehow given to the whole human race, or something like this. So I think, yes, we can find references in the Bible. There are more of them, but this might be, you know, some of the more uh, more obvious ones. And uh, personally, I don't think that the Bible teaches about a new world or something like this. I think the teaching of the, of the Bible, especially the Apocalypse, is, um, well, is or the eschatological teaching, is, refers to this earthly reality. So, yes, it might be different, it might be, um, well, the, the, there might be no death, no evil, nothing like that, but still the Bible is speaking about the, the earth uh, in, the, in terms of eschatology, just like in the case of protology. The Eden is also on the earth. We may agree, we may not agree, we may, tra- we may interpret it figuratively, but I think the Bible is really talking about this earthly reality. Okay, I think Daniel is happy with the answer. He also sends his greetings and he encourages you to enjoy his talk later in the afternoon session. We have uh, three questions more in the stream, but I see also Martin wants to ask something. Martin? Yeah, I was thinking also about uh, the patristic parallels. You know, in on the one hand, in Maximus Confessor, and actually already in launches of, of Jerusalem. On the other hand, in Augustine, you have a phenomenology of human will in which you discuss, uh, in which you see, you describe human choices. And those human choices can go either by us following the natural order of priorities, I, I have an object, I choose it, I follow it, or can work as in Christ. And this is very important, especially in, as I could see in launches of Jerusalem and in Maximus. And in Christ, human will becomes quiet and just follows in faith the will of Christ. So human 
a saved human is truly made son of God or adopted son of God. It's like Hiotheosis because in him, like in Christ, or in her, like in Christ, human will stops looking itself for objects, stops making choices, but simply agrees quietly with will of God. And salvation is first and foremost of this inner salvation. Purification is first and foremost of this inner purification. Can you speak about universal salvation if you analyze human will and relationship of human to Christ in these terms? I'm trying to unmute myself, but it's not easy. <clears throat> I cannot answer because I cannot unmute myself. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> I like the question. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, mm, well, <clears throat> let me let me refer to Schleiermacher. Okay, this the 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 answer might be different when we are talking about the uh, church fathers and when we are talking about Schleiermacher. And uh, uh, Schleiermacher, when he is composing his uh, his treatises in the 18th century uh, and the beginning of the uh, 19th century, well, he reads Spinoza, and <coughs> Spinoza and his uh, his his thought system is really I wouldn't say pantheistic, I would say monistic. It's really monistic, but. Schleiermacher reads Spinoza through the eyes of Herder, uh, you know, the German thinker who is somehow Christianizing uh, Spinoza's, uh, Spinoza's monism. So, so still it, it is monistic, but it is, uh, <coughs> it, it, is, uh, it is more, it is closer to I should say, a Protestant uh, orthodoxy of the 18th and 19th century. And <clears throat> so this would be one aspect, and I would refer to your, to your question uh, in, in a minute. The other aspect is that, well, uh, Schleiermacher uh, discusses uh, uh, many things with Kant, Immanuel Kant. But he agrees that we cannot reach the things in themselves. We cannot know noumena, we can only see phenomena. So we can, we talk about reality that is here, that, uh, that uh, in reality in which we see, but we don't really know how, you know, this whole metaphysical aspects of it uh, uh, looks like. We have no idea, really. So, <coughs> and... Uh, from so uh, so this would be the second uh, second factor that is really important and the third factor that is really important is that Schleiermacher is reformed theologian reformed thinker which means that he is calvinistic which means that the sovereignty of god is a, a huge uh, thing for him is a, is a really his point of reference when he is talking about god and this is his upbringing in the pietistic context, and this is his studying in uh, in Halle and earlier in uh, in uh, in other schools. But <clears throat> it is really God that is the owner of reality, and God creates everything, everything for him. So even you now the the will of God is created by God. The faith is created by God. Human beings cannot produce them by themselves. Or even sin or rather sinfulness is also created by God. God is some kind of the author of the, of the sinfulness uh, somehow, which would be, uh, I think, uh, coherent with a, let's say, panentheistic attitude to reality. Everything is happening in God. So I would say that apocatastasis, from this perspective, from this philosophical perspective, is the fact. It is happening right now. So it is realized as catology. We don't have to. We don't have to wait for you know the future or anything like this. It is. There is no other option. 
because everything is already in God, everything is already, let's say, safe. But these are metaphors. And in our phenomenological language and in our perceiving of reality, we see ourselves as free human beings, as human beings making choices, as, you know, just, uh, well, going this or that way. And this might be our common, uh, common understanding of reality. However, again, when we look at it from a more theological perspective, and for him this would be reformed, theology, he would say, now, now everything, really everything, is worked out by God. So God is the owner of reality and the director of reality. And now going back to the, to the church fathers, I don't think that it is very far from f- some aspects of, again, Gregory of Nyssa. I think that, that there is this idea of in, in, in Nyssa's thinking of the East, for instance, going to of the metaphor of the East, that, uh, well, you have the East that, that, that let's say, that, that incarnate, where he, when he refers to incarnation uh, of, uh, of Christ, he somehow refers to this divinity of Christ merging with humanity of Christ. And this is the moment when everything is somehow saved because this, this East of divinity somehow changes. Uh, the whole human race. So again, from uh, uh, from from this perspective, we may say yes. Phenomenologically speaking, we may talk about uh, our will and our choices uh, and uh, this kind of things. But from the other on the other hand, we may just refer to God who works out everything. This would be my reference, and I see Anna Zirkova, who will, I'm, I'm sure she will refer to my comment. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, as to your comment about uh, Gregory of Nyssa speaking of Christology, uh, we shouldn't forget about one thing. When the Cappadocians uh, try to make any Christological claims, it was way before crystal, uh, the hardcore Christological controversies. So they had, uh, they didn't need to uh, to feed some uh, doctrinal uh, limits. It's not limits, okay? It's not limits. It's some uh, doctrines because those doctrines were not formulated yet. But if you see their claims true. Later councils again, it's on the border on the border of orthodoxy somehow, and it's on its way to uh, metaphysicism. Let's uh, let's put it like this. But I'm not going to accuse them. They had all rights to make mistakes because the doctrine wasn't formulated yet. And even after proclamation of Chalcedon II and, uh, and of, uh, I'm sorry, Chalcedon and Constantinople II, uh, there still wasn't, uh, to say the truth, uh, teaching. There are just some things that were rejected. That's it. But, but let me return to the Constantinople II. Apocastasis was condemned and forced seven councils as are accepted as, as truly ecumenical by all of the main denomination, Christian denominations. And you cannot treat it as so freely. Obviously, as I said it in the beginning, they're not in the beginning of my first comment, uh, Apocastasis was condemned by Constantinople II as a part of second Regianism, Vagrianism, to say the truth, no matter how much somebody wants to whitewash Evagrius himself in the Nova days. Uh, but what, what was the main point of the uh, Regianism? You remember your comment about theology being outcome of philosophy, and philosophy makes theology. Or the second originism was exactly this. It was the outcome of philosophy. It first thing, the second thing, it proclaimed Christ to be just an only creature. 
the first, the perfect, but just an only creature. All other things follow from that. And apocastasis is a part of the, uh, this kind of thinking. Um, I know about freedom in philosophy, but and I understand Schleiermacher, and I am being born in the East, I'm kind of inclined to go forward. At least I hope for uh, for apocastasis, not apocastasis itself, but that there is a hope, like it's in Dostoevsky, for instance, you know. But still, you cannot easily forget about the, fa the fact of condemnation. That's it. Thank you very much. I love it. I love it. And I think, I really, I really think we can talk about apocatastasis in terms of doctrine. And yeah, I agree, it's dangerous. Or we can talk about hope. And then I would say, yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, I would also say that, well, both or many other thinkers or theologians like uh, Origen or Gregory of Nyssa or Ed Eugena or the others that you referred to, uh, to, or I would say also Schleiermacher, they are very bold thinkers. And Schleiermacher, especially you know, the, you know, uh, the Protestant, he's a free mind, really. I mean, he's really trying to find himself between Enlightenment and Romanticism and uh, Protestant uh, Lutheranism and Protestant Reformed theology and then some pietistic thinking. And then he's really, he's really bold. In the, he's not afraid to uh, to give uh, some idea or propose some ideas that are that would that would say, that we would say they are unorthodox. And well, this is what he says about doctrines. That well, he says that the essence of religion is esoteric. Uh, and we cannot really describe it. So our doctrines are some kind of approximations. We are trying to do our best to uh, to to say, to, to describe, to predicate about about religion. But it's not the perfect language. And from this perspective, he says that heresy might be equally important as the right doctrine. And quite often, heresy is where well, is. <laughs> is posteriori uh, defined as uh, as heresy but really um, theology lives in some kind of dialectical way and uh, uh, theologian cannot be afraid to formulate or thinker cannot be cannot be afraid to formulate uh, ideas, even if they are risky, and certainly Schleiermacher is not a, is not afraid. Or I would say differently, as a young Schleiermacher is not afraid of all, uh, at all. He's I mean he really formulates ideas freely, but then he gets older and he well he uh, he uh, builds his career. So in the beginning he is just. Uh, uh, you know, the beginner uh, theologian or thinker. But then he cooperates with Humboldt. He's one of the major politicians, diplomat, and he's a rector of the old university. So in his later treatises, we see that trying to correct himself and his language becomes a little bit more orthodox. So for instance, when we compare the, third, the second and the third edition of the speeches, we see that he is trying to remove some of the ideas that might be seen as uh, linking him to Spinoza or linking him to Immanuel Kant, which was who was not that popular popular later on. But still, some of this boldness of Schleiermacher remains, and I think this might be one of the, well, characteristic of this uh, Protestant free thinking leading to a very liberal Theology and and actually Schleiermacher influenced the later really radical theologians like Harnack or Ritchel, uh, or even Karl Barth, who is a neo orthodox theologian. I absolutely agree with what you have, with what you said about heresy. In my opinion, it is necessary necessary element for healthy developed theological doctrine. If there are no heresies, there is no development what we see nowadays. And this boldness 
is nothing more or less but an evidence but an evidence that a thinker had strong faith in what he said and in, in, in what he believed so and we are lacking such thinkers right now unfortunately thank you yeah. Yeah, thank you. And again, I love it. And I, I and I agree. When we, it's it's not easy to find a really nice heresy nowadays. So when we find it, we should really treat it with care. We should love it. We should <laughs> okay, take we should take care of it because it's it's not an easy thing today. Uh, in some paper I wrote, what, uh, the, I'm looking for the, my enemy. I'm looking for the heresy. Come to me. I need you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, but I there think, is none. Yeah, I think Martin. I think Martin might be your Heresia. Um, okay. Uh, to an extent. Can, can, next, uh, can, can we move to the next question, please? Uh, we received few, three or four. I think the one was already answered. It was following. Was an apocostasis one of the heresies in the first ages of Christianity? For it hits in the idea of the free will. Um. So I guess you already answered it, didn't you? Okay, and the other question is uh, from the stream. If I understood you correctly, you said that Christianity is one of the form of the religious ways of seeking God. The end of quotation. So the revelation of Christ is contingent, not essential, and all Judaism and Christianity is relative because of its historical and cultural circumstances. I think it's, is that clear to you? Is this, is this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for this question. I, well, yeah, I refer to the thought of Friedrich Schleiermacher and this is how he understands it. Uh, he, he thinks that the essence of religion is the, is the feeling, is the experience of the, of the universe, of the total dependence of the, of the universe. And this feeling that is, intuitive and cannot be properly described is somehow put into the language of doctrines or traditions. And yes, Christianity is uh, just one, or uh, he would say Christianity is a cluster of traditions, and there are some differences within Christianity. So, yeah, there are other religions, and other religions also refer uh, refer experience that is universal. And uh, more than that, he would differentiate between personal spirituality or personal piety, personal real religion, and historical type of religions. And he would also say, well, this is how we refer to this experience, to this feeling, the feel or the intuition, unshown that we that we have, that, that is really the core of our religion. But, but speaking about religions, he somehow makes a gradation, gradation of this religion, some kind of hierarchy. So he says, well, when we are thinking of the development of humanity, human race, we may say that the, the lower, the lowest are the animistic religions, then there are, are plural, pluralistic religions, and then there are uh, monotheistic religions. Out of them, Christianity is the highest. So he himself, being a Christian, believes that Christianity is the highest form of the religion or the historical religion. Uh, he doesn't refer to other religions except of Judaism, and I don't think that he knows other religions well. Uh, even when he refers to Judaism, he somehow thinks that Christianity is a form, not really of continuation, but some kind of development of his thinking. And when he's talking about a major hermeneutical idea of Judaism, he refers to revenge or the lex talionis. And when he's talking about Christianity, he, th he says that the core of Christianity, the, the basic formula, the intuition of Christianity is God's love. And this is for him the highest form of um, description of this religious uh, experience. And then definitely he says that, yes, the religious will pass away. And... Uh, He's very optimistic in his thinking. This might be, you know, this uh, romantic, romantic um, thinking, uh, romantic optimism that he believes that that 
really all the nations will become Christians. And this is what he says in his, in his experience, really Christianity growing from one person or 12 apostles into, you know, the whole Western world being Christian. So he believes that the whole world becomes Christians finally. But then he also says that Christianity also has its limits. So it will pass away, but it will pass away in a kind of eschatological terms. Christianity will get mature and will understand that the mediators between human beings or humanity and and God or universe, divine deity, are not necessary. And this will be the moment where Christianity also will pass away and God will be all in all, as he refers to uh, 2 Corinthians 15. Okay, Okay. thank you. Um, Basically, we have run out of time, but the, the, the keynote lecture is cancelled. I will talk about it later, so we can have a few minutes more. I received one question after what Anna said, so I will, I will read it now. I think it sheds some light. Uh, aren't we, according to the Bernard from, from Clairvaux and Apostolic Letters, living between two comps of Christ, the one that happened 2,000 years ago, and Parousia? And there is a third common of Christ in meantime. Assuming the first two, we live between the first and the second, but we know that Christ is the same today and ever. Therefore, the beginning at the end is the same, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's Anna who should answer that. Uh, can you show me yet again? The, uh, can you pass the comment here? on chat. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. I, I, I'm sending it. Okay. Nothing. Can you read it again? Okay. Um, now, now you should see it. Ah. Uh-huh. You see, this is quite a difficult question because uh, with same logic applied, they can say that nothing, uh, nothing is changed, and they are coming to God. So they are they have they will have clearly circle idea of the, of uh, theory of time and of theory of, uh, of creation which uh, is found for instance in stoics and in the epicurean school in uh, pretty not uh, pretty much all but in the huge part of ancient and philosophical thinking about the world and creation part so what is the difference you see the fourth and the second parousia are different in its theological and and, uh, ontological essence. You may think even about not the fourth and the second. uh, If you think about creation as being uh, as creation through Christ and as uh, and uh, Adam as uh, to an extent uh, an image of Christ. Christ is the true first Adam. Uh, you have three parousias. The first one is a creation of world. The, the second one is a salvation of world. Uh, in the meaning of Christ give, uh, giving himself for our sins. And the third one is a theosis. It is deification. That we are achieving the unity with God. So the beginning and the end is not necessarily the same. At the beginning, we have God and his creation, which is totally different ontologically, with this huge gap between them. At the end, we have God, who, to, who will take his creation up to him, and who, through uh, grace, through Christ, 
through salvation which was done by Christ, who elevates humanity and the entire world to be his true sons, to be his true children. And he will elevate them to be on the image of God, on true image of God, and to be deified. So, from the point of view of God, there is no real difference. From the point of view of a creation, we have a huge road of being nothing, of being made out of nothing, to becoming deified. So, if there is difference, it's difference, the difference is for us. This is what comes to my mind right now. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. Would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I'm so glad Anna is here. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that this uh, German theologian, uh, Jürgen Moltmann, he refers to this process that Anna described. And he refers to uh, uh, Imago Dei as a first stage, then Imago Christi as this whole process of Heilsgeschichte or the uh, history of salvation, and then Gloria Dei. And the Gloria Dei would be the final stage. So this, uh, this shows some kind of progression. And I think, yes, in the classical cultures, and especially when we were talking about this cosmic apocatastasis, like Stoics, and Anna referred to it, we may talk about this, the, same, the same idea. But then when we are referring to apocatastasis that is personal, or refers to soul, or, yeah, or, or, or anthropological, human, some kind of apocatastasis, we're, we're probably talking more about actualization or some kind of theological aspect of apocatastasis. So, so there is some kind of return to the moment when there is no death, no evil, there is a perfect community between um, rational beings or human beings and God. But yes, there is a development in the, on, on the way. And we can see it in the, uh, in the process of origin, when he's asking, when he's answering the question why uh, the rational uh, creations will not fall again. And he says, well, they will learn in the process of, of existing. Uh, they will learn about God's love, their nature, and uh, this kind of things. And... Uh, yeah, and uh, um, so uh, yeah, and and then we also see it in some kind of anthropology of Irenaeus that is adopted by Schleiermacher, that uh, really the human uh, that that human beings, rational beings, they have to learn, and it's not only the the human beings that have to learn, but the whole system needs to learn to achieve the final stage of. Apocatastasis, which is again theology, teleological. Sorry for that. Okay. Um, and finally, <laughs> we need to we need to finish. Thank you very much, Wojciech. Thank uh, thanks for all the questions from the participants on Webex and from the people watching us on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, we need to finish. Um, we should finish. 30 minutes ago, but our next uh, lecture, keynote lecture given by Bertolt Paul from Theologische Fakultat Paderborn, uh, titled Viatory, Viatory Existence, Foundation of a Philosophy of Hope with Joseph Pieper, is cancelled because uh, Bertolt's flight was cancelled due to COVID, so we will have a longer break and we meet each other at 3 o'clock on the afternoon uh on this session seven and eight in separate rooms so now we'll have a lunch break i wish you to have a good lunch and we will meet again at three o'clock thank you Będziemy robili...
Nie wyłączyłem ekranu. Ja mogę sobie funkcję zjeść. Może się zjeść. Powiedz mi, jak będę potrzebny przed pracowaniem. Dobra. Nie, no śmiało, idź, idź, pewnie. W sensie teraz.
Hello, everyone. Um, I think we, we can start in five, seven minutes. Uh, we just need to make sure everyone is here in the, in the right room and whether are we audible and visible on the streams. So please give us five minutes more. Thanks. Uh, hi everyone, just two, three minutes more. Hi Jim, good to see you. I, I see Tony. Tony, are you with us here? Can you hear me? Tony Abuka? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you very well. Thanks. And I'm happy to be here. Good. And... Okay, and Anthony, Anthony Ebuka. We have two Anthonys now. Uh, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Anthony Ebuka, can you hear me? Uh, or I can't see you. I can't hear you. Oh, hello, Sylvia. Okay. Um, we will wait three minutes more for Daniel Spencer and uh, Balin Bekefi. Uh, they have joined us already, so they won't, there won't be technical issues, I suppose. Two minutes more, please. Thanks, Emilio. Hi. 
Good to see you. Can you see me now? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. You? Good. Good. Anthony, before we start... I'm good. Before we start, can I, can I ask you something? Because I have some troubles with, okay. with spelling your name pro properly. C could you please instruct me? Is it... Okay. Is it Chukwebuka? Chukwebuka or Hegusi? Chukwebuka or Hegwuzi? Yeah, my, 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 middle name, my middle name is Chukwebuka, then my last name is Ohegusi. Okay, I'm sorry for this. I just wanted to make sure if I spell it correctly yeah. before we start. Thanks. Yeah, Chukwebuka, you can try it. You can try it. I will. <laughs> Lovely, cheers. And we will wait one minute more for Daniel. Um, he's on the way, I guess. Daniel, yes, I can see you. Fantastic. And Balint, Balint Tepefi, he will join us in the meantime. Uh, so I think we can kick off with the with the session. Uh, one technical request, kindly reminder: please mute yourself when not asking the questions. When you want to ask, unmute yourself, ask the question, and mute yourself again. Sorry for keeping repeating this, but if we have some, if we if we have two microphones, we have eco effect. So uh, so it's for all of us and for people who are watching us on YouTube. Okay, we'll start with the session number seven of the Christian Philosophy, it's past, present, and future, held here in Krakow at Jesuit University Ignatianum, remotely at Galaxy Hotel due to COVID. Uh, welcome. We're going to have four speakers on this session and four speakers on this session in the next room. Uh, first speak will be given by Anthony Chukwebuka Ohigwuzi from Catholic University of Lublin, uh, and Tony um, will give a talk on religion and counterterrorism and the lessons from Christian philosophy of nonviolence. Um, so I will display Tony's lecture now. Please uh, keep all the questions in your minds and you will be free to ask them after having the lecture displayed. Good day. My name is Father Anthony Ohebusi. I am a student of John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin. The title of my presentation is Religion and Counterterrorism: Any Lessons from Christian Philosophy of Nonviolence. This essay attempts to critically analyze the theory and practice of Christian nonviolence in the light of contemporary challenges of counterterrorism. The relationship between religion and terrorism has been a complex one. It is true that too often in the history of religion, people have killed in the name of God of life, waged war in the name of God of peace, hated in the name of God of love, and practiced cruelty in the name of God of compassion. Although most religious people would readily deny that their own religions have violent tendencies and so do not indulge in violence of any form, Historical accounts have contrary opinions. Only the most unreflective believer will fail to be troubled by the bloodiness of portraits of Hindu violence perpetrated by Hindu extremists and the revolutionary campaign of Buddhist monks who masterminded killings of non-believers in the streets of Myanmar. Of course, the bloody images of religious terrorism reflected in the pictures of Jewish terrorists blowing up mosques and Islamic terrorists carrying out organized suicide missions like the 9-11 attack. Christianity, with its principle of love, 
is not exempt from this tale of terror because Christian history has also been soaked in bloody narratives. Think about the Crusades, the Inquisition, wars of religion, and some other isolated acts of deadly violence committed in the name of the Christian faith. There is even a just war principle to manage the act of war. Pope St. John Paul II, in the wake of the new millennium, apologized for Christianity's past violent actions. This singular act of courage by the Holy Father summarizes Christianity's readiness to take responsibility for its violent past and her determination to take a stand against violence of any form by re-emphasizing the non-violent principles that are fundamental to her meaning and mission, religion and counter-terrorism. The war on terror has been a major concern in the 21st century. Counter-terrorism requires a good understanding of the mechanisms necessary for an effective and legitimate response to terrorism. Interestingly, there is an implicit understanding which shows that to stop terrorism, you must know why it happens and how it operates. From this understanding, no one would deny that religion has a role to play in religiously motivated terrorism. There are two unique approaches to the counter-terrorism response, the soft approach and the hard approach. The hard approach is based on the proactive and reactive military measures aimed at deterring and countering terrorist plans and actions. This approach is usually the task of states or states to surrogates. It begins with a proper and viable intelligence and also involves deterrence, which is the direct use of threats and inducements to prevent enemy action. But these military responses are not enough for tackling terrorism. Hence, it is necessary to accompany them with the soft approach. The soft approach focuses on the underlying social circumstances and the motivations that drive the ideologies of terrorist groups. For religious terrorists, there is always a religious narrative which persuasively motivates violent ideologies. ISIS, for instance, uses religious narratives and deploys psychosocial strategies. Hence, the soft approach begins with a counter narrative that drives a better idea that is appealing to terrorists more than their motivating ideologies. Since deradicalization begins with effective communication, counter-terrorism narratives are expected to have some persuasive religious characteristics. This is why religion remains a viable, valuable tool for counter-terrorism. It changes the narrative with a more persuasive and superior content that prescribes that religion should command virtues and not violence. By realizing this ideological change, religion has used its social and prophetic role to impact on the socioeconomic development of deprived people. Through its missionary activities and charities, religion has provided social services like good education, healthcare, basic amenities, and other social benefits for impoverished communities. Religion has also challenged governments to rise to the responsibility of improving the social conditions of the people. This is typical of Christian religion, especially in mission territories like Africa, where missionaries were involved in the suppression of slavery and the slave trade, and the modernization of African societies through education. This soft approach to counter-terrorism is very delicate and complex, yet it is still the most effective means of tackling terrorism. This is because military conquests of terrorism alone cannot bring lasting solution to the scourge of terrorism without dialogue. There are no silver bullets or quick fixes available. Christian philosophical grounds for non-violence. The call for non-violent resistance is the best plausible and potent countermeasure against violent confrontations. Non-violence can be regarded as an original position of human social order. In other words, man fundamentally lives and relates with others in a non-violent way. When in a state of rest or inaction, he does not act violently, so he strives to act and relate in a way that would reflect and maintain this nonviolent original position, even in the face of disagreements. 
This forms the basis of the moral norm of human action in contrast to the Hobbesian brutish state of nature. Although Thomas Hobbes argues that human nature is violent and chaotic, it is not arguable that this chaos is a product of dynamic relational disagreements. No man wakes up to fight from nowhere. It follows that without a pre-existing non-violent original position, it would be counterintuitive for Hobbes to speak of a social contract that creates a new order. What so social contract does, therefore, is to return man's actions to its fundamental metaphysical unity instead of creating a new order. Since violence is a practical consequence of a preceding disruption of each man's original state of nonviolence, it follows that if violence is a practical problem, nonviolence should provide a practical solution. If violence depersonalizes, nonviolence should embody and validate the personal value. Religion's involvement in ensuring nonviolence should be integral and active. Empathy alone is not enough to explain the decline in violence. Rather, the fundamental variable that supports nonviolence is the recognition that there is a universal human nature. This is the idea behind the golden rule and its equivalence, which provides a common philosophical ground for nonviolence among religious traditions. It is a basic moral maxim common to all religions to the extent that it provides a generally shared principle, a fundamental point of moral convergence and the lowest common denominator of the nonviolent character of religious traditions. It stems from the basic asiological truth about man that everyone wants to be treated with dignity. With the maxim which says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, it recommends an ethic of physiological reciprocity, whereby every individual expects to be treated not as an object, but as a value in itself, and so bears the moral duty of extending this as a moral treatment to others. The golden rule is a maxim of altruistic reciprocity that is common to all religious traditions and can be found in their sacred writings. In Judaism, the golden rule is found in the Torah, the Hebrew Bible presents it in this form. Do not take revenge on anyone or continue to hurt him, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. The golden rule in the Jewish tradition stems from the fundamental recognition of man as image of God with dignity from creation. Christian tradition provides a more comprehensive reflection of the golden rule. In line with the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament also speaks of the golden rule in the books of Tobit and Sirach, Tors. Never do to anyone else anything that you would not want someone to do to you. Treat them the way you want to be treated. The New Testament presents a more detailed version of this principle as foundational to the doctrine of love. Jesus re-echoed the golden rule in most of his teachings that extolled love, peace, and nonviolence. The golden rule reflects in his life and teachings as he explicitly condemns violence and retaliation. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes the golden rule a point of reference. That is why the Christian gospel and the entire New Testament morality are summed up in the famous commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Loving neighbor as one loves self presupposes the common dignity of humanity. According to Karu Wojtyla, all men are neighbors by virtue of their personal being. The authentic participation of living together in community presupposes a genuine sharing in the humanness of the other. The concept of neighbor, in other words, expresses the fundamental unity and nearness of all men. All other human relations have their root in the fact that all men are neighbors. Jesus expressed this nearness and common dignity in his parables, especially of the Good Samaritan who saved the life of a stranger because he recognizes him as neighbor. Christian morality therefore finds its basis in the recognition of this unity and common dignity of all men, which is essentially nonviolent. It draws from the Old Testament concept of man as image of God as basis for this universal dignity of all humans. That is why the New Testament extends this love of neighbor to enemies, even when they persecute. 
to show that nonviolence reveals the basis of the normal norm, which is the universality of human, human dignity. For instance, when Pope John Paul II forgave the man who shot him, Ale Akka, he reflected the New Testament instructions to love your enemies and do good to those who hate you, for God is good even to the wicked. This emphasizes the centrality of human dignity in every moral consideration, in contrast to the often misconstrued Old Testament tit for that morality that encourages vengeance and perpetuates the cycle of violence. The New Testament morality, therefore, maintains the fundamental moral norm by affirming the person for his own sake rather than despersonalizing him as a result of lived experience of harm and injustice. This is what Wojtyla calls the personalistic norm, the norm of love. This New Testament morality is driven by a personalistic norm that is fundamentally non-violent and commands believers to overcome evil with good. Thus, biblical monotheism cannot be the source of religious violence because it recognizes the enemy as neighbor. As a philosophical basis for non-violence, the golden rule does not deter one from violence for arbitrary reasons or for the sake of convenience. It goes to the roots of recognition of personal dignity, which is common to all humans and sacrosanct to all religions. Christian morality of nonviolence provides a more practical basis and standard for the other religions' traditions to, in the task of combating terrorism. Its bitter experience of violence has helped it to promote nonviolence over the years. Thus, Western society's acceptance of religious freedom as innate human right and religious tolerance as basic duty was finally realized after centuries of intolerance and violence through the instrumentality of this non-violent moral stance. Little wonder most proponents of non-violence are also advocates of human rights and values who use good to conquer evil. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., Nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon, which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wields well it. It is a sword that heals. Nonviolence is not just about refraining from violence, but about actively promoting values that discourage harm and violence, even in the face of oppression. It is a viable weapon for religions against the dangers of violence. Religious leaders are therefore expected to use their positions of influence to lead people to the recognition of the personalistic norm, which is antithetical to terrorist ideologies. Because we cannot break the cycle of violence in religion until we challenge the sanctification of violence in our sacred texts. Christian nonviolence brings authentic moral liberation to the oppressive systems that breed hate and violence. This form of nonviolent option promotes personalistic values among religious traditions and believers. Some of these qualities manifest when believers express tolerance, love, and compassion. It brings believers to a better interpretation and understanding of the sacred texts in order to give more spiritually positive interpretations to the violent stories. Christian exegesis has provided better interpretation of the hard texts of the scriptures in a way that discourages fundamentalism. In the same vein, Muslims must interpret jihad to mean a spiritual discipline necessary to follow God's path rather than a physical battle against infidels. Tolerance and respect are extolled because human dignity is treasured above every other doctrine. We must therefore acknowledge that the impact of the Christian philosophy in the development and promotion of individual rights and dignity reveals the need to rediscover the centrality of personalism in every religious experience, which provides a viable non-violent ideological remedy to the threat of contempt. Thank you very much. That was Anthony Chukwebuka Ohegvuzi from Catholic University of Lublin. And now we will have some questions. I can see we have questions on site. Uh, could you please come here to show yourself? Make yourself audible. Uh, yes, please. Albo ojcze, ja będę cię, ja będę cię odmutowywał, dobra? To zróbmy to. Go on. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Father Antonet, can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, I'm very much in line of what you have said. But let me raise a sort of complex uh, question. I would like to start my question with the quotation of famous political philosopher John Rawls. He wrote that it never happened in human history that two liberal states were in war against each other. And this is his thesis that the white liberal culture is the presumption of the law of people which guarantees tolerance and peace. And for him, the first presumption is the liberal culture, and the second presumption are the comprehensive doctrines, which might be uh, philosophical, moral, and religious. Among them is, of course, Christianity. But this is like the second level of this factors which guarantee uh, peaceful relationships among the nations. And uh, in your presentation, it seems to be opposite, that the Christianity seems to be the leading, the main presumption, and maybe the other social factors are supporting. Uh, I would like to, to hear your comments uh, uh, to that. Can you hear me? That's a good question, actually. Uh, uh, liberalism in John Rawls actually is somewhat an attack to every form of conservatism or every form of uh, uh, belief that has something higher than the principle of freedom, total freedom. Yeah. But I will respond to John Ross's view uh, in three, three ways, three points. First of all, I will say that his analysis or analogy that uh, uh, there has never been a time when two liberal states are at war with each other, I will say is hypocritical. Why? Liberal states, most of the wars that has been fought in 20th century, even in the 21st century, are led by liberal states even if it is against a liberal state. And some of those wars we have fought on certain grounds that make no meaning. They shouldn't go to those wars. The war in Iraq was a sham. So how can he prove that liberal states are better or liberalism should be the standard for nonviolence when liberal states are forcing themselves, using the using a coercive force against states that actually they don't understand their philosophies. You can only understand another person's philosophy by sitting down with the person. That's why I said that there are two approaches in counter-terrorism, the soft and the hard approach. These liberal states have always resorted to the hard approach because they wanted to impose their own ideologies on these groups. So we cannot get someone to the uh, round table to discuss if we cannot give that person a, a listening ear. So that argument is counterintuitive. Then secondly, I'll use the principle of personalism. Why? I believe that uh, uh, the simplest basis of the moral life begins with us knowing, coming to the realization that benevolence should flow from us and should expect benevolence in return. If you are not ready to give out good, then you shouldn't be ready to receive good. So it is an act of greed for someone to be always ready to receive, but not always ready to give out the good. And so personalism calls us to the recognition of this metaphysical unity that all humans are the same, in spite of what we believe. First of all, we have to live in order to believe. You have to say, I am, before you say, credo, I believe. So, our recognition of this fundamental unity and our recognition of this fundamental basis of our 
being as humans is the beginning of our faith. Whether we are Christians, whether we are Hindus, whether we are even atheists, what unites us together is that we are humans. And that is recognizing the personality in the other. We belong to this community of persons. And insofar as we belong to this community of persons, invariably, there is no need appealing to other ideologies that these are the reasons, these are the frontliners of our being nonviolent. So liberal states are, are not nonviolent. We, we experience we teach us that. I don't know if I responded to your questions. Although, may I say? Uh, okay, I got, uh, I got your point. So concluding uh, this soft approach of non-violence from your standing point should be more philosophical or more religious, this personalism in uh, keeping the vocabulary, addressing other uh, cultures, other religions. Would you stress first philosophical presumption or strictly religious presumption based on the Bible? I don't know why you are differentiating philosophy from religion, lest we are not supposed to be having this conference. This is a Christian a, a, a conference on Christian philosophy. So we cannot in any way dissociate our own philosophy, no matter what it is, lest our religion will make no sense. So for our religion to have sense, to have meaning, to have reason, it should be accompanied by the basis of philosophy. So coming to say whether it is philosophy that comes before religion, I, I don't dissociate it. That's why I used the golden rule and used the imago Deo. The concept of man as the image of God, I think, is the most or commonest explanation of the golden rule. So if the golden rule is a philosophical principle, then imago Dei, which is a religious principle, makes that pr philosophical principle perfect. I don't know if I'm clear. I can't hear you. Uh, yes. But you, you explained your point. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, we 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 received some more questions. The first was uh, Sylvia Parigi. Uh, Sylvia, could you please unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes, many thanks. I, um, I think it, it is necessary to add something to your uh, hypothesis, to your fundamental hypothesis. That is to say, it, it is not sufficient to uh, conjecture to, um, uh, to conjecture that uh, there is a universal, a common human nature um, that is the foundation of the morality of nonviolence. You have to add, according to me, that this universal human nature is not egoist, as Hobbes and other philosophers thought, but that this universal human, human nature is also good. And this is not a, a little philosophical question. This is a major philosophical question. A, a, a hypothesis, and I think, a very, very, very strong. I, I totally agree with you. I don't have anything to add to this. I think this is perfect. Actually, when I was making that distinction between Hobbesian, uh, uh, Hobbesian uh, concept of human nature and his social contract and co, I'm trying to bring uh, uh, some contrasts that when Hobbesian is trying, says that he's attempting to resolve a uh, chaos in human nature, that human nature is fundamentally chaotic. It means that he's trying to prove that human nature is, in a way, fundamentally evil, while social contracts brings us a resolution which gives us the new order. So I believe that uh, uh, what you said is quite in line. This human nature is also good. This universality of human nature, or if I may say, common universality of human nature. That's why St. John Paul's or Karol Wojtyla's concept of uh, uh, man as that we are neighbors to one another, we exist in this, this commonality of persons as neighbors. I, I believe that this 
commonality is based on the principle of good. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I agree with you. I think we have uh, time for one question more. I saw Anna raising her hand. Anna, are you able to, to speak? Or are you fighting with uh, uh, Yes, I'm able to speak. Uh, well, first of all, Ebuka, thank you very much for your paper. I have only one comment. I understand that contrasting New Testament with Old Testament is not your idea. Just please consider one thing. Okay. Two main things. To love God more than yourself. It's um, to love the other one more than yourself. That those two things do came from the Old Testament. There is no such contract as you the uh, contrast between two testaments as you try to uh, to present. The shoe didn't break the strong connection between two. That's it. I, I don't think I did that. That was not what I said. I, uh, I was trying to say that the New Testament complemented what the Old Testament did. What I was saying is that the New Testament presents a more comprehensive uh, uh, version of the Old Testament principle of love your neighbor. That's what I said. So that's why I extended it that the New Testament added love your enemies. And if I may say more, even Jesus Christ said that uh, before, before his passion, he said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. He used the word one another. As I have loved you. It means he withdrew the standard of love from the self. Instead of love your neighbor as yourself, becoming the standard of your love for your neighbor. Rather now, we have to love like Christ did. That is why the, no greater love than this for a man to give his life for his friends and even for his enemies, just for good. So I'm not in any way dissociating the New Testament from the Old. Rather, I'm saying that the New Testament perfectly complements what the New Old Testament says. Okay, uh, we need to move on to the next talk. Thank you very much, Tony, and thanks for all the questions. We received two more on the YouTube stream. I will pass it to you privately, so just for your just for your information. And now we can move to our next speaker, which will be um, Daniel Spencer from University of St. Andrews, Scotland. I can see that Daniel is with us. Hi, Daniel. Uh, I will display the Daniel's talk right now, and please keep all the questions for the discussion after the lecture. Thanks. And one thing more, I forgot about the title. Daniel will give a talk on the mysticism and philosophical analysis, some Christian strategies. Good afternoon, everybody. The title of this talk is Mysticism and Philosophical Analysis, Some Christian Strategies. A brief roadmap of what's to come. We will begin with just some background and definitions, the what and the why of this presentation. Um, and I hope you'll understand a bit more of the motivations for this project. So we'll define our terms um, and look in particular at what sort of problems Christians might see in the study of comparative mysticism. Then we'll take a look at some prior work done in the field. We'll look at R.C. Zayner and the more analytically minded Nelson Pike after which I will very, very briefly offer um, a first step anyway um, for a constructive proposal of my own and how we might further engage this field as Christians. So there has been some recent Christian work done in the past 20 or so years, but not a lot has been written. This isn't quite everything, but it's almost everything, at least as far as I can tell. So that's one of the things motivating this project is the fact that and a considerable gap, and I think in the Christian witness, can be seen um, simply from the lack of uh, engagement with comparative mysticism. And this is not, of course, mysticism simpliciter or Christian mysticism, but I mean comparing and contrasting the different paradigms of spirituality and how Christians might understand non-Christian mystical experience. Now, coming to a definition of, mystic, uh, of mysticism, a bad definition is that offered by Ninian Smart, for instance, where he says mysticism 
refers to those inner visions and practices which are contemplative. You see this a lot. Um, definitions that are far too vague uh, need further defining. Uh, a psychological definition you'll see sometimes, such as uh, the one here, a series of discrete modes of experiencing the self that function to impose the unity of the self on whatever the self is bound up with. Well, again, very vague. It leaves more questions to be asked than questions answered. And I think it's a bit question-begging as well if we take a close look at it. As Gershom Shalem once said, there are almost as many definitions of the term as there are writers on the subject. So we need to be very, very careful and indeed partially stipulative when we offer our own definitions of mysticism. So here's mine. This is what I mean by mysticism. Any state of consciousness, which phenomenologically is a unitive, that is, the mind is emptied of all subject-object distinction or differentiated content, B, a state that acquaints the subject with the truth or reality that is not obtainable by ordinary sense perception, reason, or introspection. Um, you see this a lot in the Upanishads, for instance, where, where the lower sciences, there's the lower ways of knowing, such as theology, philosophy, rites, um, uh, give way to the higher mode of knowing, which um, is mystical experience. And this sort of negates all of the lower ways of knowing. And then, finally, this experience carries with it virtual certainty as to the veracity of the insight inquired. William James's, James's noetic quality, the mystic simply sees and knows that he has seen reality as it is. Okay, so what? And I have actually uh, quite a hard time convincing other Christians that this is um, something important to deal with. Elsewhere, I've written a, a decent amount on this. Uh, just for our purposes today, I'll say two things. First of all, the conjunction of A, B, and C, that is a mystical experience, almost certainly and does inevitably carry with it profound metaphysical import in the eyes of the mystic. Um, such that if mystical experiences are indeed cognitive, that is, if they latch on to reality, then plausibly monism or pantheism or religious pluralism follows. This is a claim that is very, very common in the mystical literature. Perhaps a more difficult charge to deal with comes from within Christianity itself, actually, and that's that mystical experience or um, the height of contemplation is what Christianity is really about. So all of the, the you know the all of the our theology and um, Christian philosophizing really is pointing to mystical experience, such that once we attain that enlightenment the rest can be jettisoned. So as one Benedictine monk of the middle 20th century says, whoever in his personal experience has discovered the self has no need of faith in Christ or of prayer or communion with the church. And this is precisely because those are the lower ways of knowing and he has attained the real with a capital R. Thomas Merton a uh, very famous mystic has made some similar claims. I won't get into that now, but I'm happy to um, talk about him a bit more in the QMA if we have time. Now, turning to R.C. Zayner, he's most famous in uh, the field of comparative mysticism for the typology of mysticism he offered. He really represents the first systematic attempt to classify, classify mysticism by type, and he is followed and critiqued by many others later on. So, the three main types of mysticism for Zayner. First, we have the panhenic, or the nature mysticism, where the everyday self or ego melts away uh, and an all-embracing non-dual consciousness of all and one and one and all emerges. You see this often in philosophical Taoism, Zen Buddhism, and some of the Upanishads. Secondly, there is um, the mysticism of pure isolation or monism, Introvertive mysticism is what W.T. Stace called it. And this is where uh, there is no sense experience at all, so we withdraw from the external world, empty the mind of all conceptual content, and a feeling of absolute oneness ensues. And this is um, this seems to be the authentic teaching of the historical Buddha, for instance. Um, you see this in the Vedanta and in sometimes in Sufism, as well as in some Christian mysticism. I have Meister Eckhart in mind. Note that these are both robustly monist, always phenomenologically, of course, but 
more often than not, um, perhaps 90% or 95% of the time, they are said to yield metaphysically monist conclusions as well. Now, more controversially, uh, R.C. Zander introduces a third type of mysticism, theistic mysticism, where the absorption of the ego is this time not into some vague, undefined entity, but into the divine essence itself. So Zayner says that both the individual personality and the whole objective world are entirely obliterated in the Godhead. Now, what's very interesting to note about this case of theistic mysticism is that it is an explicitly dualist metaphysic insofar as there's God on the one hand and the individual soul on the other, and ontologically, never shall the twain meet. But phenomenologically, it does seem to be akin, if not identical, to um, type 2 here. Now, this is where Nelson Pike uh, picks up on where Zayner leaves off. He hasn't written too much on comparative mysticism, uh, but what's there is very interesting and very profound and helpful for further study. And I want to just look at some of his contributions from Mystic Union. So, Pike talks a bit about Zayner, and he starts with the observation that uh, W.T. Stace and Ninian Smart um, criticize Zayner for essentially um, smuggling some theology into his third type of mystical experience. So, theistic mysticism is, is an ex post facto interpretation of monist mysticism, Um and again, this is artificially derived from prior theological commitments. The only reason, they say, Zayner has a third type is because, well, he's a Roman Catholic and there needs to be a third type of mystical experience or else he's courting heresy. Now, Pike is interesting because he says the charge against Zayner is essentially correct, yet he still wants to maintain against Stace and Smart that there are three distinct phenomenological types of mysticism. Now, through a close reading of one of Zayner's texts, Pike highlights the issue for Zayner. He says that whereas the phenomenological descriptions of experience ground extrovertive and introvertive, that is nature in monistic mysticism, when Zayner introduces the concept of theistic mysticism, the examples that he uses seem to be phenomenologically monist through and through. Henry, Zus Henry Suso, John Roisbrook, for instance. So Pike says the differences are clearly doctrinal and not phenomenological, hence Stace and Smart are right. But, Pike says, there's still a way to secure a third type of mysticism. He says, distinguish between the phenomenal content of certain dualistic states of theistic consciousness. So the prayer of quiet, that's... Um, Teresa of Avila and full union, states of rapture, states of ecstasy, and then assume that these four categories of uh, perhaps proto-mysticism, we might call it, is union without distinction. So again, one through four are phenomenologically dualist. There's God and there's the soul, and the soul doesn't lose a sense of self. Yet Five, which is the climax, all uplifted spirits are melted and knotted in the essence of God, as Royce Breck puts it. So this is phenomenological monism at the climax. Pike says the dualistic stage peaks in a monistic interval lacking subject-object structure, as well as all sensory and sensory-like content. So here's the challenge for Pike. If one to four, if one to four here are mere stepping stones on the way to the monistic interval, as he calls it, how can there be three distinct phenomenological types of mysticism? Here's how he proceeds. He says, consider case one where I am sitting on a park bench and I'm unexpectedly hit in the head with a baseball. Upon awakening, I describe the experience as sun stars and fading consciousness. Now, later, an observer tells me I was hit in the head with a baseball such that thereafter I describe the experience as being hit on the head with a baseball. Yet that's not part of the primary experience. Now, contrast that with case two, where I see the ball hit, I watch it, and I lose it in the sun, and the next thing I know, I experience sun stars and fading consciousness all over again. So, this time when I awake, I know I've been hit in the head with a baseball because of the phenomenological ancestry of the experience as a whole. 
So in case one, being hit with a baseball is not something perceived, but it is in case two. Sun stars and fading consciousness, Pike thinks, is to union without distinction what ph- the phenomenological ancestry of seeing the ball hit and losing it is in the sun is to um, states one to four, which precede union without distinction. I hope that's clear enough. Perhaps it's not, but we'll move on regardless. So Pike says that the climax moment, that is the monistic climax mo- moment, is preceded by a specifically theistic experience with dualistic structure. And this phenomenological ancestry, he thinks, is what can ground the distinction between mystical types two and three. It's clever. It doesn't work. We can debate about this and I go back and forth, but I think probably not. I want to say that the climax itself is what is relevant in mystical experience. If you isolate that, then types two and three, in Pike's case, one and two with the baseball example, are absolutely identical. If we consider the phenomenal ancestry, moreover, there doesn't seem to be any reason in principle to rule out an infinite infinite variety of distinct types of mystical experience. Why are we privileging um, mystical experiences which have a theistic phenomenological ancestry and not any type of phenomenological ancestry, if that makes sense? A bigger problem that neither Pike nor Zaner nor, to my knowledge, any other Christian scholar raises is this. Why does a metaphysically dualistic system, or why should it, climax in phenomenological monism? To me, it seems a bit queer that there's a climactic identity of the monistic mystic and the theistic mystic. Why should that be the case? And this is not answered, neither by Pike nor by Zaner, nor is it discussed. Okay. In the short amount of remaining time that I have, I want to consider a way forward. The first step in a contribution of my own uh, towards further engagement with comparative mysticism. The question of questions is this for Christians, I think. What is going on in mystical experience? We can't sidestep it. Something clearly um, authentic is going on, something profound, at least for the mystic. Now, building on Zaner's typology, which I think is fundamentally right, even if we can quibble with um, theistic mysticism, Um, And then building off also Pike's analytic rigor, I would also like to remedy their theological and exegetical blind spots and deficiencies to take a step forward. So here's the proposal, and this is where we're going to get a bit weird, but that's okay because in my book, existence itself is a bit weird. That's why we're all here. Um, Bear with me, and we can talk about it a bit in the Q&A if it does get a little bit too weird. Okay, so isolate one type of mystical experience. Let's take Taoism because I'm most familiar with that as an Eastern philosophy, okay? Um, Taoism seems pretty clearly to be nature mysticism, uh, type one. So you look at the Chuangzi or the Tao Te Ching, for instance, and even in the Lietzu, it's the, the philosophical type of Taoism, in any case, is pretty clearly nature mysticism, at least when the sage has um, seen reality as it truly is, or as he says. Now, what seems especially interesting to me, and, and this is something that's frequently talked about in the mystical literature, is the apparent phenomenological similarity, if not identity, with the psychedelic experience. And as we know, lots of nature mystics, traditional nature mystics in the past, have indeed used psychedelics in order to facilitate their mystical experiences. So Smith, Houston Smith, rightly says, the question that drugs pose for the phenomenology of religion is whether these experiences that are induced differ from the religious experience reached without them, and if so, how? Okay. So, Imperial College London today has been running a series of psilocybin trials that is the active ingredient in psychedelic mushrooms. A recent paper that's come out, uh, this is the thesis. He says, a a psychedelic state is considered an exemplar of primitive primitive or primary state of consciousness that preceded the development of modern adult human normal waking consciousness. Neuroimaging data with psilocybin shows that the defining feature of these primary states is elevated entropy in certain aspects of the brain function. Now, more particularly, uh, there is a marked lack of connectivity between 
uh, the various regions that go to make up the default mode network. And this DMN is what gives us, or at least helps to give us a sense of self and recognition of the passage of time. It's what, in short, distinguishes human beings from the other animals. So if this is both what nature mysticism gives us, the sense of a loss of ego, a loss of self, and yet a an identity with the surrounding world, um, if this is the same in both the psychedelic case and in the nature mystical case, it seems like we might have some grounds for uh, doing some serious um, comparative mystical work. Now, in biblical terms, Zayner says this, this seems... Taoism and the psychedelic experience, he says elsewhere, seems to be a return to the original innocence of the Garden of Eden before man reached the age of reason and had tasted of the tree of knowledge. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what Taoism gets you to is this state of ultimate and undifferentiated unity, to lose which is to lose the security and responsibility, which is the privilege of the animal world and in which there is knowledge of neither good nor evil, right nor wrong, uh, life nor death. And this is coming from a Roman Catholic, such as Zayner himself. Now, just in closing, I'd like to say also that lots of contemporary biblical scholarship is, um, it does back this sort of proposal, not, of course, with the psychedelics, but um, seeing Adam and Eve as falling from a state of solidarity with uh, the animals and into this new state of self-awareness and self-consciousness, wherein ethical responsibility um, before God and before fellow men becomes um, a possibility for the first time. So it's not too crazy, though I'm very curious. To um, thank you very much, Daniel. That was uh, Daniel Spencer from University of St. Andrews, Scotland. Um, do we have any questions on site? Or we can move to the WebEx participants. I see a lot of people have joined. Um, so, if do you have any questions? Yes, Sylvia, go on. I can see Sylvia, Parker, uh, Piotr. Okay, uh, just uh, please unmute yourself, Sylvia. Just two very brief questions. The first one, uh, do you think that philosophical solipsism may be considered a kind of uh, mysticism? And the second one, what about dreams? If they um, appear to be uh, real, some, some, uh, sometimes you, while you are dreaming, you are convinced you, you believe, believe that uh, the dream is real, a real experience. Uh, so what is the, different, the difference between um, dreams, this kind of dreams, and mystic experience. Uh, th thanks for those questions. To the first one, philosophical solipsism, I'd say, yeah, that's um, in many ways mysticism par excellence. I think that's, uh, uh, lots of mystics do have a sort of solipsistic tendency. Um, <clears throat> as to the second one, yeah, I've, I've, I've not thought a lot about dreams. Though it's really interesting because um, in the Upanishads, there's lots, can, can everyone hear me by the way? Um, there, there's lots of material in the Upanishads which talk about sort of the mystical ascent being identical with various states of dream and sleep. Um, is, is, are you are you sort of asking how you know by what methods we can actually know that we're not in a dream state now? Am, am I understanding you right? I thought from a. Um both from an ontological point of view and from an epistemological point of view. Yeah, um, goodness. Um, it, 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 I'm sure um, I, I'm sure a couple of the people here could really help me out with that. For me, it's um, just sort of a, you know, it's, a, it's an a priori datum, I guess, that this is the real world. Um, I don't know how I could argue that on, you know, I, I don't know if I can convince everybody of it, but I'm, I'll, I'll let others do that work for me if that's not a cop out. I think already Roman in Garden did it for you. Um, that was the, the, the phenomenologist who was arguing for the existence of the external world. Okay, um, do we have any more questions? Uh, Parker, I saw you raising hand. Go on. 
Um, thanks for this, Daniel. This is really intriguing. Um, so first is a clarificatory question. Uh, and if I'm understanding, I have uh, what I see to be an objection. So based, based on the very um, end of your presentation, I want to be clear that uh, the state of elevated consciousness can be seen theologically as a result or an effect of original sin. Is that true? Uh, yeah. So, so okay. Um, I'll, I'll preface, I'll, I'll just say briefly, um, so mysticism and philosophy, like, this is sort of my first step in this direction. My, uh, my PhD work is on original sin. Um, right. I think, so, so yes, uh, yes and no, right? Um, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, to me, my reading of Genesis 2 and 3 is they lacked the, uh, the rationality that we have today, the uh, knowledge of good and evil, these sorts of things. This is the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you can see uh, various parallels, not only in systems like Taoism, but in um, the Epic of Gilgamesh with Enkidu, the, the wild man, right? Um, but there's, it, it seems to me, people always want to say, oh, this sort of new way of seeing, and this, this step from monistic almost, or nature mystical consciousness to dualistic consciousness where we become persons and we become ethically responsible. Oh, original sin must mean that we need to get back to the garden. Categorically not. That's not what Christianity is about. Um, does that help? Uh, yeah, that, that does clarify. Um, yeah, I, I don't mean to infer that we ought to return. Just, I'm just trying to track the, uh, the cause and effect. If, if the elevated state of consciousness can be seen as an effect or as the result of the original sin. So it seems like I'm tracking. Um, so by my lights, um, there might be a startup problem. So if, if you assume reason is kind of a precondition to make a responsible type of choice, uh, then you might run into the startup problem of responsibly choosing to eat the apple or whatever fruit it may have been. Um, and if reason is a product of the elevated state of consciousness, then how do you get reason prior to being in that state of elevated consciousness? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Parker. Um, no, I, and I think that's that. That objection is right on. Um, I don't see. So there's there's sort of three stages um, in the temptation. There, uh, the you know Eve saw that it was a delight to the eyes and and good for food and desired you know desirable to make one wise. Um, it seems to me that this is there's a way that you could get the temptation off, a gra off the ground without saying that there's anything fully rational about it. Now, is there some type of rationality that distinguishes uh, the beasts from human beings? I would say, sure, call it maybe a hemi distinction between the animals and the humans. And again, going back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, we see this with Enkidu, who he runs with the animals, he feeds with them, and the animals are not scared of him, and he's naked, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. But the one thing that distinguishes Enkidu initially from the animals is that he can detect the hunter's traps and he can foil them so that he and his buddies can, his animal buddies can just sort of get on with business. And that's actually what um, leads to the temptation in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which brings Enkidu out of nature and into civilization with Gilgamesh. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed that. All right. Um, we have some time for one or two questions more. If there are any, please just unmute yourself and ask Daniel. Anyone? Um, if there's no questions, can I just make one point of clarification that I don't think I was able adequately to express in the presentation? Um, it, as you can tell, I was running out of time. Um, what I am not saying, and I hope it's clear, is that, I mean, in some types of mysticism, I would say uh, they can be, some types of mystical experiences can probably be induced by drugs or entheogens, um, as they're sometimes called. Um but I'm, what I'm not saying is this is what Christianity is about, and you know, uh, Christian religious experience can be approximated by use of drugs or by perhaps various types of meditation. What I'm saying is, 
Uh, to the extent that there's a phenomenological similarity between the Taoist mystical experience and the psychedelic mystical experience, to the Christian, if we look from Eden onward um, to new creation, uh, where there's, uh, we'll talk about that. If we, from a Christian point of view, I want to say this Taoist mysticism actually represents a step backwards and not to the new creation towards which God is calling us on, if that makes sense. Okay, Daniel, I, I received one comment on the stream. Uh, I will read it to you. It's not a strictly question as it seems, but maybe you will, will make a comment to this. It's a bit poetic. It's, it goes following. At the, at the top of the mystics, there is one. The differences are only in the valleys of doctrines. How would you say, what would you say to this? I would I would say a lot to it. I love it. I, yeah, I mean, I I love all the questions that are implicit in that yeah, comment. Um, yeah, this is I mean, this is like a big part of the project that I'm working on, and you see it with uh, one of the guys, Henri Lasalle, better known today um, as Abu Sheikh Dananda. He's the Benedictine monk who went off to India. Um, it's a very it's a very very common claim that um at the height you know right at the zenith which is mystical experience this is one across all religions and across all philosophies uh the perennial philosophy is what it's called um what i would say as a christian well you know and some christians would obviously disagree um my christianity begins with the one thing that christianity cannot be said to have in common with any other philosophy or religion, and that's not the Trinity, that's not the Incarnation, it's not some code of ethics, it's the resurrection of Jesus, the physical re resurrection of Jesus. If we make that our starting point, um, then I think the perennialist claim becomes extremely pl problematic, especially especially because um, the perennialist Christians, we might call them, love, love to spiritualize away the resurrection. It's an allegory, it's a metaphor, it's really about this death and resurrection of the ego. Um, whereas if we do, you know, really nice first century historical spade work, uh, I think we get a different picture about what Christianity is all about. Okay, I, I will read the, the very last comment I saw, I see right now. Daniel, what do you say? Isn't that too close to the Huxley view on religion? Yes, but, that, but I'm, I'm, I'm pushing back against Huxley. I think Huxley is totally wrong. Yeah. And, and Huxley, Huxley himself thinks he's totally wrong. At the end of his life, um, at the end of his life, uh, there's a recording that his wife has of him, and he basically says, "You know what? I think I may have overstated some of that stuff with mescaline and religion." So Huxley doesn't agree with Huxley. Okay, um, Daniel, thank you very much for this talk. Thanks for the questions from the participants on the WebEx, and thanks for the comments from people watching us on YouTube. Now we can move to, to our third speaker in the session seven, which is James Capehart, the independent researcher from Indiana. Hi, Jim. Um, Jim will give a talk on Etienne Gilson and three stages of his Christian philosophy. So I will display um, Jim's talk right now and we will have a discussion after it. Hello. I would like to present the thought of Etienne Gilson uh, on Christian philosophy in three stages in this upcoming presentation. Uh, the first stage, I'm calling it the gestational stage from the 1920s through the early 1930s at the end of the first Christian philosophy debate. Uh, its second stage, I'm calling its birth and infancy from the 1930s through the 19. 40s, early 1950s, and the third ending stage, its state of maturity from the late 1950s through the 1960s. Thus, I will demarcate three main stages of the development of Gilson's doctrine of Christian philosophy through an examination of some of Gilson's most important works of this 50-year period, especially as regards his thought on the relationship of Christianity and philosophy. 
Also, throughout those three stages, I will show that Jill Stone's Christian philosophy should be conceived as existing in two possible modes. That's a key theme to this whole presentation. Um, one mode, Christian philosophy is angela theologiae, that Christian philosophy as a philosophical component within theology, and Christian philosophy as amicus theologiae, employed outside of theology proper, but still very much uh, influenced by Christian revelation and grace. Um, also, I'd like to show um, Jill Sohn's influence on St. John Paul II's treatment of Christian philosophy in Fetus et Ratio, and conclude with um, some reflections on how Christian philosophy, uh, I suggest, should move forward. Um, Let's go to his first stage, what I'm calling Christian philosophy and gestation. His, uh, the earliest work that I'm treating of is the philosophy of St. Bonaventure of 1924. He does not define Christian philosophy in that work, but there is one place where he gives four key characteristics yeah. of it, trying to show how are Thomas and Bonaventure similar despite their differences. And that similarity is in that they are Christian philosophers. Well, what, what are those key characteristics? Um, he says, as against pantheism, both of them teach creation from nothing and maintain that the gulf is infinite between absolute being and contingent. So the notion of creation is, influences their philosophy. Okay, Against ontologism, both deny explicitly that God can be seen at all by the human mind in this life, and a fortiori, they deny that habitual knowledge of God, which ontologism attributes to us. Okay, well, Christian revelation has influenced human knowing, human philosophical knowing about God, how we know about God. Um, even if there are differences in their doctrines, there's much uh, great similarity. Um, as against fideism, they both set the most thorough effort of the intellect to prove the existence of God and interpret the data of faith. Yes, Christian philosophers, there is an area of preambles, that is, things that may be revealed, but which are capable of rational development, rational investigation, and possibly rational proof. Um, as against rationalism, both coordinate the effort of the intellect with the act of faith and maintain the beneficent influence of the habit of faith upon the operations of the intellect. For the Christian philosopher, faith and grace ennoble uh, the Christian such that he, he might philosophize all the better. All right, um, let's move on to Laetomism, third edition of 1927. Here he gives what uh, what I believe to be the first definition in print that uh, for him uh, of Christian philosophy. And he says, um, referring to St. Thomas's Christian philosophy, he says, we mean by this, by this phrase, a philosophy which intends to be a rational interpretation of data, but which considers as the essential element of these data, the religious faith, the object of which is defined by Christian revelation. It's philosophical. It is a rational interpretation of data. Well, how is it Christian? Christianity suggests starting points for rational investigation, starting points which may or may not, uh, that we might or may not have ever come to without uh, Christian suggestion. But we're not talking about mysteries or articles of faith. Again, this is that area of preambles, of investigating preambles, of maybe coming to Prove preambles. All right, let's move on. Um, interesting point. Uh, Christian philosophy of Gilson in this first stage is much more Bonaventurian, Augustinian, Thomistic. You know, it's broad. Gilson is looking for commonalities in these great uh, theologians and philosophers. Um, I suggest that in the next stage, there is a uh, more of a Thomistic turn. Uh, but here, at the close of this first stage, uh, at his uh, 1931, The Notion of Christian Philosophy, um, he defines Christian philosophy in highly Augustinian, uh, in a highly Augustinian way. Um, 
He says, what is peculiar to the Christian is being convinced of the rational fertility of his faith, being sure that this fertility is inexhaustible. If we pay attention, that is the true meaning of St. Augustine's credo ut intelligam and St. Anselm's fides querens intellectu, a Christian's effort to draw some of reason's knowledge from faith and revelation. That is why these two formulas are the true definition of Christian philosophy. Credo ut intelligam, I believe that I may understand, and uh, fides querens intellectum, the faith seeking understanding. The Christian philosophy at the close of this first stage is that kind of uh, uh, rational, seeking a rational understanding of the faith. What can be rationally understood of the faith? Again, this points to the preambles. He is not saying trying to demonstrate uh, pr- uh, articles of faith. Okay, the, those preambles, they have been revealed, but they are at least de jure capable of being known by reason, that God exists, the immortality of the soul. Oh, the Ten Commandments. Okay, he has for, this understanding of these have been revealed, hey, now they're a starting point. Well, let's, what can we do to come to understand them better? Uh, can we ground them philosophically? That's very much Christian philosophy uh, for Gilson. Um, let's go on to the second stage, uh, beginning with the spirit of medieval philosophy um, and his first, his landmark definition there. Um He says, thus I call Christian every philosophy, which although keeping the two orders formally distinct, nevertheless, consider the Christian revelation as an indispensable auxiliary to reason. Okay, so Christianity and philosophy, or Christian revelation, Christian theology, uh, and philosophy are distinct formally. But, and then he goes on, For whoever understands it thus, the concept does not correspond to any simple essence susceptible of abstract definition, but corresponds much rather to a concrete historical reality as something calling for a description. Okay, he's heavily influenced by Maritain in this, is that the idea that Christian philosophy doesn't exist in the formal order, but in the order of exercise within the individual doing philosophy, his Christianity, uh, Christian faith, and, and the life of grace, Christian culture, nourish this individual, nourish his intellect and his will to better philosophize. Okay, that's why it exists as a concrete reality. Okay, uh, let's move on to his Christianity and philosophy of 1936, where he's going to go on to emphasize the this relationship of Christianity to philosophy to be like that of uh, grace and nature. It's, so it's not just, again, following Maritain. He's definitely influenced on Maritain on this, in my opinion. Uh, Maritain, in his Christian philosophy, speaks of the objective influence of Christianity upon philosophy, but the subjective influence. Jules Sohn, seems to embrace that and to get that. So he says, faith in the divine word brings this grace to us and to accept it is to philosophize as a Christian. To forget what good remains in nature is fatal to Catholicism, but to forget what nature has suffered and the remedies which its weakness calls for would be nonetheless fatal to it. The truly Catholic attitude in the face of the philosophical tasks which confront us consists therefore in never despairing of reason but in carefully availing ourselves of the supernatural aids that God offers the reason in order to permit the same to succeed in its enterprises. That, that's Christian philosophy, not by definition, but by act. What, what's going on? Na- Christian, the Christian life is ennobling reason, post-lapsarian reason, to philosophize all the better. It's, an, it's a subjective uh, influence of Christianity upon the development of this philosophy. Okay, let's go on. That was 1936, and I've got to jump way ahead or, uh, to 1951. Okay, so far, we haven't really had, we, we've had 
Christian philosophy, presumably as a, a handmaid of theology, we've had Christian philosophy, it seems, where he emphasizes, yeah, we're doing philosophy as philosophers. Here, he talks about scholastic philosophy, that's not Christian philosophy, that's scholastic philosophy returning to theology. Okay. Where he says, oops, I'm sorry, lost my spot. Um, to, retor- to restore it to itself, let us listen to the counsel of history. Scholastic philosophy must return to theology. Okay. Uh, the philosophy we call scholastic is not distinguished from other philosophies by its essence. It is rather distinguished from them as the best way of philosophizing. He is saying that that best way of philosophizing uh, is done like the scholastic theologians. Okay, he says, that is how, indeed how the encyclical Eterni Padres has described scholastic philosophy and with perfect uh, reason. Uh, he who joins... Uh, the study of philosophy with obedience to Christian faith, he philosophizes best, quoting from Eterni Parstries 9. To philosophize otherwise is assuredly to philosophize, but it is to philosophize less well. At any rate, it is no longer to philosophize as did the scholastics. That famous essay makes one think that Jolson uh, basically said, no, I just, I'm disagreeing with what I said before, Christian philosophy must be done in one mode as within theology. He does highly emphasize this. Is that true? Is there no way that a, a philosopher, you know, embracing Christian revelation and its influence, but doing philosophy as such outside of theology, um, can't that be Christian philosophy? Isn't that Christian philosophy? And there are further texts here that I think suggest yes, and that Jill Sohn would agree. Um, we'll go to his 1957, What is Christian Philosophy? Here he defines Christian philosophy. Quote, okay, clearly what Leo, talking about a tyranny Patris, paragraph nine again, clearly what Leo calls Christian philosophy cannot be reduced to the content of any single philosophy. It is neither a system nor even a doctrine. Rather, it is a way of philosophizing, namely the attitude of those who, to the study of philosophy, unite obedience to Christian faith. This philosophical method or attitude, philosophandi institutum, is Christian philosophy itself. Let that sink in. Christian philosophy is a way of philosophizing which unites the study of philosophy to obedience to Christian faith. That can be done in either mode within theology or outside of theology as such. Let's go on to his definition of Christian philosophy in 1962 in his philosophical memoir, uh, The Philosopher in Theology. He says, speaking of Christian philosophy, uh, he says, uh, Christian philosophy transcends the distinction of scholastic philosophy and scholastic theology. It designates the use the Christian makes of the philosophical reason when, in either one of these two disciplines, he associates religious faith and philosophical reflection. That, my friends, is a Christian philosophy in either mode, either in theology by a philosophizing theologian or by a philosophizing philosopher outside of theology, but very much still keen to that friendship with Christian revelation, suggesting starting points uh, for investigation, embracing the life of grace and Christian culture to ennoble uh, his reason and to even better philosophize. Let's go to Fides at Ratio very quickly to give uh, John Paul II gives a definition of Christian philosophy. Uh, he spoke, speaks of Christ, uh, a second stance adopted by philosophy is, designa- is often designated as Christian philosophy. In itself, the term is valid, but it should not be misunderstood. It in no way intends to suggest that there is an official philosophy of the church, since the faith as such is not a philosophy. 
The term seeks rather to indicate a Christian way of philosophizing, a philosophical speculation conceived in dynamic union with the faith. This is as Gilsonian as Gilsonian gets. I mean, that is uh, heavily influenced by our last three texts of Gilson. So well, what would I say here at the closing of this presentation um, that uh, I think with Gilson and Jean-Paul II in Fetus at Ratio, I think we have a map moving forward for Christian philosophy. It, uh, I think we very much, the Christian, the philosophizing Christian theologian uh, has a path forward for doing Christian philosophy uh, as Angela Theologiae, but the but the Christian philosopher as philosopher um, also uh, should embrace that influence of faith and revelation uh, to move philosophy forward to also be a better handmaid for theology and also be a better tool for leading uh, Thank you very much. That was uh, James K. Paul from, um, from Indiana. Thank you, James. And now, do we have any questions on site? If not, let's move to the, to the questions from WebEx participants. Just please unmute yourself, ask the question, and mute yourself again. Thanks. Go on, huh? Uh, okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite interesting. Uh, the truth is that I worked on Gilson quite a bit, especially on his conception of Christian philosophy, because I think that nowadays it's heavily undermined it and overlooked. And the very question of what Christian philosophy is, is almost non-existent. And Gilson did give a, <laughs> quite a bit of effort to define it. Uh, the point on which I disagree with your presentation is that I wouldn't speak about relation between philosophy or doing Christian philosophy within, within theology in Gilson at all. He doesn't speak about theology that much unless he speak, uh, speaks about uh, philosophy and sila theology. He speaks about fate. There is quite important, of course, you know what I'm, uh, I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about his essay on the spirit of uh, Christian philosophy. Just a minute. And he says very clearly, just a minute, I want, okay, there is no such thing as a Christian reason, but there, there may very well be a Christian exercise of reason. And then he tries to explain what this exercise of reason could be. And after all, it, it is exercise of reason in the light of fate. And this light of fate transforms philosophy. This light of fate is the criterion, the ultimate criterion of truth for a Christian philosopher. It's not a theology. It's not a uh, doctrine. It's even not the content of revelation. It is the light of fate. And then Gerson explains it in this way. He actually uh, continues the very Gregory of Nyssa explanation of what is to be a, the, a Christian thinker. Uh, he quotes uh, Gregory. Uh, it is uh, exactly about speaking um, uh, in the light of fate, exercising reason, and also he speaks in the on, on the same in the same terms when he uh, presents uh, the history of uh, just um, yes Justin and he, uh, his uh, talk with uh, with uh, Jewish philosopher. So again, it's not about theology. It's about fate. Thank you very much. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Thank you, Anna. Oh, that's that's an excellent comment. And um, I would say, I mean, I think that you're right that it is about faith. Again, that um, I. 
I think that emphasizes the Mauritanian influence that that's not highlighted enough uh, on Gilson, that that Christian philosophy um, is um, in the order of exercise. It's the person, uh, the philosopher influenced by faith, by grace, by this Christian influence uh, uh, in his life, in his or her life. Um, I think when I speak of these two modes, uh, this is treating Gilson historically, um, and, and the fact that he was uh, a, philosopher, a historian of philosophy, you find him often treating, well, where's Christian philosophy found historically? Um, in the works of Christian theologians. I mean, so in that respect, it's not incorrect to, to find it historically, a philosophical component found in these theologians. But I think there's a shift in his thought from the fact of Christian philosophy, as I call it, to the act of Christian philosophy. And I, I think you are right. I think the act of Christian philosophy is that, that act, uh, that philosophical act done under the beneficent influence of faith. Um, you know, nevertheless, I mean, he would maintain you're still, you're still philosophizing. You're still obeying the rules of philosophy. You know, you're, you're not reasoning uh, from uh, Re uh, properly revealed premises. I mean, you may be attempting to prove uh, revealed premises, uh, revealed things um, from a in a philosophical manner. That's a that suggestion of starting points. But I think you're right. But I think that's that's the Gilson emphasis of philosophy, Christian philosophy as act, um, which uh, that. I think that emphasis start, starts to take over in his works from the 1930s uh, forward. I mean, I'm not sure what year uh, the, the essay you quoted, um, uh, but that's, I mean, that's a, that's a growing emphasis of Gilson uh, from his second stage on. That would be, but I, I agree with you. It is quite late of his essays. It is one of the latest, and it's already after all of his discussion about whether such kind of thing as Christian philosophy uh, did exist at all. It's all after his discussions, and he tried uh, tried to define what really discerns Christian philosophy as philosophy. And of course, uh, the, the, it's not the content. You know, many times uh, I'm reading books about so-called Christian philosophy, and uh, a part of this book is, for instance, on Mariology. And I'm sorry to say it, it's not a part of philosophy whatsoever. And it's not the content of Revelation. It is how, it is the formal aspect of exercising your reason. And the formal aspect of exercising the reason that you are doing something, you reflect on something, you are doing your argumentation within in light and in, in light of faith. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have two questions more. Uh, the first is from John Hittinger and the latter is from YouTube. John, would you like to, to ask? Yes, just briefly in light of Anna's remark, you know, in... Uh, intelligence and service to Christ the King, he does say explicit, explicitly theology is essential to philosophy. Now, I don't think that contradicts what you're saying, Anna, but I think it does qualify it. And maybe Jim would want to comment on this. In that essay, he says the Christian philosopher is not doing philosophy as an end in itself. He does respect its own structures and exercise, but he always will orient it towards the transcendent. That's the direction that philosophy goes. I mean, Plato and Aristotle are already doing that, but he does think that theology is necessary for the Christian philosopher, in addition to faith, to have a, have a mind that is formed intellectually according to 
the truths of faith, not just held in the mode of faith, but actually through theology. I wonder if both of you would want to comment on that strong statement of Jill Solomon. Uh, maybe I or I will start. Uh, I think that he's obviously right, but in what sense, uh, connecting what I said before, theology gives to philosophy, it is a source of uh, potential problems to work on. It's, uh, it's like a muse for philosophy. Christian theology gives uh, many additional problems, philosophical problems, that didn't exist before Christianity as such. The very question of uh, incarnation actually raised the most basic for us nowadays problem of individual subject. What it is, how it could be defined, because before that there was no such subject for philosophy to discuss as Jesus Christ, who in itself is an ontological or logical oxymoron. And there are a lot of things like creation and other things. It is a source of uh, of influence in a new problem. So in the, the wet way, absolutely. Uh, so I, 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 it's my part of answering your question. So please, James, continue if. You... Oops. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Um, see, I I think we're in much greater agreement than I I, I think it might appear at first because. Uh, I mean, everything Anna just said, uh, I'm in agreement with, um, that making that last point. And Jill Sohn emphasized this. That, that's that idea of uh, Christianity suggesting starting points. I mean, that uh, Joseph Owens used the term starting points, but Joseph Owens used the term to describe what he read of Jill Sohn. Um, uh, that being said, I'm not, I I hope I'm answering Dr. Hittinger's uh, question. With that intelligence and service uh, to Christ the King, this is that you're starting to see Jolson seeing and saying Christian philosophy, properly speaking, is at the service of theology. He's definitely, that. that's a strong emphasis. Um, there are lots of texts uh, where he emphasizes that, um, that, uh, that I actually skipped over for lack of time. Um, uh, but Jolson, the historian, is trying to make it. We ha you know, there are philosophers, but he's trying to make the, as the historian, he's trying to make a case for describing what is this philosophy? Is there, we have Christian theologians, St. Thomas, uh, St. Bonaventure, uh, St. Augustine. They're theologians. We know them to be theologians. Is there any philosophy present in their works? Um, if so, what is the basis of calling it philosophical? Um, and he comes to find out, well, they're, whatever is philosophical in their work is at the service of their theology. I mean, and that's why he's calling, he calls uh, for that, re that return to theology. But I do think um, that's Jilson the historian speaking. But Jilson the philosopher, I, I think he he sees uh, the proper way of doing philosophy as a Christian. However, you're going to do it, whether you're a theologian who's got to philosophize within theology, or whether you're an academic philosopher, is to embrace that uh, influence of faith. Um, in, in your philosophizing. I mean, regardless, that I think that's the key. Okay, and I'm sorry. Go ahead. May I add something? Then we're speaking about those elements that can, could be found in Fathers of Church, um, scholastic thinkers, etc., etc. What is interesting is not how uh, their stricter philosophical account that we took from Plato, Aristotle, Neoplatonists, Stoics, I'm sorry to say it, but Thomas Aquinas as an Aristotelian scholar was very weak. He is nothing in comparison to Alexander of Aphrodisia. 
he wasn't that brilliant as Aristotle, as interpretator of Aristotle. They are much greater than him. And you can, you know, you can uh, use other examples, not uh, Thomas Aquinas. But all of them brought something specific into philosophy that didn't exist before because of their fate and because they needed to work on notions, conceptions, etc., et philosophical notions, consider uh, uh, philosophical conceptions for, for the sake of theological problems. And was theological problems there of Christian nature? So the most original and important elements of thoughts of Augustine, St. Thomas, St. Albert, and our other, uh, others are exactly things that were made for and because and for the sake of theology and in the uh, light of faith. We are in complete and total agreement. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're running out of time. Thank you, James. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, John. Um, James, I will I will pass the question we receive on the stream privately just for your just for your information. Unfortunately, there is no time to to answer this. Now we can move to our last speaker in the session seven, which is um, forgive me if I spell wrong, um, Balint Bekefi from King's Evangelical Divinity School, University of Chester. And uh, Balint will give a talk titled Knowledge and the Fall in American Neo-Calvinism Toward a Van Thiel Plantinga Synthesis. Okay, I will now um, display the, uh, the talk of Balint and we will have a discussion after it, which will be our last discussion after the, the the short lecture and after this we're we'll going to have a long a long keynote lecture welcome to this presentation entitled knowledge and the fall in american neo-calvinism toward the van til synthesis the agenda of this talk is to introduce the thoughts of cornelius van til and alvin plantinga in the context of american neo-calvinism and argue that their epistemology with a specific focus on their view of the effect of the fallen knowledge can be synthesized in a fruitful way. First, in the introductory section, we will take a brief overview of Cornelius Van Til and Alvin Plantinga and introduce their epistemologies. When it comes to Van Til and Plantinga, one way to see them is to see them as the American representatives of neo-Calvinist philosophy. Neo-Calvinism began as a 19th century Dutch reformed movement spearheaded by thinkers such as Abraham Kuyper and Hermann Boving. Their key insight was to see Christianity, and specifically Reformed Christianity, as an all-encompassing world and life view which provided the perspective, a distinct perspective, on every area of life and the academy. In the 20th century, they had representatives and disciples both in the Netherlands and in the USA. In the Netherlands, primarily Hermann Dijverd and Bollenhoven, while in the United States, the most prominent ones might be Cornelius Van Til and Alvin Plantinga. Van Til uh, was born in the Netherlands and emigrated into the United States when he was 10. He studied at Calvin College and Princeton Seminary and University and got his doctorate under idealist philosophers. His, his agenda was basically to formulate a Dutch Reformed apologetic consistent with his theology that interacted with absolute idealism and basically the entirety of the history of philosophy. Alvin Plantinga was born to a family of Dutch immigrants in the States, and he also studied at Calvin, Harvard, Yale, and maybe other places as well. Notably, both of them at Calvin studied under William Harry Jellema, a very highly regarded professor of philosophy. Plantinga contributed to philosophy in many areas, but his most distinct contribution was in epistemology, where he formulated what has come to be known as reformed epistemology, which is a distinct um, theory in current analytic philosophy. My thesis in this talk is that there are deep similarities when it comes to the analysis of knowledge between Mantel and Plantinga, and they can be profitably harmonized. 
first. When it comes to Van Til, one of his key arguments or perspective is considering the antithesis between the Christian and the non-Christian. He argues that in principle, there are two completely opposing worldviews. One is true, Christianity, and its consistent rejection, the non-Christian worldview, the autonomous worldview, is when someone applies their rejection consistently, entirely antithetical such that they have nothing in common. Christianity, as the truth, provides the preconditions for knowledge, intelligibility, predication, and other things, and therefore rejecting Christianity renders knowledge and interpretation and intelligibility impossible. However, Vantil also argued that the antithesis is mitigated in practice. The former he called the ethical and the epistemological levels or perspectives, while the second the metaphysical and psychological. Unbelievers living God's world are created by God and they are subject to God's common grace, which restrains the realization of evil, such that they do good things ethically and know truth epistemologically to a limited degree and inconsistently with their presuppositions. So they are able to know many things about the world, but they cannot give a coherent account of why they are able to know or why they should trust the deliverances of their reason. Vantil argued that both Christians and non-Christians can and should pursue epistemological self-consciousness, basically reflecting on the influences and consequences of one's worldview presuppositions on epistemological matters. And thus, if an unbeliever becomes epistemologically self-conscious, he will realize that his knowledge is effectively impossible, given his worldview. However, the knowledge of God is part of the metaphysics, the constitution of humanity, and therefore, despite the fall, it is not impacted in the sense that everybody, everybody knows that God exists, even though unbelievers, because of ethical reasons, suppress or reject that knowledge. Lattigan, on the other hand, sought to formulate his epistemology in interaction with American analytic philosophy. Despite this fact, when reflecting on his philosophical approach, he emphasized Augustinian and Kuyperian considerations of pursuing a distinctly Christian philosophy. His general epistemology, usually known as proper functionalism, defines knowledge as warranted true belief, and Plantinga describes the conditions of warrant in the following way. First, note the general externalist constraint. A belief has warrant if it is produced by properly functioning, reliably truth-aimed cognitive faculties functioning in an appropriate cognitive environment which is similar to the one that they were designed for. There's an internalist constraint as well on this knowledge, namely that there have to be no defeaters for the given belief, for it to be warranted. A defeater is a belief which contradicts or undermines the warrant or rationality of another belief. If this defeater is undefeated, then the other belief cannot be justified. When it comes to religious epistemology, Plantinga has basically two theses. One of them may be called the aquinas calvin model, and the other the extended aquinas calvin model. First, he proposes that humans have a cognitive faculty, which is called the sensus divinitatis, taking the term from John Calvin, which is a cognitive faculty that reliably pr produces belief in God. Planning argues that on theism, this is probable. And second, on Christianity, it is probable that there is a cognitive process called the internal instigation or testimony of the Holy Spirit, which reliably produces beliefs in the distinctives of the Christian gospel and Christian doctrines. When it comes to, comes to defeaters, Planiga has extended arguments arguing against putative defeaters against Christianity and theism. And he also argues that naturalism and evolution may well be defeated. The following is a proposed synthesis in four points of Van Til's and Planiga's perspectives. First, Van Til claims that there is no non-Christian knowledge in principle. He argues that knowledge is impossible in non-Christianity because it is antithetical to the true worldview and therefore cannot provide the preconditions for knowledge. Now, this may or may not be realized by the non-Christian. On reflection, this is probably increased. Plantinga has proposed 
the evolutionary argument against naturalism, where he argues that the naturalist who believes that humans are the products of evol evolution has no good reason to believe that our cognitive faculties are reliably truth-aimed and therefore has a defeater for all of their beliefs and therefore has no knowledge. Now, Planck is more modest than Mantell in that he argues, or at least thinks, that other religions have a good chance at meeting the preconditions for knowledge and having a correct account of proper function. However, other, event, other Planetagians, such as Tyler McNabb, have argued that other world religions face similar defeaters like the, the evolutionary argument against naturalism. So while there is a specific difference, in principle, a Plantigian could argue the same thesis that Van Til has. But there's another um, implication of the non, no non-Christian knowledge and principle idea. That is that when the non-Christian in fact has knowledge, that is in some sense dependent on Christianity. Van Til argued that when non-Christians know and claim knowledge, they implicitly presuppose Christianity. And this flows also from Plantinga's account of proper functionalism and his claim that that is distinctly theistic, or at least the only viable model is distinctly theistic. William Lane Craig summarizes this in the following way. The non-theist who thinks that he, he is warranted in his non-belief thus unwittingly presupposes the existence of God in his very denial of God, for warrant involves proper functioning, and proper functioning entails theism. Moving on, Van Til argued that the sensus divinitatis is a clear, immediate knowledge of God that every human possesses. It is implanted by God and apprehended through creation. And as part of our human constitution, it is not marred by sin. It is universally present in everyone. And the fall only affects what people do with it, namely suppress it. On the other hand, Plantinga argues that the sensus divinitatis, a faculty that often produces knowledge of God, is marred by sin. So it is no longer clear and ubiquitous, but much more tentative and maybe in some individuals even missing. So there are two alleged differences between these two models as, as laid out by K. Scott Oliphant, a Vantillian scholar. First, that the sensus divinitatis is knowledge itself on Vantill, but merely a cognitive process producing knowledge on Planetica. But it seems to me that this is a merely, th merely terminological difference since presumably there is some process for apprehending this revelation, even on the Vantillian scheme, and the Plantigian might as well just rename the deliverance of what he calls the sensus divinitatis to call the produced knowledge sensus divinitatis such that this difference evaporates. However, there is a genuine difference when it comes to its universality and clearness after the fall. There, Vantil and Plantigian disagrees, but either can adapt his own model to accommodate the other. So there is no reason a Plantingian cannot deny this notion of Plantinga and just argue that the sensus divinitatis has remained in, intact post-fall. When it comes to the knowledge of the world, both agree that it is possible even by unbelievers. For when till the unbeliever is created by God and therefore knows many things living in God's world. However, if his worldview were true, then he couldn't know not anything, therefore he cannot provide a viable account of epistemology. Now, Plantinga argues that unbelievers usually have properly functioning cognitive faculties and therefore their beliefs have a warrant, even though on reflection they might obtain defeaters. However, both agree that this knowledge of the world is limited. For Van Til, describing facts and concepts inevitably includes non-neutral, worldview-dependent interpretation. Whether we think about objects as created and sustained by God goes right down to the definition of terms, and therefore non-Christian's concepts involve some degree of inaccuracy, depending on how consistently they reflect on the impact of their presuppositions. Now, Plantinga argues that, that non-Christians lack or reject very important pieces of knowledge about the world, such as that it is created by God and that we all depend on God. However, he does not have this element of cognitive or conceptual inaccuracy. It doesn't seem incompatible with Plantinga to argue that even our everyday cognitive faculties are somewhat defective, such that they have this inaccuracy, but he does not propose this specifically. 
Finally, I wish to propose a model for the use of evidence in apologetics that is consistent with Vantillian principles, even though most Vantillians are reluctant to employ it. The Vantillian dilemma is the following. If evidence is presented on non-Christian presuppositions, that act is inconsistent because non-Christianity does not have a viable standard of reason and of assessing evidence. On the other hand, presenting evidences based on Christian presuppositions are question-begging in the sense that they require Christian presuppositions even to assess them. However, this latter is generally more preferred because of theological commitments and its apologetic use is left open. My proposal is the following. Given Plantinga's account of proper function, unbelievers, non-Christians, may know many truths that support or imply Christian theism. This is not mere inconsistency, this may well be providential common grace from God, allowing them to know facts which do support Christianity. Now, the apologist has two legitimate options at this point. Either he can launch a transcendental critique to argue that the non-Christian has a defeater for all of his beliefs, or he can make an evidential argument and show how these truths, known by the unbeliever, do in fact support Christianity. There doesn't seem to be any problem with this as long as the Christian believes and keeps in mind that the reason the unbeliever is able to have this knowledge and even perhaps assess it correctly is because the Christian worldview is true and because of providential inconsistency on the part of the unbeliever. Now, should the non-Christian mishandle the evidence or not admit the implications, it is still open for the apologist to revert to transcendental critique. In conclusion, I wish to summarize my points. Since there is a lot of agreement between Bantil and Panega, I wish to focus on the differences. My question will be, suppose a Vantillian wants to adopt Plantinga's epistemology, what changes should he make to remain consistent with his Vantillian commitments? When it comes to the no non-Christian knowledge in principle, the point of disagreement is whether world religions, and not just naturalism, preclude knowledge. On this point, the Vantillian can readily accept um, the modification, modifications and extensions from McNabb and others and argue that all world religions preclude knowledge. When it comes to the universal knowledge of God, the disagreement is whether the census divinitatis is clear and universal after the fall. On this point, it seems to me that there needs to be a clear modification of Plantinga's views, which is still generally consistent with his epistemology. When it comes to the knowledge of the world, the point of disagreement is whether there is a degree of conceptual inaccuracy when it comes to knowledge by non-Christians. It seems to me that this is an addition to Reformed epistemology, which is not inconsistent with it, but not treated in any sense or in any way by Plantinga and his disciples. Finally, when it comes to the use of evidence in apologetics, my proposal is that non-Christians can be warranted in accepting premises of sound Christian arguments, and the Christian apologists can either draw out these inferences or argue transcendentally. Um, thank you very much, Balint. That was uh, Balint Bekeke from University of Chester, um, more specifically King's Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, now it's time for the questions. Um, do we have any questions on site or no? I, I don't see many people here. Um, so the questions from the participants on WebEx. I, I received already one question on the stream, but we can start with the, with the questions from the participants on WebEx. Do you have any? Just please unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, I can see the the question on the chat from Daniel um, Balint. Would you mind Would you mind to read it and answer this? Sure. So um, Daniel Spencer asked the following: It seems to me that Plantinga and Van Til both take for granted that there is an agreed upon Christian worldview which logically excludes other systems of thought or world religions. What, according to them? are the distinctive features of the Christian worldview which ultimately ground the epistemological chasm you speak of. In other words, what makes Christianity Christianity? Well, this is a very good question, and I think Plantinga has devoted uh, less thought to this, or at least less writing to this, than Van Til has. 
for for Plantinga, it seems that he he is a has a sort of a mere Christianity approach. He talks about God. He talks about the incarnation. He talks about the great thing of the gospel, as he quotes Jonathan Edwards. But he doesn't get into many specifics with respect to to what what is necessary for a viable epistemology or, or any such things, which is exactly the reason why he's open to other religions accounting for proper function. On the other hand, um, Van Til basically takes the entirety of confessional reformed theology as as the most consistent version of, of Christianity, and he sees several aspects of it as philosophically significant. For example, he takes the Trinity um, to be the only viable solution to the philosophical problem or problems of the one and the many. Now, this is a very controversial view, but um, he sees that any worldview which doesn't have an ultimate metaphysical um, relation between the one and the many fails to account for uh, any meaningful connection of universals and particulars, and therefore fails to account for reason. Um, the other aspect is basically revelation and special revelation. Um, for Van Til, humans are in such a, an epistemological predicament that we need clear divine revelation to, to learn things about the, the world and, and basically to learn about our own cap capacities. For Van Til, human reason is limited and we need revelation to learn about the proper boundaries of human reason. This is what he called the contrast between um, a univocal and an analogous view or an analogical view of human reason. For him, revelation sets the boundaries for human reason and allows us to flourish within that and lets us know the bounds beyond which we shouldn't go. Okay, do we have any more questions from the participants here on WebEx? Okay, thank you very much for your paper, for your presentation. Um, as to Plantinga, reading him and uh, listening to him, I had an impression that he took too many things for granted as self-evident. Sometimes he doesn't ask uh, maybe obvious but necessary questions. For, me, for instance, what does it mean, Christianity? As such, what uh, it, 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 he follows um, common language uh, intuition, something like that, or the common intuitions. But as to Van Til, I actually would like to follow the one thing that you were, the, had said uh, in your comment. It's about Trinity. It's about uh, problem one and many. I'm sorry to ask, but what was uh, the, the education of Van Til? Um, uh, Van, Til, Van Til was educated under um, British absolute idealist philosophers, basically. Uh, because, you know, the problem of one in many, it's a classical problem of ancient philosophy. You know, you don't need a trinity, a doctrine of trinity, to uh, basically you can amount the entirety of ancient philosophy to this one question. And uh, you see, it's uh, it's kind of funny for me how he seems not to know about it. Oh no, um, Vanti was was very aware of and reflective on the history of philosophy, and he he criticized in in some depth uh, previous answers to these problems as insufficient. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, the, what we have in uh, Trinitarian discourse is not a solution for that problem. Uh, uh, I would say otherwise, we have implementation of ancient philosophical solutions to that problem to the, the, the Trinitarian discourse. Not successful, absolutely not successful, but the, certainly you can take a Trinitarian discourse as uh, uh, any philosophical argumentation uh, that solves the problem of one and many. Um, maybe I can clarify what what mm -hmm. I think Vantil would say, and by the way, if anyone is interested, the most 
most in-depth explanation or exposition of Vantilon. This is a Brent Bosserman's 2014 monograph, um, The Trinity and the Vindication of Christian Paradox. So I think Vantil would say that it, it is just the truth that the one and the many are eternally related um, in the Trinity. Um, and when philosophers try to reason, apart from special revelation, not being aware of this, they basically produce the problem, the philosophical problem, which on the Christian view is just not a problem. <clears throat> I'm afraid Ockham wouldn't agree with him. And not only Ockham, you know. <laughs> okay, okay. Can we move to the next questions? For we, we, we have received two um, on the stream. And the first question is... Oh, in this synthetic model, is the unbeliever's commitment to autonomy rational prior to the acquisition of the features? How does this square with Van Til's view? That's a good question. Um, so the, the answer would depend on what um, the epistemological analysis of autonomy would be. Like, suppose the unbeliever has a belief that... Um, his, his rational cap capacities are reliable apart from God. Um, maybe that's an expression of autonomy. Um, I think on this synthesis, uh, one should say that this belief is not the result of reliably truth and cognitive faculties. In fact, this is produced by, um, in virtue of the noetic effects of sin, um, of improperly functioning cognitive faculties are uh, marred by sin, and therefore I think it would be unwarranted. So it wouldn't count as knowledge. Uh, but this is, of course, um, based on planning as external con constraints and defini definition of knowledge. When it comes to internal rationality or justification, um, that's a more difficult question, but I think one could still st say that this is not a basic belief with respect to justification in the sense of not needing any. Um, and on the other hand, there is no good justification for it. Okay, thanks, Balint. And the other question we, re we received is, do you know Stephen Law, English philosopher from Oxford, criticism of EAN? EAN is uh, evolutionary argument against naturalism. Um, I'm vague, vaguely familiar with it. I, I studied it some years ago. Um, as far as, as best I can recall, his argument is basically that even on naturalism, it is quite possible that the uh, neurochemical functioning of, of our brain, which is basically what is relevant for our evolutionary um, fitness, is it is possible that that is correlated to truth such that there is some kind of a function which, so that whenever we have specific types of brain states, those correspond to um, true propositions and therefore fitness correlates to our ability to discover truth. I think this is possible. However, the, the crucial part of this argument is that it has to be probable because the evolutionary argument doesn't need the naturalist to have a zero probability of his reliability of his cognitive faculties. He need, it needs it, him to be low, the probability to be low. And I think it's still consistent with Stephen Law's objection to maintain that this probability is indeed low. Right, thanks. Do we have, any, we have time for one more question? Is there any any question to Van Til and planting an argument? If not, we can have a break now. Uh, for those who are here in Krakow, we, it will be a coffee break. Of course, you are welcome to, to make a coffee at home. And uh, we will see in 25 minutes for our last lecture 
given by Ted Peters from Center for Theology and the National Sciences, Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley. And we will hear the, the lecture titled Natural Science in Public Christian Philosophy and Public Systematic Theology. So uh, let's meet Let's meet in 25 minutes in this room, room number one, to hear uh, Ted's lecture. Thanks. Thank you.
Hi, Ted. Good to see you. What's, what's the time in California? Um, I've already had um, one cup of strong coffee. Good, good. You will need it. <laughs> okay, um, I think three minutes more before we start, just for people to gather, and we will we will start with you the. You can tell him that in Poland there is only strong coffee, not like decaf. Yeah, yeah. Ted was here twenty years ago. Uh, uh, so he knows Poland. Yeah, yeah. He he will speak about. Decaf doesn't exist in Poland. Just three minutes more, please. Okay, uh, welcome everyone after the coffee break. Uh, it's getting late in Poland, but in California it's, it's pretty nice morning, isn't it? Um, we, we're going to have the, the final lecture given by our keynote speaker, Ted Peters from Center for Theology and Natural Sciences in, uh, on Graduate Theological Union Berkeley. California, and Ted will give a talk on natural science in public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology. I can see that Ted is with us, so um, we're going to display the lecture right now. It will take around 40 minutes, and then uh, we're going to have a discussion on Ted's, uh, on Ted's lecture and the final discussion of this, of this conference. Um, and uh, at, at 7 o'clock Polish time, uh, we're going to, to have a, a f final closing of the conference given by the president of the committee. So now um, let's, let's kick off with, with that lecture. Natural science in public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology. Welcome. Hello, I am Ted Peters. And as we think together about the future of Christian philosophy, we recognize that we live in a global culture that is crisscrossed everywhere by competing worldviews, incompatible worldviews and ide ideologies and political persuasions and, of course, 
advertising. What should a person believe? One characteristic of this cavalcade of competing worldviews is incoherence. One thing a philosopher is good at is coherence. What we will do now is take a look at the public face of Christian philosophy and accompany that with a public face of Christian systematic theology. I think these two can partner. We might think of Christian philosophy as the form and systematic theology as the substance. Fasten your seatbelt. We're going to take a, an exciting ride. I come to you from Berkeley, California, in the United States. Here at the Graduate Theological Union, just north of the University of California at Berkeley, my colleague, Robert John Russell, and I edit this journal, Theology and Science, on behalf of the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, which for nearly four decades now has engaged in education, we bring scientists together with philosophers and theologians and ethicists to dialogue on matters of common interest. You'll notice the unfinished Golden Gate Bridge on the cover. One end is science and the other end is theology. There's a hiatus in the middle. Our goal is to finish the bridge. So the traffic goes two directions, from science to theology and theology back to science. I've only visited the fair city of Krakow once before. It was at the invitation of Jesuit Michael Heller and His Holiness Pope John Paul II for almost two decades. We at the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences teamed up with the Vatican Observatory to carry on a series of studies on divine action in the natural world. In one of our meetings, we met at Krakow to discuss the question of neuroscience and the human person. We brought together some brain researchers, Joseph Ledoux and cognitive scientist uh, Michael Abib, we asked them to present the latest in neuroscientific research. We had, of course, philosophers in the Thomistic tradition, theologians, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. After about two days, we found the dialogue just wasn't working. <laughs> we like to have a creative mutual interaction between the scientists and the non-scientists. It wasn't working. So under the leadership of Philip Clayton, one of the experts in this field, we paused the seminar. We went around the room to try to figure out what the problem is? Why no on Clipfung's book? Why no connection? And the scientists said the following. Are you ready? You, philosophers and theologians, you want to understand human nature. We scientists don't study human nature. We just study how the brain works. <laughs> 
So the hiatus are split between laboratory science on the one hand and anthropology, philosophical or theological anthropology on the other, pretty big. Be that as it may, we did put together the, uh, the findings of that conference in this particular book uh, published by the Vatican uh, City State and uh, CTNS in Berkeley. That's my one trip to Krakow. If there is any passage in scripture which justifies Christian philosophy and apologetic theology, it's certainly this one, 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. What is Christian philosophy? Let's try to answer that question by looking at some examples. Here's one. 1880s, the United States, the editorial policy of the Journal of Christian Philosophy. This journal will support the theistic argument with special reference to the multiplied proofs afforded by the progress and discoveries of science, natural history, biology, and psychology for the existence, character, and plan of God. This journal will counteract all tendencies toward doubt, skepticism, unbelief, atheism, agnosticism, and the many forms of current infidelity. In short, directly to build the foundations and strengthen the defense of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The public is not the church. No, the public this Christian philosophy is addressing is the wider culture while the kingdom of God is getting built. What is Christian philosophy? Pavel Tarashevich says Christian philosophy is possible today only if, one, it is not identified with the art of persuasion as it's Final end lies in gaining understanding rather than being convincing. Understanding rather than being persuasive. Number two, it is the work of a Christian. Number three, it has the real world as its object and metaphysics as its method. I would like to point out that for Mitislav Albert Kampier, truth and explanation go hand in hand. The turning point toward a philosophy does not fear seeking the truth and explaining reality. Explanation, the task of the Christian philosopher. Meet Alvin Plantiga, champion of Reformed epistemology. For Plantiga, Christian philosophy has four divisions. The first one is apologetic, second, philosophical theology, third, Christian philosophical criticism, and fourth, constructive Christian philosophy. Apologetics, very important here, divided into negative and positive. Negative apologetics defends the theistic arguments from external attacks. Positive apologetics, of course, engages in the construction of these theistic arguments.
the two rivals that Alvin Plantinga wishes to confront are perennial naturalism and creative anti-realism. We will deal with perennial naturalism in what is to come in the form of scientism, the denial that there is anything to reality beyond nature. Creative anti-realism, that's relativism or pluralism or deconstructionist postmodernism, we will not deal with that in this particular presentation. Bob Bella, the sociologist of religion, how does he describe the global crisis? What I think we have is a crisis of incoherence. Maurice Tabachek, Dominican at the Angelicum, the Dominican Pontifical University, wants to keep a rather sharp line between philosophy on the one hand and theology on the other. Philosophy provides a critical and in-depth analysis and description of the reality of the universe, both in its material and immaterial aspects. Since philosophy speaks about the reality of the universe, it does not have to say anything about what transcends it. That is, philosophy should not introduce the transcendental category of God. Obviously, this doesn't refer to the transcendent categories of good, beauty, truth, etc., because these are allowed and even desired by the philosopher. So as such, philosophy may address the phenomenon of religion or even the idea of God, not God in God's self, but the idea of God that religious people have. This happens already within the philosophy of religion. Also in metaphysics, such as Aristotle's, where we find the idea of the first mover, we are examining basically a human phenomenon rather than God and God's self. So Maurice argues that philosophers concentrate on the mundane and the human phenomenon of religion and religious practices and human images of God and maybe even attempts to prove God's existence, but always with reference to mundane reality. Theology, in contrast, takes as its point of departure divine revelation and the deep conviction and faith that God exists. Maurice sees theology as taking the fact of God's existence as given and thereby leads to a broader view of reality than philosophy alone can provide. Now, that's going to be the theme here, whether it's philosophy or natural science. Once we bring God into the discussion, we have the opportunity, if not the obligation, to provide a more comprehensive view of reality than strict concentration on the mundane only can yield. My recommendation here in this presentation is that the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian partner as they turn to look towards the wider public, turn away from the church and the academy toward the wider public. That means the Christian philosopher will provide the form while the systematic theologian provides the substance. Ordinarily, within systematic theology, we organized doctrinal presentation according to the three articles of the Apostles of Nicene Creed, Article 1, God and Creation, Article 2, the Person and Work of Christ, Article 3, the Holy Spirit, and then everything else that was not previously included. 
The epilogue has to do with ethics in the Christian life, but the prologue, the propedeutic, uh, that's where the systematic theologian has traditionally included the work of the philosopher answering the question, what does it mean to believe? How is it that we know anything about the God in whom we place our belief? In Protestantism, this is called philosophical theology. For the Roman Catholics, it's called fundamental theology. In both cases, methodology could be apologetic in character, both negatively defending Christian claims and then positively as constructing theistic arguments. So, traditionally, the Christian philosopher is providing a propedeutic to what then becomes doctrinal explication. I'm going to suggest that perhaps as we turn our faces towards the wider public, that maybe the philosopher can provide the form and the systematic theologian the substance of the worldview that we're going to try to construct that would be intelligible and meaningful outside the church. Meet David Tracy. David was my doctor father at the University of Chicago. David claims that the Christian theologian has three publics talking from and talking to the church, the academy or the university, and the wider culture. What I'm emphasizing in this particular presentation is that both the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian need to think about the culture, the wider culture, as the public. What is characteristic of our culture in the present moment is that our cell phones and our computers are lighting up constantly with an incoherent cacophony, a chaos of competing worldviews. Christian philosophers and systematic theologians are good, competent, when it comes to putting together a coherent worldview. Is it possible that we could think that that talent could be of value not just to the church, but to the culture beyond the church? And if that's true, can we talk about public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology? Yes, I think we can. Here is my working definition of public theology. You'll see David Tracy's three publics providing the structure. Public theology is conceived in the church reflected on critically in the academy, and meshed within the wider culture for the benefit of the wider culture. Science, authentic science at its best, pursues the truth, humbly pursues the truth. Yosef Tishnah, the fundamental property of scientific truth is its universality. Scientific truth is the truth for everyone. Basic truths are the same for all people. This should make scientific reason particularly attractive to the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian. Truth 
cannot contradict truth, says St. John Paul II, sincerely engaged in the dialogue between natural science and the Christian faith. Now, Copernicus certainly knew something about worldview construction. We will turn now to discourse clarification and distinguishing between authentic science on the one hand and naturalism in the guise of scientism on the other hand. A general in the army marching against religion is Edward O. Wilson, etymologist and sociobiologist at Harvard, who blurs the line between authentic scientific research on the one hand and scientism as a naturalistic ideology on the other hand, and he is committed to all-out war, what he calls Armageddon. The Armageddon in the conflict between science and religion began in earnest during the late 20th century. It is the attempt by scientists to explain religion to its foundation. Please flag that. Note what's going on here. He's a military general leading the army against religion, and his chief weapon is what? To provide a scientific explanation of religion. If you want to know what religion is, you don't ask a theologian, you ask a scientist. There is going to be a battle, a battle between explanations. Explain religion to its foundations, at its source, says Dr. Wilson. The struggle is not between people, but between worldviews. St. John Paul II engages in discourse clarification. Scientism, he says, is a philosophical problem, not a scientific problem. Scientism is the philosophical notion which refuses to admit the validity of forms of knowledge other than those of the positive sciences, and it relegates religious, theological, ethical, and aesthetic knowledge to the realm of mere fantasy. Many of our scientists around the world these days believe that they are under siege. There are enemies out to get them. What are the enemies that these scientists perceive? One is the wider culture. The scientists have been forecasting for more than half a century climate change, the heating up of the planet, the degradation of the planet, the crossing of thresholds that will prevent recovery of our planet's ability to sustain life and economic vested interests will not believe the scientists' prophetic warnings that's part of the war against science. In the current global crisis over the virus SARS-CoV-2 and the disease COVID-19, many political leaders refuse to take the advice and counsel of our best medical researchers and public health officials and even attack the reputation of the World Health Organization. That's part of the war against science. Then there are the anti-vaccinators, those who refuse to believe that vaccinations are good for the health of their children and the health of society. 
It's also the case that in some Islamic countries, there are government crackdowns on freedom of speech and the ability of science conferences to feature prominent women scientists in public. More signs of a war against science. Do not confuse the war against science with the so-called war between science and religion. They're two different things. Is it accurate to say that there is an all-out war going on between science and religion? No, says Joshua Moritz, the managing editor of the journal Theology and Science. The narrative that science and religion are at war is a myth in two key senses of the word. It is foundational to a certain anti-religious worldview, that's the worldview we've identified as scientism, and is historically false. It's not the case, historically, that there is a perpetual warfare between natural science and religion in general, let alone the Christian religion in particular. As public Christian theology and as public systematic theology, we have been concerned up until this point with scientism, what Alvin Plantinga calls perennial naturalism, the belief that the natural world is the only reality there is, and science is the only way of knowing that reality. <clears throat> we could say nature is the reality and science is its prophet. Nevertheless, when we address the wider culture, we can work with a certain assumption, namely that there is a certain receptivity on the part of the human race for matters that are spiritual or religious. Mircea Eliade, the great history of religion scholar at the uh, University of Chicago, had called the human being homo religiosus, we are religious by nature, John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, says that there is within the human breast a divinitatis sensum, a sense of the divine. These suggest that when the Christian philosopher, the systematic theologian, says something about God, ears are going to be open to listen. One of the tasks of the ideology of scientism or perennial naturalism is to close those ears Here's St. John Paul II again, who also holds this position. Religion is the expression of a search that goes beyond what is visible toward an unknown God. Discourse clarification and worldview construction just may get some level of reception on the part of open ears if the Christian philosopher turns public and the systematic theologian turns public. Public systematic theology has a distinctively constructive function, but that word construction is under contention. There is a school of theological thought that wants to file a patent and own this term with a specific definition. According to the school of thought, constructive theology accepts with the essential diversity of theological claims and opinions as a strength 
rather than as a fatal flaw or heresy, and as abandoning systematic implies. So they're going to abandon systematic theology. Constructive theology refuses any pretense that suggests theology can be completely systematized and every doctrine logically cohered into a grand system. Logic and coherence are being rejected in its extreme form. They're rejecting the meta-narrative and supporting local narratives, a plurality of local narratives that is not organized coherently or logically into a single worldview. This particular brand of constructive theology belongs in the camp that philosopher Alvin Plantica calls creative non-realism. The worldview construction I'm suggesting here belongs in the creative realism camp, not the creative anti-realism camp. Do we need a worldview? We sure do, according to philosopher and Christian theologian Nancy Murphy at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Not only that, she will argue that a worldview that includes God is more comprehensive and more coherent than any of the competitors. We are blessed on the front end of the 21st century with a giant library of new and exciting discoveries produced by the natural sciences, discoveries which give us greater and greater insight into the nature of reality in its many dimensions. Most exciting for the systematic theologian, of course, is going to be Big Bang cosmology and star formation and the question of extraterrestrial life or evolution and its implications for theological anthropology and neuroscience similarly with its implications for theological anthropology. There is excitement, enough excitement to go around for everybody in the natural sciences. But as the public Christian philosopher and the public systematic theologian engage in discourse clarification, as well as worldview construction, scientific claims are treated critically. There's a creative mutual interaction between scientific claims on the one hand and what the Christian might have gained through special revelation. On the other hand, here is Nancy Murphy again, the philosopher and the Christian theologian at Fuller Seminary, teaming up with George Ellis, who's a mathematical cosmologist, to co-author a constructive worldview. And here they are dealing with the fine-tuning of the cosmological constants. That's a discussion arising from the 1970s down to the present time about the initial conditions at the Big Bang if they would have been just a fraction different, the universe we live in would not have ever developed the potential for life, and you and I wouldn't be here. It's 
an amazing set of constants, even if you're just a scientist and not a theologian. They are called the gosh numbers. So here we are with Murphy and Ellis engaging in disclosure. The apparent fine-tuning of the cosmological constants to produce a life-bearing universe called the anthropic principle, they call it the anthropic issue here, seems to call for an explanation, okay? So they're going to engage in what I'm calling ex planetary adequacy, a theistic explanation allows for a more coherent, coherence, that's a good thing, right? A more adequate explanation is going to have greater coherence than its competitors. A theistic explanation allows for a more coherent account of reality than does a non-theistic account. God appears to work in concert with nature never overriding or violating the very processes that God has created. It implies a kenotic. Now, this is um, something that is distinctive to Murphy and Ellis. The kenosis passage in Philippians chapter 2 describes Christ as emptying himself of divinity and so what Murphy and Ellis have done is describe that as a trait of God. God is self-renunciatory in character, okay? So they're now going to draw out the implications of a canonic God. It implies a canonic or self-renunciatory ethic according to which one must renounce self-interest for the sake of the other, no matter what the cost to oneself. Hence, new research programs are called for in these fields. So the theologian is now crossing the bridge towards science by suggesting productive research programs to be carried on by the scientists. Hence, new research programs are called for in these fields, exploring the possibilities for human sociality in light of a vision modeled on God's own self-sacrificing love. So we have a worldview constructed on the basis of God's canonic or self-sacrificing love, and then a suggestion for research in the scientists to look at, examine sociality and the self-sacrificial dimension in sociality. This is explanatory adequacy at work in worldview construction. This is Robert John Russell. He's holding in his hand an original edition of Galileo's Dialogue on Two World Systems. It's Dr. Russell that gave us the term creative mutual interaction or CMI, if you can Remember the image of the bridge. We want traffic to go two ways. Science toward theology and theology toward science in a creative mutual interaction. As I mentioned earlier, Pope John Paul II took a direct interest in the creative mutual interaction between science and theology, he thinks each could purify the other. Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish.
a theologically informed worldview could provide greater explanatory adequacy than a worldview which deletes from its picture the God of grace. Both the public Christian philosopher and the public systematic theologian have this to offer our wider culture. By what criteria do we measure explanatory adequacy? Well, there are four. The first is applicability. This is the empirical criterion. Does it bite into actual experience? How comprehensive is it? In principle, we should be able to look at any and all of reality in relationship to God. Logical, we want to avoid self-contradiction. Coherence is the principle whereby any doctrinal articulation implies every other one. So if you want to enter the house of systematic theology, you can go through any door or window and find your way everywhere. Yes, there's an unavoidable perspectivalness to the Christian philosopher and the systematic theologian, but because it seeks the most comprehensive scope, it's a perspective on the whole of reality. And will it have to change? Oh, yes. It is in constant movement, just as scientific theories are. So... What we say theologically has a certain hypothetical structure to it to be confirmed or disconfirmed either by experience or God's revelation. Perhaps St. Thomas Aquinas provides a good model, but in sacred science, Hence, all things are treated under the aspect of God, either because they are God himself or because they are ordered to God as their beginning and end. My public Christian philosophy and public systematic theology partner in addressing the wider public, the wider culture beyond the church in this era of competing worldviews and incoherence, might we have something valuable to say about the whole of reality and about the gracious God who is our creator and our redeemer. With that, Bye-bye. That was uh, Ted Peters from Graduate Theological Union, Berkeley, California. Thank you very much, Ted. Now we can start with the questions. Uh, so if, if uh, some of you have some questions, just please unmute yourself, ask the question, and mute yourself again. Uh, we will start with the questions on Webex from Webex participants, and I will I will read some uh, questions uh, from YouTube and Facebook streams. So just please unmute yourself and ask the questions. Ted, greetings. This is John Hittinger from Houston, Texas, not too far from you. I've got, I've got a question, and that is, um, why? I, what will lead scientists to engage this worldview kind of conversation? You know, you had mentioned, for example, um, Wilson and his book Consilience. He seems to be so satisfied with his work. He even, a little quote I want to read you, he says, the true evolutionary epic retold as poetry is intrinsically ennobling as any religious epic. Material reality discovered by science possesses more content and grandeur than all the religious cosmologies combined. 
And he seems to think it won't happen today or tomorrow. He's perfectly happy with an incomplete explanatory system, but he thinks he's got that promissory note that he will explain everything down to the roots. So how do you get a handle on someone who is so entrenched in this idea of the reductive explanations? And then he says he'll turn it into poetry. So what do you do? Uh, my uh, term to describe uh, E.O. Wilson is scientific imperialism. That is to say, um, <clears throat> science is the only explanation for reality. Everything else is fantasy. And uh, so he takes the so-called science of biological evolution, and he wants to conquer <laughs> religious self-understanding by providing an evolutionary understanding and by translating the science of evolution into poetry, he thinks he can convert religious people to a new form of religion, namely um, scientism. Um, if you want to persuade Wilson that he's mistaken, it may be hopeless. Um, because um, his scientism is an ideology to which he's committed. Does every research scientist have to hold Eel Wilson's point of view? I don't, I don't think so. A scientist can recognize the value of scientific knowledge without adding to it uh, the demand that you turn your knowledge into a single imperial form of knowledge that defeats um, uh, all competitors. It is possible uh, for a serious research scientist to believe in God, like God, think of God as a uh, creator, etc., and let science be science. I think we're in a curious situation where the public Christian philosopher and the public Christian theologian are telling, are telling the scientists, keep your science, do your science, and then quit. Don't add a pseudo-religion of materialism or scientism on top of it. Um, so that's my interpretation of that passage of consilience the book is misnamed because it's really a form of E.O. Wilson's imperialism in which all forms of knowledge are united, but united in his own worldview uh, because he doesn't allow um, credence to alternatives. Now, do you think I'm too extreme here, uh, John, in my interpretation or no, no, I would agree. I like what you say, and I, I like the work of Father Yaki. Do you know his work? He oh, has that, Yaki, uh, yes, right. He, he makes that argument, let science be science and philosophy be philosophy. And that's, that's one of the lessons that has to be learned, is that the method of science has a limit by definition. And yes, it, it does. Yeah. That's it's right. Quantitative. It's quantitative. Uh, it's... So uh, anyway, no, thank you, Ted. That was a. Uh, I'm glad you brought Wilson up. I think he's an important figure. Yes, he is. He is considered very representative. Uh, are there any questions? For I have received two questions on the stream, so I will read it. And if there will be any another, then we will just go to them. The first question, Ted, is. Would you say that the task of Christian philosophy is to make a change in the world, to make, to make a world a better place to live, or rather to provide us with an explanation with a Christian insight? That was the first question. I think traditionally it's been the latter. We want better understanding, and understanding leads to explanation. Understanding, judgment explanation, and if the Christian philosopher can do that, um, 
uh, he or she's had a good day. <laughs> okay. I think that currently in the global situation, there's so much incoherence, and Christian philosophers are good at coherence. Systematic theologians are good at coherence. That maybe we could be good stewards of this talent and somehow or other offer it to the world outside our disciplines. Okay, and the latter question is, does science care about philosophy, theology, its methodologies, ethical suggestions, or interpretations? Methodologically, no. Methodologically, science is self-limiting. It does not even deal with value. Now, many scientists are very concerned about value, ethics, and things like that. But that's an extra scientific concern. It's not inherent in the science itself. Okay. Are there any questions? Anna, please. It's not a question. It's rather a remark of a person who doesn't come from uh, in English language mentality. Uh, I'm a, I myself came from a family with a very long tradition of maths and physics. So, so the family of scientists, the professionals. And uh, my mother language is Russian. Then I started to learn English. I found it quite amusing and astonishing when somebody can formulate in English the following sentence, I do believe in science. For me, the sentence, as I said, is amusing. Science is nothing to believe in. I can agree or disagree. I can measure. I can, uh, for, for instance, I do believe in climate change. There is nothing to believe in. We have some facts. We have different models. We can accept one of models to explain some facts. But there is no uh, matter to believe in. Uh, science is not a matter of faith. And this, I, you know, I started from such um, very simple things that I just noticed on the level of language. And then I moved to say, I um, found out that it's not only a matter of language, which I probably didn't understand all those nuances, but that people really do think that they do believe in science or do not believe in science, then they have such an attitude. The next step, which is uh, scientism, etc., etc., is very easy to do. They already got an idea that uh, there is something to believe in. You know, I believe in physics. Or I believe in Einstein, for instance. For me, it's... Uh, no, I don't believe that two and two uh, is equal four. I just know it. I can prove it. Prove it. It's not that easy as someone uh, would think, but, you know, in any case. So, uh, sometimes I, I think that this discussion is somehow rooted in quite different mentality, which is also the mentality of language. This is what I can say to this discussion. Well, um, I think uh, this is a very valuable um, uh, observation uh, internal to uh, research methods in science. You're right. There is no room for belief at all. Belief plays no role uh, whatsoever. There are two ways, though, in which belief in science um does have some cash value. The first one is philosophers of science point out that the scientific method makes certain assumptions such as the mind is rational and then the world studied empirically conforms to those rational principles. That's an unproven assumption. And the word belief can apply uh, there. Again, it's not internal, but it's external to um, science itself. Secondly, I think in the world situation in which we are currently uh, facing today, science is a part of culture, 
And uh, we're finding that the authority of science to provide reliable information and explanation that is to guide politics, economics, and um, uh, other aspects of culture, that authority has been eroded, and we're stuck, whether we like it or not, with whether people believe the scientists or not. Um, we have this big problem in the United States. Maybe you don't have it in Poland, but we have a president <laughs> who doesn't believe in science and says the scientists are wrong, and he just knows intuitively what is what is right. So in that sense, um, we're going to have to use the word belief in science or disbelief in science for a period of time until we can discern just what authority science has in the non-scientific aspects of culture. But it is something different to have a set of axioms which you need to have in any well, science or any uh, scientific discipline. It's important that we have a set of axioms in philosophy, the minimum set, without which uh, argumentation is simply impossible, which you accept as necessary. The other thing is to believe in science or, or, or not to believe in science. Both subjects are quite different. Again, I don't believe in axioms. I do accept them as or self-evident, as in geometry, for instance, speaking about classical geometry, yes, or as necessary in modern physics. This is, however, not the same. And then, I, uh, for instance, you uh, give us an example of uh, Trump. I can equally give you an example of Ocasio-Cortez. She does believe in science. She doesn't know science, but she does believe in science. And for me, what he says, what she projects, is uh, not more scientific than Trump's theories. It's loosely based on science without any knowledge or understanding of science. So uh, it, it, it's, it's like uh, our custom gives people who think, uh, who are scientists, a permission to cross the boundaries between disciplines. Me, as philosopher or theologian, would never tell a to a scientist how to do methodologically or not something, yes. It's not my discipline. I'm, qu I'm quite aware about my limits. And yet, it's difficult to find a scientist who would equally uh, preserve his limits. I don't think that a person who works in physics or in any other scientific discipline has rights, methodological rights, to make philosophical or theological claims. Simply, the methodology is different. That's it. And I don't mean, but you know, you this, you have this um, common mentality climate. You know, then then science is a kind of belief. So I I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not. No, I'm not right. Just it. it I was um, so much surprised surprised to find those differences in mentality. But I am probably not ready to get over it. You no. Know? <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I'll accept your description. <laughs> okay, um, we we are running out of time. The very last question, Ted, we received on Facebook stream is following. It seems hard in the real issues to decide whether science is apolitical. Take the issues of vaccines. Isn't this a case of believing that the research is objective, not funded by the pharmaceutical companies? Um, yes, I think this is another way in which belief functions, even though I will accept 
Anna's description of the internal method of science as exclusive of belief on any given research project to be sure, but um, the anti-vaccination movement was founded, and I don't know the details, on a spurious scientific study later disproved. So the anti-vaccinator believes that he or she is basing this position on science. It does not think that the anti-vaccination position is anti-science. They think it's better science. Establishment science, scientists say they're mistaken. Um, uh, but the idea that there'd be a competition between um, research projects is not unusual within science, but you expect empirical evidence and good reasoning uh, to win, uh, win out someday. So there's no anti-science in the mindset of the anti-vaccinators that I can tell. Okay, the, the very last question, I promise, from John Hittinger. John? No, I just wanted to briefly say in part for Anna, but also Ted could comment that I think in the United States, the phrase belief in science is mostly connected to technology. I think what it means is I believe science will solve this problem. You know, here in Houston, MD Anderson has cancer with a red line through it. We will solve the problem of cancer. And I think there's a kind of belief to the future that science will solve the major problems of mankind. That's how I understand it. And I, I mean, I think I question that belief, but I think it's a lot, it's a coherent idea. And it's not just I believe scientific propositions, but I believe science is our savior or science will do the things we need to have happen. Um, I, I would occur, I don't want to interrupt Anna, but yeah, I, that's belief in progress, faith in progress, and it really comes from the image of technology, uh, but science is conflated with technology uh, in the belief that science will save us. Okay, let's let's put uh, a dot. So, I, I, I'm sorry, I need to add something, and yet science becomes a savior. Uh, you do not see uh, some problem with it? You yes. just... Utter this. Science becomes a savior. <laughs> well, it's a form of idolatry. Science will not save, despite the fact that people believe it will. Okay. Okay. Um, can we stop here for we have to <laughs> with our our last point? Ted, thank you very much for the lecture. Thanks thank for you for inviting me. Yes. Okay, just three words to sum up before I put uh, before we we move to the formal closing of the conference. Just a few words from me. I would like to thank all of you, all the all the speakers on Webex, all the speakers here participating on site instead of COVID nineteen, and uh, I am fascinated with what we just had during these two days during this journey towards the Christian philosophy, basically I noted we had so many areas within philosophy or other related disciplines as philosophy of religion, philosophy of God, of science, history of philosophy, medieval, ancient, patristic, social and political philosophy, methodology, transhumanism, Thomism, argumentation theory, personalism, ethics, Anthropology, philosophy of mind, logic, semiotics, and apologetics. All of this during two days, two days conference on Christian philosophy. Um, we are very grateful to all of you, to your contribution to this, to this that it happened instead of COVID. Um, I am, I am, I'm, I'm really changed my mind about the Christian philosophy. One of the speakers said today that. Christian philosophy cannot be distinguished by its scope, nor by its methods. But it can be distinguished that this, this is philosophy that is made by Christians for the Christian purposes, 
within the Christian agenda, and I really like it. So, just uh, just a brief uh, reminder: if you would like to submit a paper to an international journal of philosophy that a Jesuit University in Krakow runs, Forum Philosophicum, you are free to sub uh, to submit it. Mm before mid-October. I will write an email about this. And uh, I would like to add at the very end that I hope it is only the first conference of the Christian philosophy and it's uh, part of the bigger picture and we will meet each other in a year or two. Now, the very formal uh, closing of the conference by Piotr Mazur, uh, the president of the of the committee, committee of um, Scientific Committee of this conference. Professor, can you hear us? Um, Hello, I'm here. Okay, uh, so the last steps of our conference is to, to close it. So, dear participants of the conference, I would like to thank, uh, thank the member of the organizing committee especially to Jarosław Kucharski, by me, near by me, and especially to Jakub Prusz, who made a great job yesterday and today, the first, first one. Uh, many thanks to uh, members of the scientific committee who preparing a uh, lecture, who preparing to, uh, to give it uh, in order to uh, give a notion uh, and accept uh, uh, lectures. Uh, many thanks to persons who are on site and those who participate in the conference via social media, especially uh, for to our key speakers. Uh, we tried to organize the conference as best as we could. It was a great challenge to do it during the COVID time. What does this intellectual meeting devoted to Christian philosophy tell us? Probably something different for everyone. What does it, what does it tell me? First of all, Christian philosophy is made of different philosophical traditions and concepts and different problems. Many of them have been discussed during the con our conference. Others are waiting for being researched, critically analyzed, and presented. Second, Christian philosophy has been achievements, has been uh, its achievement at challenges in order to respond to our contemporary challenges which concern both philosophy and religion. We must not forget the past. We must maintain a balance between recalling the intellectual achievement of Christian philosophy and the present time. This universalist approach has always distinguished Christian philosophy, which was not accidentally called Philosophia Perennis. It is distinction and a commitment. Third, despite numerous difficulties and limitations, it faced over its 2,000 years of existence. Christian philosophy is characterized by, by optimism. It stems from the belief that human reason is not left to itself, that even when it wanders around and experiences doubts, it can rely on revelation to purify its view of reality, to look at it as if, at, as if it were a mirror and to be inspired by it. I'm closing, I'm closing the conference Christian philosophy, its past, present, and future, hoping we will be able to return to the problems we have taken up in the future. So we start thinking about next conference right now. Thank you. See you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So that's it. That's it. Over. Over. <laughs> <laughs>